Hi, welcome back guys. This is your friend, the D and What If, with another fanfiction. This is the first part of What If Deku had a quirk that allows him to see patterns in everything. All credits for this video go to their respective authors, so please support the real author. Check out the link in the description for more details. Please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. Now let's get into the fanfic. Human beings work in patterns. That was something Midoriya Izuku knew since he was three years old. He saw how people thought in patterns, how social groups worked in patterns, even how the human body adapted to patterns, had them wired into it through muscle memory. When Midoriya Izuku turned four, he started recognizing that even quirks, which were treated as basically bullshit magic, worked in patterns. That was also why he just knew that his quirk wasn't simply pattern recognition. When his quirk came in, his eyes changed, the irises turned into pink lotus-like flowers, and whenever he would get emotional, the petals would detach and bounce around his pale blue sclere. He knew there was more to his quirk, since it was a fifth-generation mutation of two emitters, one of which had secondary physical adaptations. One in ten thousand children exhibited a quirk mutation, where a quirk was unrelated to the parent's quirk. Stop lying you useless Deku. Bakugu Katsuki finally lost his patience. Izuku knew his friend well enough to know that between one to two months after Izuku's sixth birthday, Katsuki would snap at him if his quirk was only flowery eyes. He would become one of Katsuki's prime bullying targets, especially since the blonde boy would consider Izuku's lack of a strong quirk and perceived lies about it a betrayal. Izuku knew he could dodge the first few explosive punches sent his way, but not the next, so he just decided to take the first one head on and fall to the ground, which should probably make Katsuki bored and leave him alone for a few more days. Scraped and bleeding on the park ground, neither of the children noticed that the flowers around Izuku started glowing a slight pale pink. Eight years later, unfortunately for Izuku, knowing how to identify patterns doesn't grant him precognition, nor does it enhance his senses and make him more focused or improve his memory. Crucially, it didn't allow him to recognize patterns within himself and his own biases. Unfortunately, because Izuku knew right then and there that he forgot Bakugu would probably try vandalizing his belongings today, as he always did after a teacher brought attention to Izuku. In his defense Izuku was preoccupied with analyzing the patterns of Kamui Wood's special move, Lacquered Chain Prison. It seemed that the angles in which his branches expanded and split followed a mathematical sequence, which was a glaring weakness since anyone with a bit of focus could notice and dodge. Izuku sighed as his notebook exploded in front of him, trying to stop the tears in his eyes. Are you going to cry? Deku. Bakugu laughed cruelly, echoed by his minions. He tried preparing himself, but he could never know how hard his former friend and primary tormentor would go, only that he would always go further in his quest to trot on Izuku. If you want to do something, why don't you use your quirk? It's been years, you must have figured it out by now, you aren't a liar, right? Katsuki's eyes gained a sadistic glint in them. I know, maybe you should try mortal danger. A lot of quirks trigger like that. I'm sure there are plenty of rooftops you could use for your experiment. Izuku still sat silently, tears escaping his eyes. He tried to time the intervals and the speed in which they trickled. He never could figure out his own crying pattern, but the attempts usually calmed him down. After his bullies left, Izuku picked up his burnt notebook and headed to the dojo he practiced in. It started as an attempt to trigger his quirk, but it stayed as a great way to keep in shape and train for UA. High school's hero course. He was running late, so he took a shortcut he usually avoids. The chances of running into muggers or vandals under the bridge on the way there was slightly higher. But Izuku decided it was worth the risk, since he was already physically harassed today. Nothing is ever absolute, but there is some safety in pattern distribution. Of course, he was wrong to assume. He saw a bubbling black tendril shoot towards him and began dodging. Left, right, crouch a little, roll and jump off the wall forward, but not closer to the center of the slime, two solid eyeballs floating around. The tendrils splashed against the wall, so no recoil, Izuku thought. No need to watch his back. But the thing about patterns is you have to learn them. Izuku didn't know that the slime could control his detached remains, but chose not to. When he grew comfortable and started planning his escape, he tread backwards into a newly formed viscous puddle that immediately tripped him and climbed up his body. Crap, Izuku thought. What a way to go. He couldn't see a way out, so he relaxed his muscles and held his breath, slowly exhaling in tiny gasps to elongate the time he had to think. His vision started to blur, and right when he passed out he saw a giant fist blow away the sludge, shining white teeth smiling a reassuring smile. Boy, can you hear me? Izuku blearily opened his eyes, and almost fainted again. His favorite hero, his greatest inspiration and source of strength, and as of five years ago his greatest source of anxiety, was slapping him gently in the face in an attempt to wake him up. Oh, all might, I can't believe it while wow, you saved me. See can I have a no Izuku stopped himself from asking. 
immediately being struck by guilt for almost wasting his hero's precious time. Of course young man, I already signed this incredible notebook. I must say that with a mind like yours the future of heroics is bright. All Might smiled, but suddenly looked worried when Izuku's face grew horrified at his words. All Might how could you? You're losing more time every day and you wasted it signing a notebook. And, you bothered reading some stupid notes from some fan you don't know. You have maximally three hours, unless you, Yagi Tashinori, better known as All Might, was worried the young boy in front of him would become a villain. When he complimented the boy's analysis, the child looked like someone killed his dog. The explanation for the boy's horror was much, much worse. He knew. All Might couldn't help himself, he spurted out blood. And in a puff of smoke he deflated, a tall, emaciated man with blonde hair remaining in the dissipating cloud. Ah, said the child, stopping his words in the middle yet seeming completely unsurprised. So that's what happens when you overuse your quirk. Is it a natural effect, or the result of an injury? If it's a consequence of your quirk that means I was right and it's a stockpiling emitter. That has a limited amount of total energy that has started to run out. Close, but note quite, Yagi thought with relief. But looking at your base form and taking into account the blood earlier, it's probably an injury, around 4 years, 2 months, and between 5 to 17 days. That's when your activity patterns started to shift. Yagi had to put in more and more effort to hear the boy, as he devolved into muttering. But every word was priceless, terrifyingly accurate, as pink petals danced in his azure sclere. Ever since then your villain takedowns haven't dropped, but the average time it takes per takedown rose by a few milliseconds each month. Of course your media presence is what truly changed. Stopping most public tours and replacing them with teleconferences was a completely new pattern, and people don't just. Only when he couldn't understand the child anymore, he cleared his throat. Ahem, yes young man, what you said is correct. In fact almost scarily so. All Might lifted his shirt, revealing a horrible sunken scar in his abdomen. You understand why this must remain a secret though, right? No All Might, I'm happy I managed to find you early enough. It can't remain a secret. That might work in the short term, but it will cause irreparable harm in the long run. Yagi felt sweat accumulate on his forehead. The kid was very smart, maybe it would be worth it to hear him out. What do you mean young man, and while I'm in this form, please call me Yagi. What is your name, by the way? Oh my god I'm so so sorry I can't believe I forgot to introduce myself to all mig to Yagi-san oh my god I know All Might's name. Ahem, oh right, sorry Al Yagi-san. My name is Midoriya Izuku, it is my greatest honor to meet you he bowed from his waist, a 90 degree angle. At least the boy was a fan. Yagi skimmed through his notebook and saw that the boy could probably defeat most heroes if he was physically fit enough, seeing as he had plans on how to overcome almost every move they had. Were they all that predictable? Was he that predictable? Please, explain why it would be better to reveal the fact that I'm close to retirement. When Yagi lifted his eyes from the notebook, he saw the boy, Midoriya, collect the sludge villain into some bottles. Crime has been dropping, Yagi-san, but around four and a half years ago there was a really sharp drop, probably some kingpin being taken down. Looking at past crime patterns in Japan, and similar cases worldwide, it's obvious that the power vacuum hasn't been filled. That isn't good. That means there are several large groups competing among each other, and when one wins, it'll subsume the remain of the others, and emerge much more powerful. Additionally, quirks are growing stronger. And while I don't think singularity will be apocalyptic, I think that. Young Midoriya, please speak up, you're muttering again. Midoriya jerked up, as if he was surprised that someone was listening. All right, as sorry. I mean, the next big figures in the crime world will be stronger than most of the last, both as individuals and as organizations. If you are going to retire, then the rest of the heroes need to prepare, mentally at least but also to up their game. You are a soul symbol in Japan and the world. If you suddenly retire it could bring about a wave of crime Japan won't recover from. Yagi Tashinori was silent. It would take years to train a successor. And if what Midoriya was saying was correct, then a single successor wouldn't be enough. Young Midoriya, do you have anywhere to be? I want to take you to meet someone. All things considered, it is quite urgent. Midoriya looked panicked for a second. Uh, I'm late for training. I'll have to message them that I'll be missing it today. And mom too that I'll be late. Yagi smiled, and as Midoriya was making all of the required texts and calls, he fished out his phone and sent Nedzu a message to his private number, the one that meant he would get the message immediately and realize the urgency. Aizawa Shota, the pro hero eraser head, sat exasperated in front of Nedzu, who would never admit the petty joy he took in making the man sit, serves him right for expelling an entire class. He wasn't the one that had to handle the paperwork and the disgruntled parents, as well as the therapy and follow-up so the kids wouldn't descend into villainy. Nedzu was going over some articles his friendly internet rival wrote, until Yagi came with his urgent news. He narrowed down Lotus' identity to a Japanese expat that must have immigrated fairly recently and had teenage children. He was up to date on teen slang, 
and his Japanese was fluent. But every single quirk researcher in Japan wasn't Lotus, hence an expat. Nezu was about to continue his review to Lotus suggested altered quirk inheritance paradigm. When Yagi entered the room, in his true form, followed by a jittery green-haired child in a middle school Gakuren I'm in UA. I can't believe I'm in UA. I must be dreaming a very excited jittery young boy in a middle school Gakuren. Time to introduce himself. Am I a dog or a mouse or a bear? You're a principal gerbil, with amalgam murity bone structure in your skull, spine, and back limbs, probably a secondary quirk adaptation to account for increased cognition. The albinism is unrelated to your species or quirk. Never had there been such silence in Nedzu's office. Never had there been such silence in all of UA. The source of the silence was looking around from his seat, not noticing three pairs of dumbfounded eyes on him. It was that same boy that broke the silence. Oh my god this is so embarrassing. Nedzu was about to calm the boy and even congratulate him for a singularly unique deduction, when the next words to leave the boy's mouth promptly shut him up. I can't believe the principal Nedzu is wasting time with a QIP. You must think I'm so dumb I'm sorry that's just something I've been writing up. My friend May's builder should be going over it soon he's much smarter than me so don't bother finishing it. Wow you really looked me up fast when Al when Yagi Sen told you he was bringing me here. But how did you link me to my online presence I thought I scrubbed it. Nedzu was grateful that the boy, apparently his many year colleague Green Lotus, descended into a flurry of incomprehensible mutterings. Both since that meant he wasn't focused on how shocked Nedzu was. And as well as because Nedzu wasn't sure he could handle any more of what this young boy would say. Hum, young Midoriya, please, introduce yourself first Yagi's sweat dropped, and Nenzu was thankful for the diversion. Oh I'm so sorry, um, again, I'm Midoriya Izuku. I was s saved earlier by all my by Yagi Sen I mean and he told me to come talk to you about something. I promise it's not a QIP. Yagi Sen thinks it will be worth it to talk to you though, please don't judge me based on that. How could a boy be at once so smart and so oblivious is a mystery that no amount of intelligence could help solve? Nenzu felt, please be at ease Midoriya Khan. Would you like tea? The boy shook his head and Nedzu continued. Also, please don't be worried about your AQIP, since I have been reviewing it for the last week when you sent it to me. Yagi, Aizawa, and Midoriya all did a spit take. Why your maze builder? When Nedzu nodded Midoriya started sobbing uncontrollably, the fourth surprise he brought to the meeting so far. Midoriya kun please calm down, why are you crying? The because now W we won't be friends any anymore. Midoriya sobbed a truly heart-wrenching sob why you were my best friend. I I only talked to you and set in stone and my mom and now you know I'm just a stupid K kid and we won't be F friends. That was not what Nedzu expected. Again, this would require finesse and delicacy. Midoriya Kun please. I assure you that I was very impressed with our correspondences these last few years Nedzu paused to let that sink in. He'd been talking to a literal grade schooler for years. And I have no intention of letting them stop. If anything, I would hope that we can begin meeting in person now that we know each other. Aizawa raised an eyebrow at that. But Nedzu sent him a look that meant he was completely serious. Yagi nudged the tired hero and shook his head, trying to convey to him not to interfere. But maybe we should set up a time later to discuss your marvelous theory as well as some more in-depth analysis you did on those villains last week. For now tell me, what did Yagi Sen bring you to talk about? W well, it has to do W with the secret Midoriya tried calming down, but was still gasping and stuttering a little. Yagi placed a comforting hand on his shoulder. They already had good rapport, Nedzu noted. Are you sure it's fine eye if a racer head is here? Izuku turned to Aizawa, missing the sadistic glint in Nedzu's eye. Finally someone else will get shocked by the boy. I mean, you're an incredible hero. My second favorite of all time. The way you took down the support gear smuggling ring was inspiring. B but, it's not my secret to tell I'm sorry Urser head san. Oh, and can I please get an autograph? Shota would never expel more than one quarter of his class in the future. This prank had gone on far, far too long. He had to commend Nenzu. The child actor he hired was impeccable, and Shota really was fooled for a long while. Having the scenario be unrelated to him was a stroke of genius. Even when the kid recognized him he was still mostly convinced it was real. But when the kid mentioned the support gear smuggling he knew Nenzu had overreach. That didn't make the news and was scrubbed from the internet. And even the remaining speculations didn't mention his involvement. He chuckled and shook his head while reaching for the proffered notebook, expecting to see a bold got you. Scribbled there. What he didn't expect was to see extremely detailed diagrams of himself in various combat poses, in-depth breakdowns of his tactics and moves, as well as a terrifying look into his weaknesses. He absently noted that on the other side of the page were a series of questions about his quirk. Does it work through mirrors? Glass. One-sided mirrors. Can it work with one eye? Good questions. Top quality analysis. Shota completely ignored the actor, seeing as the jug was up. I got it rat. No more expelling so many students. Is this where the budget went this year? 
What firm did this analysis? I want their contact information immediately. The actor whimpered and showed us how the lanky blonde rubbed soothing circles on his upper back. He rolled his eyes. But while that actor was capital D dedicated, well Aizawa, you can look to your left to see who did your analysis. I'm sure that an autograph would be enough payment for Midori Akun. Nanzu you can't seriously expect me to. Enough A-I-Z-A-W-A Kun. Apologize to young Midoriya immediately. The lanky blonde was engulfed in a cloud of smoke and All Might appeared in his place. Nedzu seemed unfazed, and the actor started apologizing frantically. Then All Might coughed some blood and in a puff of smoke the lanky blonde returned. Shota took a seat. Aizawa Kun I assure you nothing here is a joke. You saw me get the message on my emergency phone, did you not? No matter how much you deserve retribution. There are lines not to be crossed, since it would break your trust, however slightly, in the emergency phone going forward. Shota nodded numbly. Additionally, you were quite rude to Midori Akun, who may just be your biggest fan. P please don't mind me eraserhead san, of course you have more important things to do. Midori was it. The boy nodded, still sniffling away the remains of his tears. Nedzu and All Might are correct. Even without you having brought me this priceless analysis Midoriya made to say something but Shota injected a little more force into his voice no, Midoriya, this analysis is extremely helpful, probably more than you realize, or, considering how well you dissected my weaknesses, as important as you realize but refuse to accept, Shota wondered how the boy could have such a low perception of himself. Midoriya, even without this, the way I dismissed you out of hand was wrong, and it would be illogical not to apologize when I made a blatant error in judgment. I am sorry for not believing you. Silence. The thin All Might raised his eyebrow and gestured towards the notebook. And of course I'll sign your notebook. Shota could swear the kid's quirk was localized weather control, since he went from intense flooding to a smile so bright it outshone the sun in record speed. Thank you Eraserhead son I can't believe it. All Might cleared his throat and made a gesture. Young Midoriya is correct. The secret is not his, it's mine, and Aizawa Kun should know it. Especially considering what I brought Midoriya here for. The lanky blonde lifted his shirt and started talking. All Might is running out of time. Shota was reeling. Nedzu knew, and Midoriya had figured it out on his own. Then Midoriya started explaining his thoughts. He brought out data, not from the top of his head, thankfully, but from an intensely encrypted notebook titled Help All Might, Prepare for the Worst. The kid didn't have a perfect memory, but he was organized to a fault. Numbers, trends, case files, examples, conjecture. Everything pointed to the truth of what Midoriya was saying. Two unfortunate patterns were about to coincide. All Might would run out of time, and the criminal underworld was due for an increase in activity. Nedzu looked as troubled as he did, and exchanged a meaningful glance with All Might. It seemed to take the tall hero a few seconds to understand. Are you positive, Nedzu? Midoriya looked up, sharing Shota's confusion, positive about what? Yagi-kun, I have been in contact with Midoriya-kun for around seven years, and during the last four of them we would correspond nearly daily. I assure you there is no better candidate out there. It had been a very very long day, Izuku thought to himself. He was so embarrassed the first time his mother had called, since it was in the middle of All Might's explanation. Thankfully they were all very understanding, and Nedzu even told her to come to UA, to meet with him, since they would be a while. Then when Nedzu and All Might started talking about something he didn't understand, he thought he might have drifted off to sleep. I apologize, young Midoriya, there is more to my secret, both the limit to my activity and the villain who gave me the wound that led to the limit. You see Midoriya, I am not the first to have my quirk. I inherited it from my master, who inherited it from hers. Izuku pinched himself. Not dreaming he mumbled. Nanzu chuckled. I assure you Midoriya-kun. What Yagi-kun is saying is true. It goes back to the dawn of quirks. Izuku found the story of the two brothers riveting and terrifying. When All Might explained that his quirk was a stockpiling quirk he couldn't help a small fist pump and a mumbled knew it. It just stockpiled energy for eight generations. He saw a racer head. Now young Midoriya, you have a brilliant mind and a heroic heart. You know that I am running out of time. I would like to offer you my quirk. Wait. He almost vibrated in his seat. No way. He could get a strong quirk, be a hero. He was about to agree or burst in tears, but suddenly stopped himself. He didn't notice the concerned look of the adults around him when they saw his excitement transform into heartbreak. You shouldn't waste such a chance on someone like me. You said that one for all enhanced your master's quirk. I still don't know exactly what my quirk does beyond changing my eyes and slightly enhancing my ability to recognize mathematical, statistical, and physical patterns. Wait you don't have an intelligence quirk. Eraserhead and All Might asked him together. And no, I don't know exactly what it does, except that there are emitter elements that I haven't activated yet. Sometimes it enhances my perception and reflexes, but not consistently. And I can't analyze patterns that have to do with myself, so I'm stumped. Nenzu looked interested. While Eraserhead and All Might were gaping that he was just naturally that smart, Izuku looked up at his hero. 
That's why you should offer your quirk to someone with a complimentary quirk. That could make the most of it. Nedzu coughed slightly and put down his cup. Izuku, may I call you Izuku, if you are serious about us being friends? Izuku nodded rapidly, tears pooling once again in his eyes. What you mentioned isn't a reason to pass over someone like you. We will proceed with what you suggested. Preparing the heroes slowly, starting with those we trust won't leak the information about All Might's retirement. Meanwhile however, there is no reason we can't work on training you physically and experimenting to discover your quirk's functions. Even if you won't inherit one for all, I fully expect you to enroll in the hero course next year. Nedzu paused and looked at his screen. Oh, your mother has arrived. Perfect. I'll talk to her about withdrawing you from school since you clearly don't need it. Meanwhile Aizawa-kun and Yagi-kun can start drawing up a training plan. Please wait outside while I talk with your mother and be here tomorrow at 8 a.m. Izuku nodded dumbly. This was better than any dream he could have imagined. Maybe the sludge villain got him and he was dead. What do you mean sludge villain he heard his mother's panicked shout and realized too late he muttered his last thoughts out loud. Thankfully he wouldn't be part of her conversation with Nenzu. Izuku knew it would take his mother a long time to calm down, and he planned on making the most of it, especially since Eraserhead was sitting outside of Nenzu's office with him. Izuku wanted his mother to know everything, so All Might was in there with his mother and Nenzu, going over everything the principal thought they needed to explain. Elmum Eraserhead San. Izuku hesitated when Eraserhead interrupted him. I'll be training you for the next ten months, so call me Aizawa Sensei, Midoriya. Now, what is it? Okay, Aizawa Sensei. Then um, um my mother will probably be in there for a while. Can we um um see can we try the suggestions I had f for your quirk? He would need to work on the boy's confidence, Aizawa thought. Sure kid, I'll call a colleague to test it out. And tomorrow you'll do a set of examinations so next time we'll be able to do it directly with you. Aizawa took out his cell phone and texted the teacher's chat. He might as well start to introduce them to each other early, get it out of the way. He stood up and started walking towards the gym. But after reaching the first turn in the hallway he turned back. Are you coming Midoriya? We need to be in the gym for this. The kid scrambled off his seat and hurried after him. Aizawa noticed his dejected expression morphing passing through confusion and landing on delight. Yep, confidence training is a must for daylight heroes. Eraserhead, who's on facility and can come to the main gym. Loudmouth, I'm at home show, where you should be as well. Vamp, I'm on my way. Right now, what's it for? Principal, change their name to Principal Principal. Principal Principal, record everything Aizawa Kun. Loudmouth, Vlad fix your settings that autocorrect makes you look like a boomer. Aizawa put his phone away with a sigh and hurried. Vlad King's quirk was much more straightforward than his, but he still hoped the kid would have some surprises for him. He could hear the kid muttering all the way behind him, still excited to be at UA. Sekijiro Kan was curious as to what his colleague wanted this late after hours, and he was almost done grading exams anyway, so he decided to break the monotony by going to the gym himself. When he arrived, he saw a racer head and some middle schooler talking animatedly. Oh my god, it's Vlad King. You're such an amazing hero. See can I have your autograph? The kid was nearly vibrating. If Kan was more observant, more on guard, he may have noticed Aizawa smirking. Midoriya, why don't you have Vlad King sign his dedicated page on your notebooks? He could even take a peek at the notes. W would you really? I have so many questions. And an idea is if you W want to see but Aizawa Sensei. W W were here F for you, B but if you're both. Aizawa Sensei, didn't he expel his entire class this year? Kids speak up. He couldn't understand anything from the muttering boy. He saw the boy nervously write something in a notebook where did that come from? and hand it to him. Kan did a double take, looking at a series of embarrassingly detailed diagrams and sketches of him in various combat poses, with color-coded annotations, extremely astute observations, that Kan hadn't made in the 24 years he had possessed his quirk, blue for observations, red for weaknesses, the most important were the questions, in orange. Kan almost forgot about the other people in the gym with him. Could he control blood outside of his line of sight? How fast did his body regenerate blood? Could he use blood bags from the blood he donated? Did his solidified blood liquefy when he slept? Would his ability to lose more blood than a regular human could fade if his quirk was erased? That last question was the one that the kid hastily scrawled before handing him the notebook. He probably came up with it since he was in the same place as Eraser. He raised his head as he heard a schadenfreude-laden chuckle. Why don't you sign the notebook, Can? It was then that Can understood that the kid must have a spread dedicated to Eraser Head, and his colleague must have undergone this very same system shock. As sure, of course, he signed the notebook. Careful not to cover any of the annotations, he would be going over them pedantically. Now, to figure out what they were here for. Aizawa took in Kan's shock, and basked in it before getting back to business. Midoriya, this is Vlad King, but you should call him Kan-sensei when you're in school. Do you have a preference on where to begin the tests? Today was the day. 
The combination of gathering his courage and investigating may have taken him a month. But finally, today was the day Kirishima Ijiro made a new friend. He was worried when the green-haired kid didn't show up at the dojo, since Ijiro intended to get to know him that day. Ijiro was always curious about the cute boy who would turn from jittery and shy to focused and decisive in the sparring mats. Ijiro really wanted to get to know the other boy, but he stopped coming right when Ijiro worked up the courage to approach. When the other boy continued to be a no-show the week after that, Ijiro made a plan. It took him a couple of more days to prepare, and then he braced himself and went to the kid's school, Aldera Junior High, to wait at the gate and meet him. Three days later he still hadn't seen him, but by asking around he learned three things. The boy was Midoriya Izuku. Though Bo Midoriya had stopped coming to school the day after he stopped coming to the dojo, and Midoriya was heavily bullied by some asshat named Bakugu, who was apparently the king of the school. He also learned that they both wanted to be heroes. Wouldn't it be awesome if they ended up at UA? Together, Ajiro promised himself he wouldn't give up. He approached the faculty and explained that he was a friend of Midoriya's from the dojo they both trained and was worried and wanted to know his address. The uninterested secretary told him that Midoriya's mother had withdrawn him from school almost two weeks ago, and then gave him his address with frightening apathy. Well, luckily I don't mean him harm, Ijiro hummed to himself a few days later, after he had hyped himself up to approach Midoriya. He saw Midoriya on his way home, carrying overflowing grocery bags and looking around suspiciously. All right, it's make or break, fake it till you make it, and be confident and friendly. Hi, Midoriya-san, right, I'm Kirishima Ijiro from the dojo, haven't seen you in a while. Midoriya jumped and almost dropped something from his bags, a rock. Was he carrying grocery bags full of rocks? H. Hi Kirishima-san. I remember you. Midoriya gave him a nervous smile, but his eyes started dancing around much more frantically. Um, um this is actually a bad time, do you? Um, um want to exchange numbers and talk later. Ijiro was as thrilled as he was confused. Yeah sure, my number is 20 to 40 to 30. Also do you want help with those bags of rocks? Midoriya started looking really panicked. My number is 20 to 40 to 30. And um, um th there's nothing in the rules against getting help. B but it's very important that the rocks don't touch the ground. Even a single one. It was then that Ijiro heard a weird whistle pass through the air. And saw a bizarre man with a mirrored visor jump from the roof while sending a whip towards Midori. Aizawa felt bad. The kid needed more friends. So he waited until they exchanged numbers before attacking. Midoriya should have known better than to stop, and seeing his growing panic the longer he stood in place was more satisfying than Aizawa would ever admit. Midoriya jumped to the side, and paled when he saw a rock fall from his bag catch the rock Kirishima-san. Good. He was using his surroundings and asking for help. The Kirishima boy lunged to grab the rock holy crap Midoriya is that a villain? What's happening should I get help? Aizawa intensified his onslaught, preventing Midoriya from answering. Kirishima started running away, disappointing Aizawa thought. He changed his mind when he heard the boy yelling for a hero, and warning other civilians of a villain attack and to stay away. He saw the fear increase in Midoriya's eyes. Midoriya knew that any heroes that were on regular patrol in the area had been briefed on what to do in these situations. His smile widened when he heard Kamui Woods answer Kirishima and start running towards them. He heard the other heroes chortle through the comms and start heading towards the show. Kirishima sighed in relief as he followed Kamui Woods towards Midoriya, his fist whitening as he gripped Midoriya's rock. He turned the corner and saw Midoriya somersault over the villain's scarf, still not dropping any rocks beyond that first one. Kamui Woods was preparing to attack, and he heard a feminine voice gasp beside him, Mount Lady. Phew, I made it, this should be good. Good Kirishima thought. Then, Kamui Woods unleashed his branches toward Midoriya. What? W was Midoriya a villain? No way. He saw Kamui release a second branch, to Midoriya's right, and somehow Midoriya dodged both the scarf and Kamui Woods' branches. That's great Kamui Woods-san. Another branch at a 33-degree angle does help you cover the blind spots from your branching patterns. Kirishima gave up on figuring out what was happening when Midoriya's eyes glinted like those of an anime villain. Unfortunately for you, you're helping Eraserhead-san, and you forgot that I'm the one who came up with that move. With lightning speed, Midoriya let go of one of his bags, grabbed the not-villain scarf, and wrapped it around two of Kamui Wood's branches. Then he reached behind him to catch his bag before the scarf could grab it. His triumphant laugh was caught short when a spray of water forced him to duck and roll. Backdraft burst out of an alley you know the rules Midoriya. Any heroes can respond to a call as long as they're on active patrol. Midoriya caught his bags again and then slipped on a puddle of water. The bags flew in the air and with them the rocks. It was like a scene from a movie. The rocks flew out in slow motion, and then suddenly Midoriya's eyes glowed pink, and the rocks froze in the air. Izuku was desperate. If he reached the safe zone without dropping a single rock, they would start working on his quirk. That was the deal. Still, he didn't regret stopping to talk to Kirishima. Would he actually make a friend? 
that was worth doing this exercise again, in his opinion. That didn't mean he would give up. Three heroes against him, but no super moves. He felt the familiar buildup of energy, but he still didn't know what to do with it. The closer an attack came to hitting him, the more the energy built up. Then he slipped. He managed to catch himself instinctively, but not his backs. No, no, no. Izuku froze. So did Aizawa Sensei, Kamui Woods, and Backdraft. He activated his quirk. And like so many stories of emitter quirks, he instinctively knew what to do. The rocks floated in three circles around him, like rings around a planet. He looked towards Backdraft, and shot the rocks towards the fireman hero. The rocks shot out from him in a pattern, how suitable, a triangle formation with secondary peaks. A mountain, Izuku realized, what they lost by its predictability they made up for in speed. And Izuku quickly started moving from side to side to make the pattern less predictable. Then suddenly it stopped. Izuku staggered in place, surprised at the sudden absence of rocks, when he felt capture cuffs around his wrist. Cool quirk kiddo, did you just figure it out? Mount Lady snuck up on him, when did she even get here? Why yeah, I it makes sense though, small objects from my mom, and then a direct energy emitter component from dad. In patterns, that means my ability to analyze patterns was a secondary adaptation. Izuku muttered with bright eyes, finally. He didn't notice the proud glint in Aizawa's eyes, behind his new mirrored visor. You know what this means, right Midoriya? From tomorrow the real training starts. Izuku knew he should have shivered in fear, but he only nodded toward his teacher, filled with determination and excitement. Eight months after the faux villain incident, as they called it, Aijiro didn't know whether to be grateful to his new friend for convincing Aizawa-sensei to let him join in on the training or buy a fake identity and vanish into the shadows, live off the grid. He was running, with his own bags of rocks clenched tightly in his hands. He now knew exactly why Midoriya was so terrified of dropping even a single one. He dodged to the right, then left. His pursuer was Midoriya himself. At least he was using pedals as his ammo this time. Those were the most simple to dodge, only shooting in a straight line. At least this would be their last exercise. Tomorrow Izuku would get All Might's quirk then. They would take the entrance exam to UA. High, and begin their career as heroes. He ready Madabro. Aijiro's shoulder tapped his newest friend. I I think so. I trained a lot for this. I got a handle on my quirk. Izuku fist pumped in the air, then seemingly deflated B but we can't bring anything inside with us. So I won't have ammo to start with and Nezu said that the written test I'll be given will be slightly different than the standard test. As since I've matriculated out of high school and I usually discover test patterns by the third question and then unless the question are. Ijiro sweat dropped. He didn't understand how some bullies messed up Izuku's confidence. But he felt some very unheroic emotions towards them. Midabro. Man, you, have, got, this, do you feel it already? They both looked around themselves not at all suspiciously. And only when they saw that the coast was clear did Izuku lean closer to him. Not yet. Yagi-san said it would take a few hours to digest. And even then we don't know how it'll interact with my quirk Ijiro still didn't get why they only transferred All Might's quirk the morning of the exam. But from what he gathered from the various explanations, it was a combination of having Izuku's body in top condition, quirks usually evolving under real-time stressful conditions, eraser head being available to be on scene only today and dramatic effect. Either way, Ijiro was pumped, for his friend, and for himself. He never felt more ready for anything in his life, between tutoring with Izuku who was a genius and training with him under various heroes. Ijiro knew he was the best version of himself he could be. He was so busy hyping himself up that he totally missed a spiky-haired blonde kid shoulder check Izuku roughly. The yelling snapped Ijiro back to reality. Watch it you useless nerd. I'll be waiting to see you cry after you fail. He only saw the back of that kid stomping away in a huff. While he turned to check on his friend, he heard Izuku sigh don't worry about it Kirishima-kun. It was bound to happen. Bakugu will get into UA. He's too talented and hardworking for the school to take him. Come on Madabro, no way they'll accept a bully. Does Nezu know? Izuku couldn't help himself. He let out a little giggle. Of course Nezu knows, how can he not know? Even if we weren't friends he would have access to records and security footage from all middle schools of the different app as usual. Izuku got really into whatever he was saying. But different from usual, the stress from the exam, the chaotic atmosphere of thousands of applicants, and his laugh when he was explaining, caused him to lose track of his environment. Izuku tripped, almost in slow motion, until they both heard a clapping sound and Izuku started floating. What was that oh sorry I didn't mean to use? Aijiro was about to ask if that was a new part of his quirk. But a tall girl with a borderline panicked expression touched her hands together and as she said release Izuku fell to the ground well. With his reflexes, he spun himself halfway and landed on his feet. I'm so sorry. The girl bowed. I thought it would be bad luck to trip so I used my quirk on you. That was incredibly rude please forgive me. Izuku went red in the face and started stammering that it was fine. And Ijiro stepped in to salvage the situation it's fine. 
You had good intentions and it worked out. Madabro didn't trip. The girl looked confused at the moniker. Oh sorry, I'm Kirishima Ijiro and he's Midoriya Izuku. Izuku managed to stammer out a nice to meet you. I'm Yuraka Achako. Good luck with the exam, I'm really nervous. It was like those words triggered something in Izuku. And he jumped to reassure the Yuraka, all nervousness forgotten. Why you have nothing to worry about Yuraka-san. Your quirk is really cool. 5. Contact Gravity Nullification is useful for combat, subjugation, and rescue heroics. And you can probably use it for infiltration too, since you can fly high and people don't usually check the sky or windows on high floors. Plus you think fast on your feet since you helped me the moment you saw I tripped. Yup, Izuku's priorities were definitely help people first, and freak out second. Yuraka's face grew redder with each word, and the conversation soon devolved into them bowing and thanking each other. Ajiro knew it was time to step in well. Maybe we can all exchange numbers and get together after the exam. I think we're almost out of time. With his phone already out, the other two were quick to follow his lead. Izuku didn't really understand the point of his written exam, since Nezu told him that instead of writing answers, he would be writing questions. His only directives were to write a mix of quirk analysis questions, villain encounter scenarios, and miscellaneous hypotheticals that could be relevant to hero work, oh, and to write them in ascending order of difficulty, starting with extremely simple ones that could be solved by an average middle schooler. He didn't get the point of it, but he had fun nonetheless. It got even better when there were answers to his scenarios and he could elaborate in real time, and he had to balance several of them at the same time. It was like running a role-playing game or some collaborative improv exercise, with the addition of memory and situational positioning. He should ask Nezu to do this more often. Intelli Seiko was frustrated. She heard huffs of frustration from the other recommended exam applicants and took comfort in the fact she wasn't alone. They already did the practical portion of the exam a week ago, but Nezu said that this year the format was changing and the written portion would be done with the rest of the contestants. The upside was that they could observe the general practical exam if they wanted to. The new format had them sitting in front of a computer and answering scenarios that would update in real time depending on their answers. Was this a new AI? Or were their heroes and HSPC personnel doing this? This scenario is a hostage situation that takes place on international waters. A cruise ship has encountered a support gear smuggling operation that has taken them hostage. The ship has 50 passengers and 43 crew members. Among the passengers, there are seven important personages that would have diplomatic immunity if they were in any country's territory. Eight of the passengers are teenagers. Three are children between the ages of four and six. There are twelve villains. Of them seven have close-range combat quirks that are not instantly lethal, and three of those are empowered in water. Two villains have long-range quirks, one of which is limited water manipulation. You are a hero that was on vacation on the cruise ship. Your quirk is limited flight and communication with avians. Explain your priorities and how you would go about achieving them. Intelli slapped herself on both cheeks. Priorities would be villain subjugation, mitigation of casualties, and prevention of international incidents. She would obviously choose mitigation of casualties and go along with the villains, persuading the crew and passengers to temporarily do the same. She does not have enough information about the subsequent villain's actions to make a plan, and she would like information about the crew members' quirks and how many of them are of her nationality. There are 18 crew members of your nationality. Their quirks are unknown unless you ask. The villains split the hostages into seven groups of around 12 people, a single combat-capable villain guarding each group. The ship is still moving but you don't know if a villain is steering or the hostage crew members. You hear yelling and explosions from the next room when the wall to your right bursts. One of the children has either activated or awakened their quirk, laser vision. Intelli stared at the screen. She felt a single tear trickle down her cheek. She heard a scream of despair and she didn't even know if it was hers or one of the other applicants. Izuku stared at the screen. This had to be some sort of bug. The only words on the screen were fuck fuck this scenario fuck fuck what the fuck is laser eyes who the fuck brings their kids on a cruise what the fuck fuck this. That was already the third scenario that had that kind of response. Nezu only told him not to worry and that meant he got full marks for that specific scenario. Oh well, almost done. And then the pre-practical briefing. Why the AH? Two voices echoed in the frankly enormous hall. Is in Madabros. But they couldn't just leave present Mike hanging. That's the spirit listeners. The exam has you entering a fake city and combating robots. Each robot has a point value of between 1 and 3. Excuse me. Some blue-haired kid raised his hand. You said that there are 3 robots. But this pamphlet says there are 4. If this is an oversight, hey, you with the green hair, please don't interrupt when someone else is speaking. Come on Madabra, stand up for yourself. Actually, present Mike said that each robot had a point value. Not that each T-type of robot has a point V value M. Maybe there are four types of robots. But robots have different point values individually regardless of their type. 
Yes, good answer. I see, I apologize for jumping to conclusions. The kid bowed and sat down hastily. After a few long seconds of silence, present Mike cleared his throat. Ahem, actually each point value belongs to a single type, and there is one robot type that is worth zero points. You can think of it more like an obstacle. Although Mido although the listener with the green hair had a very plausible idea. Each point value corresponds to a stronger robot. Since this is an exam we want to keep the scenario simple. Achako found herself in the same testing zone as the scary blue-haired kid and Midoriya who seemed like really smart and had really pretty eyes. He got her quirk in one activation and even stood up to blue hair. The testing zone was a huge city, and all the applicants were stretched outside of it. H. Hi Yuyuraka. Midoriya approached her and she jumped a bit. Why you don't have anything to be nervous about? I think your quirk is perfect for this. You can lift robots and drop them or throw them at each other, and also drop rubble on them from rooftops. This scenario is perfect for you. Well, it was really smart. She only thought of one of those things, and the least efficient one at that. That was both a hit and a boost to her confidence at the same time. She pumped her fist, why yeah, we got this, we'll go to UA, together and crush this exam. Start, Midoriya was off, everyone else was still in shock, but she took after Midoriya before she heard present Mike behind her what are you waiting for? Real life doesn't have a countdown. She saw Midoriya run ahead, fist-sized chunks of rubble floating in rings around him as he zipped from side to side shooting them out in weird waves, totally demolishing the robots in front of him. After he ran out of debris various shards from the robot started floating around him, and he shot those forward in horizontal lines in front of him, just the width of the street, so he didn't miss a single robot. Well, time to put what he said into practice, and maybe learn from him. She started touching the shrapnel left behind by him and shooting it like throwing stars, releasing her quirk right before impact. It was a lesser version of what Midoriya did, but it was very effective. When the robot started to get too close to her, she changed it up, again to one of Midoriya's strategies. Touching a three-point robot, she lifted it like a club and started bashing everything around her. She sort of felt like a berserker queen, but she liked it. That's 60, that has to be good. Could thin too because I'm too nauseous to float anything other than shrapnel at this point. She started running towards a cluster of one-point robots, preparing her throwing shrapnel when the ground started to shake, and out of nowhere a giant robot emerged. She was so shocked that she didn't notice a huge rock falling towards her from a broken building. A-A-H-H she yelled in pain, the zero-point robot advancing in her direction. No way this is how I go. Then suddenly she saw red sneakers in front of her eyes, and above her Midoriya stood, surrounded by green lightning. Izuku heard Yuraka's shout, and instinctively started running towards her. There was no way he could take on the zero-pointer, his bullets weren't big enough or fast enough, but he might be able to help her. Then it clicked. He saw that Yuraka was trapped under a boulder, the zero-pointer almost above her, and a pool of heat exploded from his stomach. Before he could understand what was happening, a wave of green translucent energy erupted from him and enveloped the zero-pointer. His quirk evolved, boosted by OFA. A red half-circle halo appeared above the zero-pointer with a notch marking two-thirds of it. Izuku jumped and realized he wasn't falling. He started shooting out bullets, but he realized he had no ammo. Man I wish I could analyze my own patterns. This is way too much. Black energy darts enveloped in a light pink radiance shot out from him. And when they hit the zero pointer the red halo started to empty, turning gray from right to left. Boss battle boss battle. A ghost with white hair was rolling around the phantasmal ground of the vestige realm in OFA, best quirk ever. Yoichi Shigaraki, the first holder of OFA declared. Opposed to him, Degoro Banjo looked in despair. Am my quirk? Be Black Whip. I it's pink now. A few other vestiges laughed at him. Mostly those whose quirk the ninth holder didn't use yet. Most vocal was Nana Shimura, the seventh holder of OFA, whose quirk, float, Izuku was obviously using to fly. Lighten up, he's a good kid. And it's obvious our quirks are changing to suit him. An empty bar appeared hovering beneath Izuku, slowly filling up with red. An angered screech echoed in the vestige realm I do not consent to this use of my quirk. Nana again came to Izuku's defense. Lighten up Bruce, he's charging energy, that's Fajin at its best. There's the energy, Izuku thought. It builds up faster the closer I get to the zero pointer's attacks. He could feel the energy bar below him filling up with red energy, even as he was evading the robot's accelerating attacks. But what happens when it's full? And what will happen when the zero-pointer's health halo reaches the two-thirds notch? The silence in the observation room was deafening. Momoye Irazu could sense some tension running between the teachers and a tall blonde that was sitting next to Principal Nezu. By this point the screens were all focused on the flying green-haired boy who was shooting energy at the giant robot. Certainly more interesting than our practical, 
One of the teachers, a scruffy man with bags under his eyes, placed a firm hand on the lanky blonde's shoulder. Is this what you expected? Tell me, did you and Nezu plan this for your so-called dramatic effect? His eyes were bloodshot. Nezu turned to him, with what Momo could swear was a smile. Now now Aizawa, there are potential students here. She swore the principal winked at her. Power loader, should the zero pointer be able to do that? Vlad King asked with a small shiver in his voice. They all turned to the screen, to see what had him rattled. The red halo above the robot reached its two-third notch, and the robot was glowing. And no, definitely not. Power loader yelled as the robot began to shift like some transformer. It grew two separate arms, and all of its hands opened up to reveal laser shooters. Nezu simply cackled incredible. His quirk empowers his enemies in a way that makes fighting them beneficial for him. The zero pointer is stuck shooting in fixed patterns now, even if those shots are more powerful and faster than before. Before, it didn't have energy shots before. What the foo power loader, students here. DG is going on. Wait, the thin blonde guy yelled, focusing all attention on him. Izuku's energy bar is almost full. Izuku, did the teachers all know him? They all leaned forward, and then the bar underneath Izuku filled up, right as he corkscrewed between two laser beams. He stood in place, and his shooting ceased. A pinkish glow surrounded him and the lasers that hit him simply bounced of the pink barrier. Suddenly an enormous lotus of black energy surrounded by a pink halo manifested behind him. The boy, Izuku apparently, sent both his hands out in front of him, and the petals of the lotus shot out towards the robot, and completely eviscerated it. The boy was floating in the air, above the ruined remains of the robot, and then the lightning around him dissipated, and he started falling. Before the teachers could jump, a camera zoomed in on some girl slapping him in mid-air, dragging him slowly to the ground, and hurling. Izuku woke up to the sounds of yelling, cheering, and arguing. We should give him a warm welcome. It doesn't matter what you think, since it's not your quirk anymore, is it? A feminine voice Izuku didn't recognize. Yeah, lighten up. We're in an honest-to-god Denmaku. I doubt any of us could have made one for all any cooler than the ninth here. Another unrecognizable voice, masculine this time. Oh, oh Yoichi he's waking up. Several figured were crouched over Izuku. And when he wanted to speak he found his mouth simply wasn't there. Before he could panic, the feminine voice, belonging to a muscular woman with untamed black hair, calmed him down Whoa, their ninth, chill, you're safe. A few seconds of silence passed, oh yeah um you can't talk. Sue, I guess I'll just answer the questions I'll think you have first of all, my name is Nana Shimura, and yes, I am that pretty naturally. The woman, Nana, was cut off by a disgruntled silver-haired man with a tall spiked ponytail, who yanked her back by the collar. Get up ninth, as you may have surmised, since at least you've got a good head on your shoulders. This place is one for all. We're all the previous holders of the quirk, and I'll make things quick since I've got a bone to pick with you. Izuku stood shakily under the glare of the white-haired man. The short of it is that you'll get access to our quirks incrementally, but when you activate OFA suddenly then they'll simply integrate into your quirk in the most suitable manner. Usually we'd need to approve of you for you to be able to use our quirks, but since you have the most unreasonable birth quirk I've seen since all for one, that only stands when you use our quirks separately. I approve by the way. Nana interjected, mine is float and it allowed me to, um um, float, but after I got OFA it evolved and allowed me to fly, and it seems that your base quirk doesn't really modify it much hehe. <laughs> that means that you'll probably be able to use it on its own soon. Izuku looked around, and saw that he was in a completely grey realm, and most of the figures were still shadowed, probably those whose quirk he hadn't used yet, if he could understand the preliminary pattern. Well kiddo think a bit slower, not all of us are brainiacs. Nana jolted him out of his own head. Ah, makes sense that they could hear his thoughts. This was inside his mind. Yeah, of course. An unkempt man with long white hair waved to him. I'm Yuichi Shigaraki, the first, the loud but nice one is Nana Shimura, the seventh, spiky and mad is Bruce, the third, and muscles McBald hey. Wanope, you wanted to sit and be miserable, you get introduced by me. Who? Yeah, he's the fifth user. Welp, looks like you're waking up. See ya. In the infirmary, Ijiro was sitting between Yuraraka and All Might, in his skinny form, with Principal Nezu on All Might's head. Eraser head was leaning on the wall behind them, and Recovery Girl was muttering over the sleeping form of Izuku. The awkward atmosphere was almost stifling for him. After a few minutes of silence, All Might tried to force some levity. Well, at least we know how his quirk evolved. Do we, Yagi? Because I can't exactly explain what happened there. The impatience in Eraserhead's voice was palpable. Um did you um um expect Midoriya Kun's quirk to evolve in the exam? Ijiro wanted to facepalm. Hiroraka was still there, and she was definitely not in the know. All Might took his smartphone out and started to fiddle with it, but Ijiro saw that he was just opening and closing his messages over and over. Principal Nezu was grooming himself. Eraserhead was suddenly asleep. Crud, he was the last to react. Um um Kirishima-kun. You've known Midoriya for a while now, right? Was what he did normal for him? 
He almost caved under Yuraka's intense gaze. He really couldn't throw anyone else under the bus since they would all be his teachers, so he deflected. Well, I've known Madabra for about half a year. And he was always training his quirk I was at a different testing site than you two so I don't know what exactly you mean. He stretched the end of his words, anything to give him more time to think. When Izuku stirred awake, Madabro are you okay? Midoriya Kun how are you feeling? Ajiro and Yuraka spoke simultaneously, barely giving Izuku time to open his eyes. While he was cleaning the last remnants of sleep from his face, he mumbled something about verification of one for all in dreams. What was that, young Midoriya? All Might must have caught on to something there. Ah All Might, was your mentor's name Nana Shimura? Izuku finally opened his eyes and froze upon making eye contact with Yuraka. If the situation wasn't so tense, Ijiro would have laughed at how his face flickered between blushing, mortification, and terror at giving away a big secret. As it was, he just tried to make himself as least noticeable as possible. Any chance of them playing it off vanished when All Might choked in surprise, Eraserhead sighed, and Nezu laughed and asked, Izuku, where did you learn that? Izuku looked at Nezu, then at Yuraka, then at Nezu again, we'll explain everything to her. Besides, she got in. At this point Nezu turned to Yuraka. Congratulations Yuraka-san, this is your hero academia. Izuku deadpanned, but cleared his throat. Well, when I was passed out, I woke up inside OFA or something he kept sending glances at Yuraka, who was looking more and more confused. And there were these ghosts, like of the previous holders of OFA. Spooky All Might mumbled in a small voice. Anyway, so some of them were blurry but some spoke to me, and so OFA can integrate all of the previous holders' quirks into my base quirk, and that's what happened in the exam, but I might be getting access to each of them separately too. Are you sure you should be telling me this? Yuraka finally interjected. This all sounds really top secret and weird or like you're all playing a prank on me. Where's All Might? Why is everyone ignoring that you're just talking like he's here? She gradually became more frantic as she kept questioning everything, when a large puff of smoke shut her up. Hello young Yuraraka, I am here. All Might buffed himself up, and immediately poofed down into his true form. A few more seconds of awkward silence passed. That seemed to be the theme in the infirmary, when Izuku suddenly leapt forward to catch Yuraraka's prone body since she apparently fainted at the revelation. Who panicked after Achako blinked, hearing voices around her but not completely understanding them. Ember to look arrow a gruff voice belonging to one of the teachers, the scraggly one with messy hair. But Aizawa sensei, all might spill illusion before Kirishima Kun's voice. Achako was almost completely awake now, the events leading to her fainting rushing back. Midoriya still could have made a quick cover, his only blunder was asking about All Might's mentor, which could have been brushed off as dream delirium, you should know better than to get distracted by a girl, Midoriya. Achako sat upright as Midoriya Sen responded I didn't get distracted because she's a pretty girl. All Might choked at my question. Midoriya made eye contact with Achako. A thick awkwardness filled the room faster than the gas from Midnight's quirk. The teacher, Aizawa Sensei's, eyes glinted dangerously. Midoriya, I distinctly do not remember saying anything about a pretty girl. With his revenge seemingly being had, he got up and left. Gee good morning Yuraka san Um um I I mean, it's not a morning but I hope you s slept well, oh um um, that you're okay I mean. Midoriya went redder at every word, Kirishima and Principal Nezu grinning behind him. Achako couldn't help herself from chuckling. But when she saw Midoriya's face darken and hurt she immediately clarified, No no, I'm alright it's just a lot. Thank you for worrying. And, thank you for your help during the exam. You were all whoosh. Pew pew pew. And then the giant robot went CRRRPT and you had this giant flower go boom and then it all exploded like K-Blam. In her excitement she didn't even notice her exaggerated hand movements miming the entire narration until Midoriya giggled and brought her out of it. Principal Nezu cleared his throat. Izuku, this year there are 36% less examinees for the hero course, and between 38% minus 41% less in the other courses. Why? Achako had no idea where the sudden interjection came from, and didn't have time to think before Midoriya answered. Well, the academic entry requirements were identical, as were the non-recommended practical and written exams. Unless you gave me false guidelines when you asked me to write the written exam write the written exam. What? No other school has had a larger than normal sum of applicants until UA sent examination acceptance or rejection letters, after which there was an influx of applicants to other schools, negligible for each school, but adding up to nearly 35% for heroics so, the same amount of exam hopefuls wanted to attend there must have been some hidden requirement this year that made attending the test more difficult. You did more extensive background checks because of the shifts in heroic landscape and faculty in UA. Perfect deduction, Izuku. Now, this means your Raka-san has been vetted. And I already let slip that she had been accepted, so feel free to fill her in. Nezu made towards leaving, but stopped for a last question. 
We're still on for game night tomorrow, correct? Midoriya nodded enthusiastically. She felt a calloused hand on her shoulder. I had so many questions too, I understand. Just ask away. And remember you're not going through this alone. Hiroshima-san spoke with an overacted shadow on his face, but it couldn't hide his grin. Izuku was probably having the best week of his life. He had been meeting with Kirishima and Achako almost daily, talking and training. Sometimes Kirishima said he couldn't come, so it was just him and Achako. It was during one of these training sessions that he finally understood how to use float. Izuku knew he shouldn't use his height so blatantly against Yuraka. But every time he came up from ducking under one of her reaches, he couldn't help himself. By tilting his head 12 degrees forward, he could poke her in the eyes with the top of his hair. The first time he did it he laughed so hard that Yuraka wouldn't float him down until she got a stomachache. The next thing he tried was tilting 16 degrees forward to get his hair in her mouth. While that was distracting, it was unpleasant enough for both of them that he simply didn't try again. Eyes though, those were fair game. Slowly Yuraka adapted, leaning back or aiming lower, but Izuku was almost always a step faster, until she leaned forward, right as Izuku was shifting himself up toward her face. Instead of his hair in her face, it was his face and her something else. She let out a strangle deep, and they both fell over. For the first time in his life, Izuku lost track of time. Usually his heartbeats and breath were a good indicator. Now, both his heartbeat and his breathing became erratic as Yuraka above him filled his line of sight. Worse, her own erratic heartbeats and breath intermingled with his, making everything more confusing. A few seconds or minutes or hours later, she got up and reached out a hand to help him as well. They were both as quiet as they were red. Only when Yuraka looked down and then back into his eyes did Izuku realize he was at the same height as her, making level eye contact. A quirk-induced growth spurt. One of the unknown quirks from the previous users, the power of love. He was brought out of his embarrassing and disjointed thoughts when Yuraka touched her fingers together. Release nothing. Release. Nothing. Oh oh no, Izuku I think I got you stuck like that. Izuku. He, but he had more important things to do than think about that development, like stopping her from crying or feeling bad. And no Oacha Achako. It's probably my Q quirk, not yours, um um, remember. It can do all sorts of things. Don't worry I Izuku. I'll H hold on to you so you won't float away. Don't worry, okay. Achako wore a determined expression on her face and grabbed onto his arm tightly. Izuku didn't know exactly why, but having her hold onto him so tightly made him float higher. Wait, if I can't analyze what's happening that well then it must be my quirk. He looked to his worried yet determined friend. It's okay, this is definitely part of my quirk. Um um, either float or some unknown factor. I'll try to control it, B but, don't let go. If he could see into the vestige realm, he would have gotten the distinct impression that Nana was snickering at how his voice shifted from calm and soothing to blushing and panicked in the span of a couple of seconds. It took him a few long seconds, but eventually Izuku managed to control his movements left and right, and finally to land. Way to go Izuku. Achako cheered. Although, did she sound a little disappointed? Do you think you know how to use it now? You're really smart so you'll definitely get it. Um, um I don't know exactly how to activate it do you th think you could help me oh Achako? He honestly didn't know how to activate it yet, but he also wasn't going to look for alternatives to the only method he already knew. Oh, sure, by her blush, she must have caught on to the fact that they switched to given names, what do you need me to do? W well, it activated when 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 you hugged me. Izuku had his eyes shut tight and his head tilted down. His blood was pumping so hard in his ears that he couldn't hear her definitely negative response. Then, Izuku felt her arms wrap around him and suddenly he felt weightless again. It took them time, and a lot of embarrassment, but eventually Izuku got the hang of using float. Apparently it allowed him to completely fly, though not with the insane speed and precision as when he activated OFA in its entirety. They had to move from full hugs to one-armed hugs, then to her holding his arm, then to holding hands. Of course that made them realize that they never checked the opposite direction. Luckily, Izuku could also activate float by hugging her. They interspersed the quirk training with spars, and after almost three hours of practice, they were red in the face from exertion. I I think I can control it now, Achako. I only end need to think about it now to start float. Oh that's great I Izuku. Amazing. Her genuine smile turned bashful. But if you need to then just tell me and I'll help you again. Maybe it needs to stay recharged. Nana Shimura was howling with laughter. D did you hear that? Stay recharged. What does she think that even means? Oh my god this is too funny please tell me that one of you has a secret memory recording and projection quirk they haven't told us about. Thanks, I couldn't have done it without you. Really Achako you're such an incredible friend. Izuku told her with his blindingly bright smile. She hoped he hadn't realized how hard her heart was beating during the training. And she was self-aware enough to realize that it wasn't all adrenaline and exercise that got her there. In the few seconds of silence Achako realized that she and Izuku had drawn closer, like a slow-motion version of one of the tens of hugs they just shared. 
tilting her head down and looking into his eyes. She realized that they both knew this hug would be different. It would be a hug just because they wanted to hug. Hey guys, sorry I'm late. I brought snacks and soda. Kirishima burst into the training room without noticing the incredibly dense tension he just shattered. Nezu held out a paw and Kayama Nimiri, the pro heroine Midnight, grumbled as she shoved a few bills into it. You could have stopped it you know. Don't you want to get Izuku a girlfriend? Heck, with his charm and power he could get three. Nezu calmly folded the money into his wallet. Of course I want him to get a girlfriend, but I also don't want to interfere with his life in a controlling manner. Nezu was still wrapping his head around having a genuine, no ulterior motives or working relationships, friend. He found that it was a very pleasant aspect to life. Why? He even found himself so content at times that he stopped scheming for revenge some nights. And while I do hope that Izuku will be happy whoever he ends up with, I do hope that Yuraka will be the one. He completely ignored Midnight's suggestive eyebrow wiggles at the idea of multiple partners. He thought that just wouldn't sit right with the boy, even if he still couldn't understand human mating habits. Izuku, Anchako, and Ijiro approached the tall door. They were somewhat early, but it was still surprising how silent the class was. Only a few giggles and muted conversations, together on the count of three. Ijiro asked and both his friends nodded. One, two, T-H-R-E the door opened before they could finish, and a tall blue-haired kid stood before them. Excuse me, are you going to loiter outside and make noise? You are disturbing the students. If you are not part of the class I must request that you leave oh I apologize I did not recognize you, you must be here since you got accepted, right? When the blue-haired kid recognized Madabro, he changed his tune fast. I am Itatenya. He bowed at a 90-degree angle and gestured for them to enter. Oh, I'm Kirishima Ijiro. And these are Yuraraka Achako. Yuraraka waved her hand to the students in the class, who were by now paying attention, and Midoriya Izuku. Madabra also started to make a small wave with his hand, but the sound of a gasp made them all turn around, realizing she had drawn all the attention to herself. A tall girl with a black spiky ponytail reddened slightly and cleared her throat. I apologize for my outburst Midoriya-san, but I must ask how you managed the written exam. In the rankings we received I was third, with an evaluation of adequate knowledge of sciences and quirk law, but needs work on flexibility and adapting to unknown quirks and partial information. You on the other hand, were ranked first and your evaluation was public victory. Was there some sort of technique or trick to manage the written scenarios that I missed? I must admit that I spent the last week reading case studies and materials regarding the scenarios that stumped me. Wait what are you talking about? Midoriya Izuku is the one that got first on the written exam, but his score was simply N. A. Right. A smaller teenager with a purple bob cut asked, and everyone turned expectantly towards Midoriya. Ijiro hadn't noticed, but the class had filled up while they were all talking, and every single one of them was laser-focused on Madabro. W. Wait, why you were the one with the joint agency operation against the drug manufacturers where one of the heroes was actually an addict and tried to sabotage it? While the tall girl nodded, Ijiro felt a hand on his shoulder, Hey man, what are they talking about? We only got grades on our written, right? Oh yeah, they're talking about some other thing I think, Madabro got in. On the written exam for us since he was the one who wrote it Ijiro turned to see who was talking to him and saw a guy around his height with blonde hair and a black stripe in it. Close, Ijiro cleared his throat. Yeah, so Madabro did some other written exam, he said it was really fun. When they turned back to Midoriya they saw him apologizing to the tall girl I'm sorry Yeyarazu's. I didn't know the scenarios were for other examinees. Nezu only told me to evaluate each participant after they were all done. Midoriya-san, what do you mean each participant? Weren't you only in charge of my scenario? The girl, Yeyarazu something, looked between apprehensive and confused. Ah uh, and no. Part of my exam was to be able to adapt all scenarios simultaneously without mixing them up. I was the only one writing the scenarios. Izuku noticed the increased focus on him and suddenly turned to the door. Ijiro was sure he was going to bolt for it when he suddenly bowed Aizawa-sensei. Sorry for not seeing you earlier. Everyone turned to the door, only to see Aizawa sigh and climb out of a sleeping bag on the floor well. I wanted to see how long it took you all to notice me. But I should have known better with Midoriya in this class no. Don't dare say sorry for having a good situational awareness Midoriya. He preempted Madabro's apology. Everyone, get to you seats. Not you Midoriya get up here. When everyone was seated in front of a grumpy Aizawa and shy Midoriya, the teacher spoke again, I am Aizawa Shota and I'll be your homeroom teacher. This is Midoriya Izuku. He will be my ta for all non-heroics classes except for English and literature, during which he will be observing class 1B's heroics classes. Now get changed into your sports gear and meet me behind at the field behind the school. You can ask Midoriya any questions on the way, but you have five minutes. Aizawa left, leaving a shocked class behind him. Most shocked of all though, was Midoriya, who looked to be completely blindsided by everything his teacher just dropped on them. 
The stress ball in his hand was almost destroyed. It would have been the fifth one since he received the results of the entrance exam. Congratulations Bakugo-san. This is your hero academia. Katsuki could barely hear the hologram rat. Too many shocks. He wasn't surprised the nerd got first on the written exam. His quirk was like a cheat. But the practical, it was bad enough that he only got fourth place with 77 villain points, but three people beat him. Third place was some Yurahaver, with 68 villain points and 20 rescue points. What the hell are rescue points? But the two that came in first beat him out even in villain points. Some Kira something got fucking 82 villain points and 15 rescue points. And the fucking nerd, somehow, with his fucking useless quirk, got 101 villain points and 74 fucking rescue points. They would have beaten him even without those stupid hidden points. Did you hear me Bakugo-san? This is very important. The stupid rat looked at him from his stupid desk. Katsuki didn't understand why he was called to the principal's office on the first day, but whatever. Yeah yeah I heard you he answered with a hand wave. The only reason we admitted you was because Izuku personally intervened. Most of the staff were against it, seeing your history with bullying and personality evaluation. Please remember that, Bakugo-san, and stay on your best behavior, especially towards Izuku. Katsuki swore that he saw some evil glint in the rat's eyes when he talked about Izuku. With grit teeth, Katsuki nodded his head, the stress ball flaking in his hand. Got it, I'm going to class. Ah, your class is on the way to the field behind the building, for a quirk apprehension test. Katsuki growled and stormed off to join the extras that would be in his class. Now the nerd wouldn't be able to cheat. Everyone would see how useless his quirk is and he'd be kicked out. At least that thought cheered him up. Now he only hoped to be in class with those other two extras so he could also prove that he was also better than them. All right everyone, it took you all 7 minutes and 44 seconds to change and arrive. We'll need to improve on that so please notice what you think took the most of your time. As heroes we need to move quickly form place to place, and also change our gear at a moment's notice so um, um yeah. Even though we're only on our way to the first quirk apprehension text, there's already stuff to learn. The ta was smiling nervously, while the girl with the brown hair and the spiky red-haired kid were shooting him a non-discreet thumbs up. Toru thought it was a bit funny how jittery he was seeing as he was supposed to be leading the class. After an awkward moment of silence, he spoke again. So, we all did physical tests in middle school. This will be like that only we'll be allowed to use our quirks. Great, already at a disadvantage, Toru thought bitterly. The pink girl next to her, Ashido Mina, was about to jump and say something when Midoriya stopped her. Uh, I hope none of you will treat this like a game or like a fun exercise. He was looking directly at Ashido, like he somehow knew. It's important to get a baseline for how our quirks interact with our bodies in different modes of movement and strain, and how powerful the activation of our quirk in each of those modes can be. I expect you all to give it your best, since this will be the yardstick by which you will measure yourself throughout the year. Toru could have sworn that she heard their actual teacher scoff, and Midoriya's eyes darting to him told her she was correct. All right, Urashi saw. Yes, a tall boy with a shaved head leaped up with a raised hand. Midoriya seemed taken aback, but gathered himself and cleared his throat while looking at a list Aizawa sensei gave him. You came in first in the recommended exam's practical portion, so please come and help me demonstrate. What was your record for the ball throw in middle school? No problem. Urashi stepped forward while bowing, in am I? I'll, I'll wait please Urashi-san. The tall boy froze in place comically, and Midoriya almost sprinted towards the rest of the students. He finally stopped in front of a short thin girl with a purple bob cut, Gyro-san, right. Is your enhanced hearing only through the extended jacks, or through the typical cochlear system as well? Gyro was gaping at him, as were the rest of the students. The longer the silence continued the more he started fidgeting, clearly uncomfortable with all the attention on him. Toru once again wondered how someone so timid could be their ta. Luckily for him, Gyro snapped back and answered, only through the jacks, but how did? Oh you were wincing when Urashi-san spoke, and I thought that this whole thing would probably get loud. Um um, hold on, Midoriya looked around, but when he couldn't find what he was looking for he glanced worriedly at Aizawa, and removed his tie, you can wrap this around the jacks, meanwhile I'll ask Nezu to send over some protective gear. He went back to the front wall texting on his phone, and then turned back to them. Right, thank you for waiting Urashi-san, please make sure to speak in a lower volume unless your quirk necessitates a louder volume in which case we can start to look into support gear for that. No PR no problem Midoriya-san. Somehow he was able to convey yelling while whispering. The way you noticed your classmates' discomfort and immediately did something to help is super inspiring. I can see why you're the teaching assistant. We already have so much to learn from you. Midoriya blushed and cleared his throat I'm sure you'll all pass me in no time. So middle school. Yes, in middle school I could throw the ball almost 80 meters without use of my quirk. I 80 meters. Toru looked around and saw that she wasn't the only one shocked by that number. 
Midoriya simply handed him a ball and asked him to throw it with his quirk. Irashi looked pumped. He probably has some super useful quirk for that. No stop. Toru you got into the hero course, and this is only the start. No bitterness. Toru was torn out of her spiraling thoughts by an enormous gust of wind that blew most of the students on their backs. Midoriya looked at his measurement device and read out 821 meters. Way to go Yurashi-san. Yurashi bowed at his waist and went back to the class. Midoriya looked a bit apprehensive, but still steeled himself to say something. Look, Yurashi-san has a really cool quirk, and it was also super useful for ball throws, right? The students nodded, hesitating. Yeah, um um, but not everyone has a quirk that's good for throwing balls. Or um um, fighting or stealth or anything. W what I want to say is that this is only one kind of benchmark. Gyro-san probably can't throw a ball further by hearing it well. But a quirk like hers would be essential for any hero collaboration. Wait um um, so what I am trying to say is that you should all give it your all, even if you think this is biased and unfair and that your quirk won't be any help. Sometimes heroes get a bad matchup. And we also need to deal with those sorry I'm rambling um um yes so the first event is the 50 meter dash. Mina finally got her chance to pair up with Aijiro during the seated toe touch. Su Aiji, is that the new friend you've been gushing about all year? Aijiro blushed at her wiggling eyebrows in suggestive tone. Yeah, but it's not like that. He breathed out slowly. I think he and Yuraka sen like each other, and even if not, I'm not sure if he, you know, is a batter's batter, prefers the harpoon to the cannon. Some other thinly veiled metaphor. Aijiro shot her an unimpressed look, even though Mina was definitely proud of herself for that first one. Well, his loss either way, but I see what you meant at least. And Mina really did see. The green-haired Ta ran from student to student, asking them some short questions about their quirks and giving them some advice. Sometimes he would glance at Aizawa and let a student redo an exercise after talking. She saw that completely black with white hair student talking to him after the 50-meter dash and then redoing it, except the second time he threw a baseball, jumped into its shadow, and jumped out at the end. He looked more surprised than Midoriya did, which amused Mina. Don't look so smug. Wait till he hits you with a few questions. There are pros who don't know their quirks as well as he does. Aijiro left her with those ominous words, and she almost screamed when she heard Midoriya's voice from behind her. Ashido-san, right. Would you mind if I asked you some questions about your quirk? Mina turned to him and nodded. Right, so, is there a limit to the pH levels of acids you can make? Can you make any acid you want? How about Sever? What the hell is going on here? Mina was saved by a blonde kid barging in on them, with explosions sparking from his hands. She would have felt relieved if she hadn't seen Midoriya flinch in fear from right in front of her. He literally froze, but before Mina could ask him what's wrong, their teacher restrained the new kid. Back Hugo you will control yourself or I will send you right back to Nezu. And from there to Gen Ed or home, is that understood? At this point the entire class was looking at them. TCH, fine he responded, while not looking close to fine and Mina's opinion. She could have sworn that Aizawa looked worriedly toward Midoriya for a fraction of a second. Come with me I'll catch you up on the tests. When Mina turned back, Midoriya looked completely out of it. Midoriya, oh, can I call you Midori? That's so much easier. Plus it sounds cuter too, you can be Midori Sensei. She winked at Aijiro who was looking worried, and grinned as he nodded at her. She would definitely get him right back into action. Oh oh, I guess. Me but not sensei. I'm not a teacher. And Midori is fine though with a high five. Mina answered his questions, or at least tried to. Yeah, now she could understand why everyone he chatted with looked both happy and miserable after. The rest of the day passed pretty uneventfully. Even though it seemed that the faculty acted like Midoriya was the actual teacher. She was sure present Mike was looking at memes while Midori was teaching them English. The only thing she would need to take care of was the death glares she was getting from Yuraraka. Ever since she called Midori Midori out loud, she found her chance right after lunch. Haya, Yuraraka, right. Can I call you Achako? Maybe Acha. I'm Ashido Mina, but only Mina is fine. Positive energy bomb. Prevent the anger and jealousy. Mina saw the uncertain expression on Yuraraka's face and knew she already won. Uh, hi. Yeah, I'm Yuraraka Achako. Yeah, her nickname is fine, I think. She looked genuinely confused, so Mina leaped at the opportunity. I'm trying to give everyone nicknames. It'll bring the whole class closer. I wanted to explain that to Midori, but Blasty interrupted us. Acha's shoulders sagged a fraction in relief. Okay, she definitely liked Midori. Now it was her sacred duty to bring them together. Say Acha, you and Midori are pretty close, right? WW what? And no what are you talking about? Avit blush. She lived for that kind of reaction. Time to release the pressure for today's attack. Really? I talked with Aiji and he said the three of yo were pretty close friends, right? Mina grinned at Acha's super obvious reactions. Why yeah, we're friends all three of us I mean. Yeah oh look class is starting Izuku will be disappointed if we're late. Mina turned when she heard another voice beside her. She didn't even notice she called him Izuku, did she? 
It took her a bit, but Mina realized that the floating school uniform beside her was probably the invisible girl. Nope. Mina smirked with a popped pee and reached out a hand, Ashido Mina, expert on all things dance, acid, or love-related. She felt her classmate and soon-to-be co-conspirator grasp it in a shake. Hagakir Toru, connoisseur of romance and relationships, both budding and grown. Yagi was grateful that his protege helped him with the lesson plan. His original wasn't bad, but it was definitely reckless. Izuku kept the outline but changed enough to make it virtually unrecognizable. The only thing they disagreed about was whether they should be in costume or not. But Izuku convinced him that they should vet the costumes after getting to know the students better. All right zygotes. He chuckled inwardly. Who would have thought that young Izuku would be the least starstruck in their first lesson? The first lesson will be split into three parts. Each of you will write down what aspects of heroism they think they are suited for and what uses of their quirk can help. Then, we will pair up randomly. Each student in a pair will be either a villain or a hero, also randomly. And you will draw from a set of random scenarios with different victory conditions for each scenario. Yagi saw that he was beginning to lose them. We can get to the rest later. For now everyone write down what they think they are most suited for in heroism, and what about their quirk could help that. They all looked hesitant but got to writing after they saw Izuku write his note. Perfect young Izuku. Now draw a number from the box Izuku winced. And when Yagi saw the rest of the students look between him and Izuku, he realized he probably shouldn't have called Izuku by his given name. Well, he would simply try to not acknowledge it. One by one the students handed in their papers and drew a number from a box, after which they drew whether they would buy a hero or villain, and finally the scenarios. Hiro Tsunotori Pony vs. Villain Kaminari Denki in a stakeout over a drug deal. Hiro Hagakir Toru vs. Villain Itatenya in a chase with stolen goods. Hiro Takoyami Fumikage vs. Villain Kirishima Ijiro in combat. Hiro's Yanagi Riaiko. Mizo Shoji vs. Villain Jairo Kayoka where the villain must escape a building. Hiro Kiruwaro Shihai vs. Villains Yuraka Achako, Yurashi Inasang combat till backup arrives. Hiro's Midoriya Izuku. Momo Yeyurazu vs. Villains Todoroki Shoto, Asuitsuyu where the villains must protect a bomb from heroes. Hiro Siro Hanta vs. Villain Ashido Mina in hostage situation. Hiro Bakugo Katsuki vs. Villain Ayama Yuga where the hero has to move an item from location A to B. Batch 1. Hiro Tsunotori Pony vs. Villain Kaminari Denki. Pony was grateful to Midoriya that he was willing to translate everything, and then also make sure that there were handouts in English for her after he realized she didn't know enough Japanese. She broke out of her thoughts when she saw Kaminari slink through an alley. He could write any number of minutes between 3 and 6, and choose a location on the map. If Pony caught him before he reached the location and the amount of time passed, they both lost. If he managed to get away to a safe house he would win, and if she caught him during the deal then she would win. She prepared herself, he was looking around and up, but he couldn't see her through the crate she was hiding in. She saw him crouch toward one of the possible marked locations, and store a bag in a crack. Right when he was bent over in the least convenient position, Pony struck. She sent out her horns extremely fast and almost landed a perfect hit. She expected both more and less. He reacted quickly enough, and the horns only landed a glancing blow. However, he didn't know where she was, so he chose to let out a burst of lightning all around himself. She was thankful she wasn't near him, and since it seemed that attack took a lot out of him, she ran up and captured him. Result, Hero wins. Match 2. Hero Hagakir Toru vs. Villain Ida Tenya. A high-speed chase against a villain with a speed quirk. Of course, she tried, she ran after him, tried to use her athleticism to reach higher ground and throw things to trip him, but it was a matter of minutes until he got away. She heard Midoriya in her earpiece, right as All Might was declaring that the villain team won. Don't worry Hagakira-san, you had a good plan and did the best you could, now you could think of incorporating a ranged support item. That's what we're here for, to learn. Toru sniffled a little and smiled. She was definitely learning. Result, villain wins. Match 3, Hiro Takoyami Fumikage vs. Villain Kirishima Ijiro. Ijiro was thankful for all the training with Madabro. No way he would have been so efficient and creative with his quirk otherwise. He might have still won simply on account of his stamina, but now, he felt that he had an unfair advantage. The moment Takoyami's quirk, Dark Shadow, erupted out and wrapped him, Ijiro started rapidly activating and deactivating his hardening. Madabra said that it could be used for utility, since it changed the volume and shape of his body, but also if he could make himself vibrate fast enough through it, for offense. For this match utility was enough. The minute he was grabbed, he hardened into hardened, immediately moving around to take more volume. The more he repeated the more room he had, until he slipped out of Dark Shadow's grasp and lunged toward Takoyami, where he swiftly dispatched the raven-headed student in close combat. Result, Villain wins. Match 4. Heroes Yanagi Riaiko, Mizo Shoji vs. Villain Jairo Kayoka. 
Ryaiko was paired with the loud boy with a wind quirk. But when they drew a scenario it said hero to scenario 4 villain to scenario 5. It seemed that fates have conspired to keep her away from the dark shrouded boys in class. If only she were the villain she would be matched up against Kirwaro san As it was, she would still give her best effort to work with her partner. Though she may hear our voices at all times, we shall entomb the nefarious villain in this very building. Her partner looked at her as if he were trying to figure out what she meant. Ah, I can enhance my senses as well, Yanagi-san. He demonstrated by growing multiple ears on the edges of his multiple limbs. She needs to escape within five minutes or it's our win, so I'll monitor her and we can intercept her together. She followed Mizo around for almost two minutes, believing in his senses, when suddenly he cringed and fell back. A loud boom echoed from the building, and a window shattered as the villain leapt out of it. I know all the weaknesses of having sharp senses. You'll never catch me heroes. As she was gloating in the air, Ryaiko grasped at her shoe with her quirk and pulled. Whoa and what? The villain landed with a thus on the ground, and Ryaiko restrained her with capture tape. The shadows harbor many villains, but it is the heroes who lurk in it are no less righteous than their counterparts in the light. Result, heroes win. Match 5. Hero Kiruwaro Shihai vs. Villains Yuraka Achako. Yurashi and Isai in combat till backup arrives. And Isao was having a great start to his school career. If he were to be honest with himself, he sort of enrolled out of spite simply to defeat Endeavor's kid. Luckily for him, the rest of the class was full of passion. Their ta was inspiring and smart. Everyone was nice and really driven. Yuraka noticed immediately how Kirwaro's quirk worked, and they worked together to clear away debris that could cause shadows. After that, it was a simple matter for her to negate his gravity and him to propel himself forward on his wind, until they apprehended Kirwaro. Looks like we make a great team, right Yuraka-san? He turned and saw her wave at Midoriya enthusiastically, and the green-haired teacher reciprocated. How passionate. Oh, um, um yeah. You were really good Yurashi-san. She smiled at him while walking toward Midoriya. Result, villains win. Match 6, Heroes Midoriya Izuku. Yeyarazu Momo vs. Villains Todoroki Shoto, Asui Tsuyu. Shoto was infuriated inside. Not only was he not alone, they even sent one of the heroes to join him. His teammates were Asui and Yeyarazu, but he wasn't listening to what they were saying. The moment All Might yelled start Shoto unleashed a giant iceberg to cover the building. He felt a little bad for his teammates but any second All Might would declare his victory and he would destroy the glacier. That didn't happen. Instead, the window shattered and Midoriya flew inside, surrounded by ice shards that surrounded him in a crystalline structure. The shot out in a spread pattern, enveloped in a pink halo, and with every chunk of ice they broke his enemy made himself more ammo. He could hardly keep track of Midoriya flying around, until the green-haired boy flew straight behind him and lifted a sui in his hands. Todoroki-san, thaw you out. Use your fire. She's weak to cold. Midoriya looked panicked, tears in his eyes, as he held Asui close to his chest. Shoto froze at that second. What? That wasn't how it was supposed to go. Out of instinct he sent an attack toward his enemy, and saw Midoriya's eyes narrow. Fine, Midoriya growled, eyes shards multiplying around him, if that's how you want it. The pink glow intensified, and the shards froze in place. That's how it'll be. Suddenly the ice ricocheted around the narrow room. Midoriya weaved gracefully between the innumerable icy daggers. At some point he picked up Yeyarazu as well. Shoto felt the ice pelt him from all directions, and then the air left his lungs when Midoriya rammed into him. Hero wins All Might declared, and just like that the shards fell to the floor. The room was almost clear of ice after Midoriya's barrage, and the boy rushed toward him from where he held onto the bomb. It's over now Todoroki-san. Warm them up. Asui-san is going to get permanent damage. Shoto looked at the girls in Midoriya's arms, both shivering but Asui was starting to look blue. I I can't Shoto knew he was wrong, but he couldn't move, he could barely eye anything. Midoriya looked at him with such immense disappointment that Shoto was rendered speechless. As he flew out to find Recovery Girl, Shoto was reminded not of his father, who was always disappointed by holding him up to some standard that was always shifting but of his mother. When Shoto was five and he broke his sister's Ryuku figure, Shoto insisted that it wasn't his fault. But they both knew it was, and one disappointed look from her was enough to send him apologizing into Fayumi's arms. A look that said it's okay you did something wrong, you just need to fix it. Result, Hero wins. Match 7. Hero Siro Hanta vs. Villain Ashido Mina in hostage situation. Mina knew that her opponent was as shaken up as she was by that last match, but she hoped that he would shake himself out of it and face her with everything he has. Her win condition was to defeat him, escape the building, or survive five minutes without him winning. The problem was, she had no idea what Siro's win conditions were, and she knew he had some additional lose conditions. The location was the third floor of an office building, cubicles giving her cover. She had five mannequins to serve as hostages. Welp, time to think like a villain. She tied three hostages with a rope and took the lightest one with her. The fifth she tossed out the window. 
Sarah leapt with his tape to secure the hostage. That's good. That means he'll lose if one of them dies. Lucky Midori asked me so much about my acid yesterday, and I had time to train. Mina threw two more hostages and left them hanging by rope, and drizzled acids of different strength on each rope. They would release the hostages at separate times. The fourth hostage she tied taut in a wheeled chair, along with a rope that would soon snap, sending the hostage careening out of the window. Mina didn't realize she was cackling, but the entire class did, while they observed in shocked silence as she built villainous mechanisms worthy of Dick Dastardly. Mina sprinted down with the last hostage, and when she exited the building Ciro was in front of her, just like she planned. Three stories above them, a window shattered in the last unaccounted for mannequin flew to the ground. Ciro looked at her, then at the hostage, then back at her. He was mouthing a question but quickly shot himself up to rescue the mannequin, letting Mina escape. Result, villain wins. Match 8. Hero Bakugo Katsuki vs. Villain Ayama Yuva and where the hero has to move an item from location to be. Katsuki was pissed. Sparkles tried saying something but Katsuki just told him to fuck off. He took his item and didn't bother listening to anything else. He charged ahead until he saw Sparkles and then veered off course to attack his opponent instead of proceeding to his destination. If he beat him up Katsuki would win anyway. Damn it stop running you fucking extra. Why the fuck was Sparkles not staying to fight? He probably knew Katsuki would crush him. He chased the blonde kid around, until he heard a voice from his earpiece. Villain wins. Sparkles stopped in place and panted, but Katsuki was frozen in place. You had to move the item within three minutes, young Bakugo. Result, villain wins. Fuck that. Izuku made it back with Yeyorazu and Tsu halfway through Bakugo's match. Maybe that will knock some sense into him. He saw All Might gesture to him, and Izuku took over. All right, first of all great job everybody. Bakugo and Shoto bristled. These matchups were random, and so were the scenarios. Sometimes a rescue hero encounters a villain. Sometimes you team up with people randomly. A hero's work is predictable in its unpredictability. Izuku looked around to see who was more despondent and who less. He'd need to report that back to Aizawa. Now, at the start of the lesson you each wrote down some things. I'd like everyone to write down the strengths and weaknesses of their opponents. And if they had any, teammates. I'll write down what I saw for each of you. And for those whose matches I missed, I'll review the footage and have it to you by half an hour after school is over, if you won't wait. F for homework. Izuku stuttered over his words. He was assigning homework. For homework I'd like you all to review what you wrote, and what others wrote about you, and write what you agree with and disagree with, and why. It can also be you changing your minds about what you wrote after being in an unfamiliar matchup and scenario. Izuku saw the class talking among themselves, and started writing. While each of them had one or two briefs, he had nineteen. Ah well, the day is almost over. The rest of the week would be costumes, review, and regular classes, but tomorrow he also had class 1B's heroics. At least the quirks were all so cool. Izuku couldn't help but smile. Maze Builder, good to see you back in the land of the living. Set in stone, no need for sarcasm. I assure you I was on a case that required my full attention. Maze Builder, so this has nothing to do with the fact that I know who the successor is and approve of them. Set in stone, while I am certainly not pleased, and do believe it had been foolishness to dismiss my candidate, I am a professional. I would not let something like that hinder working relations. In front of his computer, Nezu sighed. Sasaki Murai always had too many emotions. How he could be so out of touch with them was a mystery to the principal gerbil. He only hoped that when Midoriya and him met, it would all resolve amicably. Maze Builder, so why are you back now? Set in stone, if you would have waited for a minute before messaging me privately, you would have seen. I need help analyzing some criminal activities attributed to the Yakuza. I was planning on requesting a group discussion. It was only the third day, and Izuku already had so many notes and questions for his classmates. It would be torture to wait until the end of the day to go over them. Well, hopefully the teachers wouldn't work him too hard in the following classes. He spent some of yesterday preparing handouts and exercises for the upcoming classes, so it shouldn't be too bad. He and Ectoplasm were passing out a mathematical assessment quiz to start the lesson, when the pause system blared to life from the hidden speakers in the corners or the ceiling. Class 1 Amidoriya Izuku. Class 1 Amidoriya Izuku, please check your phone. His classmates were staring at him in the silence left by Nezu's voice, and Izuku took out his phone with a blush. Set in stone, at Green Lotus, I apologize for my abrupt absence, I was on an important case. Green Lotus, it's okay Maze Builder told me already. Set in stone, good, I am glad I did not cause you any undue worry. Maze Builder, now that we've gotten the pleasantries out of the way why don't we get to business? Green Lotus, oh is there something you need help with? Set in stone, indeed. I have encountered some stumbling blocks as a case I'm working on, and would appreciate your analytical expertise. I could send you the files. I am employing a new encryption method that I hope will pose more of a challenge to you. Green Lotus, sure sounds good. 
Maze Builder, how about we meet in person? I happen to be near Green Lotus and we can be at your agency in a couple of hours. Green Lotus, no prob if you can get me out early. Izuku put down his phone when he saw he wasn't getting a response, and went to help a few classmates with raised hand. He only had a few minutes to make rounds before the door opened. Nezu came in with a phone in hand, and called to him, Izuku are you ready? Principal Nezu Midoriya san is currently aiding me in class. Please wait until the lesson is over. Izuku sweat dropped at ectoplasm's attempts to keep him in class, but Nezu simply laughed. Overruled, this is important. Um, um Nezu, will I be back in time for 1B's heroics? Izuku was hesitant to miss it, since it was going to be their first lesson. Probably not, so I'll make sure All Might records everything. Besides, let him know you meant set in stone later and it'll be fine. The principal grinned as if he knew something Izuku didn't. Izuku heard Mina's voice as he left the class. Ectoplasm Sensei, does this mean we don't need to finish the quiz? Murai Sasaki was curious. When in the last year did Nezu meet Green Lotus, and why were they together? Not for the first time he regretted his childish silence. Even if it was unfair that Nezu knew the successor to OFA before him, it wasn't Nezu who was to blame. Not at all. In fact, Murai was quite clear that the blame was split between him and All Might fairly equally each more stubborn than the other over the most foolish of points. However, he was self-aware enough to admit that it stung, to be so far from his friend's life that he was only made aware retroactively, and that Mirio, a perfect inheritor, was completely overlooked. A knock on his door shook him out of his commiserations. Sir, Nezu is here to see you with a guest. His secretary, a lean short man around Murai's age, looked more hesitant than usual around him. Yes, I've been expecting them. Is something the matter? Prepare some tea for us please and tell them I'll see them in the meeting room. Ah, does the guest seem like a fan? Night Eye Agency prided itself on impeccable public image. They had to, since any smudge on them would by association be a smudge on All Might. Therefore all administrative personnel were trained to recognize fans and direct them to differently decorated sitting rooms. His secretary chuckled. If he told me he's the number two fan of All Might, I would think that no one is number one. Where I was used to the roundabout way of speaking, and quickly understood what the man was trying to say. All right, then lead them to my office then. He wasn't a vain man, nor was he a materialistic one. The one vice he allowed himself though, was his All Might merchandise collection. If Green Lotus was a fan, then his poster and figure-laden office would make the best impression possible. They could be heard from down the hall, although the words themselves were muffled. A frantic, fairly high-pitched, voice shooting rapidly, interspersed by Nezu's familiar chuckles. His secretary opened the door for them, with a tray of tea in one hand, and Murai saw exactly why his secretary seemed so hesitant earlier. I can believe it Sir Naide is my friend Nezayok knew about it. Nezu laughed at the hyperventilating kid's energy. But now that Murai could see his face and hear him clearly, this was a sort of laughter he hadn't ever heard from Nezu before. It wasn't a victory laugh, or a schadenfreude laugh, or an I know something you don't laugh. If Murai wasn't mistaken, and he rarely was, it was an indulgent, kind, laugh. I do know Izuku, and I would have told you earlier had I not wished to keep the surprise. Besides, until he was back to full communication there would have been no point. This will be a good opportunity to update Sasaki-kun on several topics. All the heuristics of this interaction led Murai to a very implausible conclusion, the short green-haired boy in a UA. School uniform was his online colleague of almost ten years, Green Lotus. The boy stopped looking between him and Nezu and started gazing around the office. Well, at least impressing him wouldn't be as hard as Murai feared. You're handling this much better than Aizawa-kun did, and you have much more to be surprised by. Nezu took a seat as the kid was scrambling around the room. Is he really Green Lotus? Does his quirk affect his outward appearance, or did I give a lot of quirk advice from a ten-year-old? Murai could hardly conceal his mirth. It was funny in all the best ways. His sidekick had been begging him to set her up with his mysterious analyst friend ever since he gave her some advice about her combat style. He could see that Nezu shared his amusement. Well, he's 15 now, so maybe Bubble Girl shouldn't lose hope. Oh my god they turned to the Green Lotus, the redacted Gal Might figurine from when All Might was hit with a body-altering quirk while busting a corrupt politician's backroom meeting. That's almost as incredible as knowing that Set in Stone is actually you, Sir Naita. I can't believe one of the coolest heroes ever is my friend. The kid froze suddenly, and the color drained from his face. Oh, um um, sorry, I had just assumed that since me and Nezu are actual friends, I mean in real life, then you would be too. Since we're in the same group chat but yeah it makes sense if you wouldn't I mean. Haha, you probably have so much on your hands, um um, right? So you wanted some help analyzing something. Murai tried orienting himself after the roller coaster of emotions he just witnessed. Well, anyone who's as diligent and intelligent as you, as well as being Nezu's friend is obviously someone that I would like to call a friend. That you're a fan of All Might ensures already that we have much in common. I'm Sasaki Murai, hero named Sir Naidai. 
Mirai stood and bowed slightly, extending a hand to shake. It looked for a moment as if he said something wrong, since the kid was tearing up. But the wobbly smile accompanying those tears made him hold his tongue. I'm Midoriya Izuku. It's an honor to meet you both as one of my idols and one of my two closest friends. Izuku bowed at the waist and shook Mirai's hand. You can call me Izuku if you want. Please, call me Mirai then. It was a puzzle for him. How could someone who has worked with them for so long, and already be close with Nezu, immediately assume his presence would be unwanted? The body language, the fear of rejection, the fact that a teenager's closest friends were too online near strangers. All those behaviors were typical of someone shunned by society. Not a genius who was widely regarded among quirk theorists worldwide. Yes, I'll be in your care. Izuku smiled and took a seat. I believe we have several points to discuss, Nezu spoke up, but we should start with yours, Murai, since ours isn't urgent even though it is important. Oh um um Nezu can. Oh of course Izuku. Yes, this should only take a short while and is probably my favorite part of introducing you to heroes. Now Murai heard the schadenfreude in Nezu's voice, but what did that have to do with what Izuku wanted? See um um, Murai, I have some basic questions about your quirk, and maybe some ideas. He handed over a notebook. Murai chuckled softly as he took the notebook. Well my quirk is a well-kept secret, it's actually touch-activated future visio future vision that you can use once per day, yeah. Nezu cackled in his seat, but when he turned to the rat with a question in his eyes, Nezu shook his head slightly. No one told him, and Izuku figured it out. How did you figure out the once-a-day part, and the touch part, and the future sight part? Well, your main style of combat is medium-close range, even though you almost always use martial arts to deflect and defend and your accuracy implies you can keep your effectiveness up at a much higher distance, so you clearly need to be able to touch your adversaries. Other than that, after 86% of the times you deflected or defended with your hand against an opponent, you both stopped getting hit and aimed your projectiles in advance. This was also the primary clue to the activation limit. If we look only at the first instance of you touching someone, then the combat improvement rises to 95%. And for all instances after that, which are significantly fewer, any improvement ceases to be statistically significant. Hand, this is the one I'm least sure about but still, you are 38% less likely to engage in close combat against enemies towards evenings. I also think you need eye contact, which is why you stay highly mobile in a circular movement pattern. Mirai looked at the notebook in his hands, the glee radiating off of Nezu was palpable. Mirai could only think of one reason why, if Izuku already knew that much about his quirk, foresight, what questions did he have? He opened the notebook on a spread dedicated to him. Sketches and diagrams of him in various combat poses, suggestions and questions about support gear. And on the next page, a much more in-depth deduction about his quirk, how it integrated with his fighting style. The questions were more like a battery of tests to run, with hypotheses regarding the results. Most of them were already things that Murai tried, like predicting a coin flip or trying to forcefully change a prediction, but when put together they were meant to test a much more detailed hypothesis regarding his quirk. Mirai always tested one thing. Could he change a future that he saw? The answer was no, but if he understood what Izuku was asking correctly, he may have been completely mistaken, completely, about everything. Mirai's hands were shaking. It would take weeks to run these tests, but the logic was flawless. If this were true, then Mirai's quirk wasn't foresight. It was probability manipulation. Izuku was getting nervous. What if Murai didn't like his analysis? What if he thought it was creepy or dumb? He must have already thought of all of these things. Why did he think? No. Izuku shushed the internal voice, like he talked about with Nezu and Hound Dog. Let me rephrase what you told me, to make sure that I understood what you wanted to say without assumptions on my part. Okay. Hound Dog sat on a couch in front of him, in his cozy office. Nezu had thought that maybe counseling or therapy could be good, and that if it were up to him it would be mandatory for heroes. Yeah, as sure. Hound Dog leaned forward, with his elbows on his knees. You don't always understand human behavior patterns, and your quirk is completely blind to patterns that involve you in some way. Oh not exactly, no. Um um, let me see if I can explain. There's no such thing, for my quirk, as a human behavior pattern um um or any type of pattern. Well, there are patterns in the physical world and non-physical, but um um okay, so it's like this. Izuku collected himself and breathed in deeply. A pattern that I could see is for example how often you smile in reaction to certain stimuli, as well as the degree of curvature and tensing of other facial muscles are involved in each smile. So I can know if you smile in manner x 70% of the time when meeting person A, and smile y 90% of the time when meeting person B that alone doesn't tell me what each smile means. If I look into it more, then maybe person A is a neighbor whom you see most mornings, and person B is your boss. Additionally, I can look at what I call pattern fractals, what behavior patterns come before or after that specific pattern. 
Are you grumpy in the mornings? Do you seem more tense after seeing your boss? Looking across the room to Hound Dog's couch, the hero looked to be deep in thought. Right, so I don't know anything about those smiles. I only recognize the pattern. I have to learn and infer from other patterns what that means. After that I can tell with a high level of certainty that smile Y is your fake smile, associated with certain muscle contours and certain manners, and smile X is a genuine smile, associated with other contours and features. Hound Dog wrote something down on a notepad, and then gestured for Izuku to continue, and all patterns are like that, for me I mean. I can recognize that Vlad King's blood whips make a sine wave that correlates to the amount of solidified blood he has, but I don't understand what that means without looking deeper and more. I can recognize the dimensions and patterns in which a wall is cracked, but without also comparing it to patterns of strengthening and ballistic quirks, I won't know what caused it. And without being aware of the information regarding the area the damaged building is in, including country, prefecture, neighborhood, heroes on patrol and their patterns. And more, I won't be able to tell you anything beyond the degrees between each pair of cracks. So, I'll try to rephrase again if you please. Your quirk doesn't give you an understanding of patterns, but only a perfect recognition of them. That means you need to know what other patterns to look at in order to glean actual information from those patterns. Yes, wow you're really good hound dog. Finally a really good way to explain his quirk. Ah, uh, and human interactions and behaviors are hard to understand even for me. So no wonder it outwardly looks like you sometimes don't get them as well as others. Then Hound Dog leaned back and smiled widely. That makes my next point easier to come across, Izuku. You don't recognize patterns involving you, so you panic and assume the worst. But you don't need your quirk to recognize patterns, it only helps, right? Izuku nodded hesitantly. He wasn't sure where this was headed. And you definitely don't need your quirk to learn something from a pattern. You just said so yourself. Again, Izuku nodded his head. Well, if I were to show you hypothetical medical results, in which one value was lower than others, something visible to the eye, no need for a fine-tuned understanding, and asked you to point out the outlier, you could do that even if the results were yours, right? A third slow nod. And if those results showed a vitamin D deficiency, what would that mean? It would mean I probably don't go outside too often, since if it were pathological there would be additional information in the test results. Izuku answered immediately. Hound dog clapped, exactly. If you ever find yourself panicking and thinking the worst, try to tell yourself what patterns you can see without your quirk, and what you can learn from them. Your quirk only shows you what patterns to look at. It's your brilliant mind that knows what to make of them. As he looked at Murai staring at his notebook, he forcefully bit the inside of his cheek. Two patterns. First, whenever I don't recognize a pattern regarding myself, I assume a bad scenario even though it never pans out. From this pattern I deduce that it is an involuntary anxiety-driven response that most of the time does not correlate to reality. Second, almost every time I show a hero my notes and questions about them, they end up very thankful and learn from it. Even when not, no one has been mad or complained. From this pattern I deduce that I should wait for Murai's reaction before deciding how he thinks. Izuku. Nezu's voice jolted Izuku out of his calming techniques. Are you okay? Oh ha ha yeah. Sorry Izuku scratched the back of his head shyly, looking toward Murai to see what he thought. Murai handed him back the notebook with a stony face. Izuku, truly what you propose is remarkable. The supplementary data regarding similar known quirks is a solid basis for your hypothesis. And the battery of tests you drew out is certainly something I will prioritize after this case. I, I can't really explain how much this means to me. Believing that what I see is unalterable set in stone was horrible. But if it's the opposite, if what I see is unalterable because that is how I saw it, and there is a way to change things by seeing them again and shifting the probabilities. Nezu was shocked by his friend. He never talked about Sir Night Eye with Izuku before that. But if he had known that Izuku was sitting on this hypothesis for nearly a year, he would have done everything he could to bring the two together sooner. On the bright side, this should make the whole successor of All Might issue easier to handle. Murai wiped a tear, and Nezu could understand why. I want you to have her Izuku. You are far worthier than me. I gave up in the face of my quirk while you kept asking questions. You are the only one who could keep her safe. Izuku's jaw dropped. Murai, are you sure? I can only imagine what she must mean to you. Murai scrunched up his face and nodded. They had only met today. Who were they talking about? It couldn't actually be Bubble Girl, right? Could you enlighten me as to who you are talking about? Both of the green-haired All Might fanatics turned to him and looked at him with a very specific gaze. It was the gaze he wore when he encountered a bureaucrat that was exactly the right combination of smug and ignorant, with a dash of not being able to read the room. Nezu suddenly understood why so many people were scared of saying something dumb next to him. Murai held Izuku's hands. I'm sure Izuku, she deserves the best, and I know that you are a much better man for her than me. The boy nodded. Nezu was genuinely baffled. Murai took a small safe out from under his desk. 
got up and went to one of his locked cabinets. He put his fingers on a print scanner and let a sensor scan his eye. Oh, Nezu thought, of course. With a shaking hand, he opened the velvet-lined lock box. I shouldn't have even been surprised. He slowly lifted a silk cloth and gently wrapped it around it and put it into the safe. It, not her. Nezu sighed. At least Izuku looked happy with his new Galmite figurine. Okay, so what case do you want help with? Izuku asked, much happier than he expected to be. It's a quirk-enhancing drug operation. I think it's linked to the Yakuza, but I'm probably missing something. We've only apprehended small dealers, and they don't know enough to lead the investigation anywhere. I hope that between your and Nezu's intelligence quirks we... Ah, oh, um I don't have an intelligence quirk I didn't mean to lead you on. Izuku interrupted hesitantly. Mirai looked gobsmacked, but you always notice the tiniest things and he gestured at where Izuku held the notebook on his lap. Izuku scratched his head. Yeah, my quirk allows me to recognize patterns, but not understand them. So I can see the pattern of when you touch people more and when less, and the distances from which you fight most. But then it's kind of up to me to make sense of it all. Clapping his hands, Murai looked impressed that just means you are far smarter than I originally gave you credit for, and I already thought highly of you. Izuku glanced at Nezu and saw the principal gerbil give a small nod. Bracing himself, Izuku continued, That's actually not all of it um um, more of my quirk manifested this year, until last year I thought it was only recognizing patterns, but there's two more parts to it. Mirai looked interested, Oh, is this what you based your quirk inheritance paradigm on? He shook his head no. I published the preliminary version of a QIP around six months before I fully understood my quirk, since both my parents are emitters, and I was researching to try and find out what the other parts of my own quirk were. It's called Denmaku. It allows me to telekinetically shoot small objects in patterns. The patterns change depending on what the objects are. Nezu cleared his throat and gestured for Izuku to continue. And well I actually unlocked that part of my quirk training for a different part of my quirk um, um Izuku shut his eyes tight and breathed an inherited one for all from all might and it made Mikrakevel Vemor. Izuku was sitting in front of him with his eyes closed, as if he were waiting for judgment. If it was Murai from two hours ago sitting there, he would have received judgment and not a lenient one. But now Murai already knew him. No, that wasn't accurate. Murai had known Izuku for years, but now he finally knew how extraordinary Izuku was. He sighed slowly. If I had a hat, I would eat it right now. Izuku opened his eyes to see Murai's ponderous expression. I spent the last ten months believing that no one would be a better candidate to inherit that quirk than one of my interns. But now I can't disagree with All Might's choice at all. But don't you think it should have gone to someone with a complimentary quirk? One that could benefit most from the power and fusion? Izuku still looked like he didn't believe himself worthy. Murai chuckled lightly but amicably. Izuku, we've been colleagues online for almost ten years. I'm not sure if you realize how you are perceived there. Those forums aren't hobbyists or theorycrafters. You have legitimately been helping heroes solve crimes and improving their quirks for years. You remember around five years ago I sent you a quirk profile. Izuku tilted his head for a second, and then his eyes widened bubble girl. But she must have been sixteen back. Exactly. I received an intern with an interesting quirk that she wanted to use for heroics, but without a lot of ideas how. I asked you for help, and five years later that girl is a sidekick in my agency. She still asks about you sometimes. Humor I suddenly burst out laughing you probably don't know how many scientific articles cite you. Everyone thinks that you post all of your work online for free because of some ideology, but you actually just don't understand how influential you are Izuku. Nezu joined in the laughter. You're right Murai. I can't believe we haven't ever talked about it Izuku. Nezu wiped a tear away from his eye. With the training and preparations for OFA, and your quirk in the school year and preparing for All Might's retirement, it slipped my mind. You should consider publishing in a journal, if only to get a sense of proportion as to your effect on modern quirk theory. Murai tilted his head preparing for All Might's retirement. Nezu and Izuku exchanged a look. Yes, in actuality, it wasn't All Might that recruited Izuku, more like the other way around. You see, All Might brought Izuku to my office, wanting to introduce me to a young boy who had, all by himself, figured out that All Might was running out of time. His eyes widened at Nezu's words. Yes, he realized that All Might was heading toward retirement, and even without knowing that OFA was inheritable, made a long and elaborate plan of action to prepare the world of heroics for the end of All Might's career. Imagine my surprise when that very same boy pointed at the printed manuscript of a QIP on my desk, which I had printed to read and review at my leisure. Izuku groaned in embarrassment and covered his face with his hands when Nezu continued his story, and said please don't judge me on that. I'm sure it'll be better after my friend May's builder goes over it. Kaku Hondai has been in the employ of the Night Eye Agency for almost five years. He's has seen his boss meet everyone from fellow heroes to government officials. 
brand sponsors and terminally ill children, contest winners and villains in reform programs. All those meetings were in one of the multiple meeting rooms in the agency, never in his own personal office, never mixing business with personal life. The meetings were all short and to the point, give the kids a tour and answer their questions, decline the brand deal if the brand was harmful and didn't donate enough to charities, assist the heroes with their case, a simple in and out, even when Nezu was the one to visit. That wasn't the only weird thing though, since he was promoted to Sir Nidai's secretary. Honda liked to think that he knew what sort of man his boss was. Sasaki Murai was a stern man, but fair. He had an odd, subdued, sense of humor. Sure, his boss liked to laugh, and everyone had a joke book stashed away for a rainy day, but it was always a chuckle or a nasal exhale. So what was different about this meeting? Hondai knew to mind his own business, but who the hell did Nezu bring with him? For the last four and a half hours Hondai could hear three voices laughing loudly and heartily behind closed doors. You don't understand Mirio. This man can change your life. Despite himself, Tagata Mirio couldn't help but be excited. For the last two years, ever since he started interning at the Night Eye Agency, his senior, Bubble Girl, would mention him. This mysterious analyst who helped her when she was a young intern like him, and totally changed her life. She didn't mention him often, but whenever she did a good job, or made a difficult capture, she would say that it was thanks to him and then start blushing so hard her blue skin would turn purple. The two of them couldn't have looked more different, standing outside of the Night Eye Agency. He was tall and muscular with blonde hair and a face that was somehow expressive even though the features on it were reduced to the most basic of caricatures. She was short and slender, her face a mask of sternness that almost didn't give away her excitement. Guess I'm in luck then bubble girl. I can't believe he just happens to be here. Think he'll help us on a case. He made sure to smile at his blue-haired senior, trying to convey that he shared her enthusiasm. Or maybe sir called him to help you. You know, you've got a handle on your quirk, but you never know this guy, the way he. Mirio interrupted her with good-natured exasperation. Yeah I know, he can change my life, jeez. Sir told me to wait at the entrance after school, so they should be here soon. Not a minute after he said that, the agency doors opened and Sir walked toward them, followed by a green-haired kid in the UA. School uniform. They seemed to be chatting about something quite animatedly. And then Sir gestured toward him and bubble girl. Well, time to break the ice. Myro thought good afternoon sir, and hello. I'm Tagata Mirio, hero name, Lemillion, since I want to save a million people. The boy's eyes were shining in excitement. Maybe he was a hero fan who won one of those contests. While wow, Lemillion I've heard so much about you. I've also seen the recording of you in the sports festival. Your use of a really difficult quirk is amazing. Do you mind signing my notebook? Mirio was shocked. He had a fan, someone who wanted his signature. Right as Mirio took the notebook he noticed Sir smiling. The kind of smile he had when there was some funny joke that he knew and you didn't and he knew that you didn't. As Mirio opened the notebook, he heard Bubble Girl ask by the way sir, isn't Mr. Lotus coming today? As for what sir answered, Mirio couldn't tell. He was way too busy reading through the most detailed analysis of himself he had ever seen. Suggestions and questions that were enlightening as they were scary, permeating something solid into his own body and then shooting it out. How does his quirk interact with gases? If light passes through him, why is he still visible when intangible? Why can he sometimes permeate his clothes? The kid thought that those last two were the most important, since until he could clearly answer them, he didn't actually understand his quirk. He looked up and saw Bubble Girl looking pale, with tears in her eyes. The kid was blushing, but he still held out his hand towards Sir Nighteye. I told you she wouldn't believe you, you had to take the bet. Sir Nighteye was laughing, but Mirio could tell he was also slightly angry. He reached into his breast pocket and took out a rigid plastic placard. No, a card and a plastic protector, here you go Izuku. I can't believe that the only one you're missing is the ultra-rare crossover alternate art number 42 of All Might wearing Endeavor's costume. Well, Endeavor threatened to sue, there was only a single printing, and I was sick the day before release so my mom wouldn't let me camp outside the store Mirio was trying to keep up. Excuse me Midoriya Izuku. Nice to meet you. Midoriya bowed. Right, Midoriya-san, did you write these notes? Could you help me test them out? Midoriya smiled shyly. Why yeah, I hope you like it. I think your quirk is really interesting and Murai told me we could chat while we were on our way to check out some details on a case. Wait, he called Sir by his given name. And didn't Sir also call him Izuku? W wait, Midoriya-san, are you by any chance the quirk analyst Mr. Lotus? No way. No way. Oh yeah, Green Lotus is my online handle. Because and he answered while pointing to his hair and eyes respectively. But he looked at Bubble Girl, who was on the verge of tears. You're 15. Oh, yeah I guess I am. But Bubble Girl she pointed between him and Bubble Girl, who looked increasingly distressed. Midoriya only blushed, which made Mirio regret not listening in on what exactly was said between the three. They took an agency car to a suspect site. Izuku was sure that this was the most likely to yield further clues, 
but he would have to see it in person. If not, then there were a few other locations to check out. Mirai had explained that they were tracking down the base of a trigger distributor, likely Yakuza. Honestly, Izuku was pretty nervous. Trigger was a really dangerous drug, boosting someone's quirk but also whittling away at their mind. The three heroes were in suits, while Izuku was wearing a face mask just in case there would be people who could notice his presence, though it was agreed he would split off from them and scope the area alone as a civilian. That was only part of the plan. The heroes had to make sure not to arouse suspicion either, so it was framed as a teaching excursion for an intern, which Lemillion was. That cover was helped by Nezu's presence. Silently, Izuku suspected things would go wrong, and he suspected that Nezu suspected that he suspected things could go wrong. He didn't say anything to Murai, but the truth was that the location was more than a little likely under observation. But Izuku knew that he needed his own eyes on the ground. He could identify patterns through images and videos, but he couldn't know if there were patterns he missed, since one can't detect an absence in those cases. Still, Nezu said nothing, silently riding on Murai's shoulder until they reached his destination. They both looked at him with concern, they cared about him, he realized. Be careful Izuku, we'll meet up in 30 minutes at the agreed upon point. Izuku nodded to Nezu and exited the car. It was a scant 14 seconds later that things did, in fact, go wrong. Mirai was worried about Izuku. After getting over his shock, he realized that the boy was his friend of many years. Their inside jokes from forums and chat rooms transitioned fluently to jokes around the table. He didn't realize the immensity of the intimacy of sitting face to face with friends until he had it. After Izuku left to his designated patrol area, they remained in silence. I know Murai, it takes you by surprise, doesn't it? Murai let out a chuckle at Nezu's words, until they heard their comms flare. Stop, give her back. Izuku's voice, panicked. A muffled reply came from whoever Izuku was talking to, and the three heroes and heroic student charged out of the car. As they ran, they saw Izuku confronting a tall hooded man with a plague mask, with a small man in a completely black suit, also with a plague mask, riding his shoulder. The man had some arrow-shaped appendage, retracting from Izuku back under his hood. Some paralyzing quirk. Izuku wasn't moving. Then Murai heard a whimper. The tall one was holding a little girl. She was also paralyzed, but tears still spilled out of her terrified eyes. She was dressed in rags, her white hair dirty and matted. Then the villains noticed them and cursed. Fuck, fuck. Heroes, we need to get the hell out of here. The small one shouted in a surprisingly deep voice. The tall one handed him the girl. Take her to the young master, I'll delay them. He turned to the heroes, you shouldn't have come, but now that you're here, I, Kronostasis, will make sure you stay. Jigigaviri be back. Izuku stuttered through his paralysis, surprising the tall one. Before he could respond, several things happened at once. Green lightning enveloped Izuku, and an empty translucent bar appeared below his feet as he rose to the air. Above the villain's heads, red halos with a notch on them appeared, in the same translucence that was under Izuku. Finally, the same green lightning enveloping Izuku seemed to flutter around the two villains as well. The villain didn't seem to understand what was happening, but the short one yelled at him it's like Trigger. I'm stronger now. Suddenly the small black suit deflated, and a giant muscular man with spiky hair emerged from it. He sunk partially into the ground of the alleyway, still holding the child, and suddenly the ground moved. Izuku, meanwhile, wasn't idle, nor were the rest of the heroes. Nezu leapt from Sir Ninai to Lemillion. Lemillion, bubble girl, evacuate civilians and cordon off the perimeter, then call for backup. Luckily those two were behind, still at the entrance to the alley, so they could turn away quickly. Even luckier, they were both trained well, and immediately followed Nezu's orders. The alley expanded, becoming wider and longer. Along it several large trapdoors formed, and from the closest one several Yakuza emerged and looked around, trying to figure out what was going on. Sir Ninai drew his weighted seals, and threw them toward the villain, who introduced himself as Kronostasis. They really should have come up with a name for Izuku. He thought as he yelled for his friend to retreat, Lotus, retreat, let the pros handle it. The boy was instead flitting around and shooting black energy bullets that were enveloped in a pink glow. As they hit the villain they did some damage, but less than Sir Ninai would expect. Instead, the red halo above him started to empty out, turning gradually grey, as the grey bar beneath Izuku was filling up, becoming gradually red. The villain shot out pale hair arrows. That extended several meters ahead of him and then retracted back. Izuku was deftly avoiding them, and as Sir Nidai joined the fray dodging became easier, since Kronostasis had to split his attention between them. Hi you fools, I don't know what you did, but I have more arrows than ever, and without the drawbacks of trigger. The villain laughed, but was still fairly calm. One of the arrows hit Izuku, and he suddenly slowed down. TCH, you're supposed to freeze completely. 
The villain growled. Still, it's worth the trade-off. Sir Nidai jumped ahead of Izuku, taking the brunt of the attacks until the slowing effect wore off. At least Izuku could still shoot energy bullets. Nidai, his arrows can only change direction once, and only in an obtuse angle. Any arrow that has passed you can't hit you, and any arrow that changed direction can be safely dodged. He's limited to nine at a time. He would make a great hero, still analyzing and helping, not panicking at all as he was fighting his first villain. He'll also change when the red halo around him reaches the notch. I don't know how, but he'll get stronger and his attack patterns will change. My quirk made him stronger but also less flexible. It forces him into a pattern. Izuku spoke in a low voice, making sure the villain wouldn't hear. Sir Nidai nodded, and Izuku suddenly returned to his normal speed. The slowing effect is for 9 seconds. He yelled as he split off from Sir Nidai to divert Chronostasi's attention. Shit Chrono something is wrong. I can't merge all the way, and I can connect the base to the ground. The half-sunk villain who had the girl yelled, distracting Chronostasis further. Take the girl and escape. The young master will realize something is going on and come. Then it's our win. Don't stay and fight just because you're pissed off Mimic. Chrono yelled back. But the moment he turned his head was the moment a hyper-density seal struck him in the sternum, bringing the red halo around him below the notch. The villain started glowing, and then his hair shot out, multiple arrows of it extending in all directions. It tore away his hood and his mask, revealing a pale man with dark, sunken eyes. He looked surprised for only a moment, and then he grinned evilly, looks like this is it for you. His hair started whirling rapidly behind him, like a many-handed clock, and the glow of the lightning around him became increasingly brighter. A beam of energy shot out, and to Sir Nidai's horror, it was headed straight to Izuku. Nidai leapt and shoved Izuku out of the way, taking the brunt of the beam. Huh, he thought, no physical damage. When he tried moving though he understood, he was completely frozen for an indeterminate amount of time. From his place, he saw Izuku fly around and shoot energy bullets at the villain, his red halo still decreasing. But the amount of arrows he could control was greater than nine now, and their flexibility seemed to increase as well, each making multiple turns. Izuku was having a hard time dodging and aiming, but then he faltered and his eyes widened. He flew straight up and focused everything on dodging, but still released bullets. Only, these bullets were glowing purple, and they seemed to hone in on the villain no matter where Izuku was shooting them from. Chronostasis was so surprised that he let too many bullets past his guard, and when the halo around him emptied, he simply fainted. Izuku landed in front of Sir Nidai, and his eyes were burning with determination. Sir Nidai tried to say something, and found that though he was frozen, he could still speak, wait for the pros, Lotus, don't do any. I promised her, Nidai, I have to do it. He helped move Murai to a more comfortable position, and then Murai, in his panic, lost control. He activated his quirk by mistake. The last time he did it was with All Might, and the results this time were as gruesome as the last. He saw Izuku reaching the girl, but right as he reached out to remove her from some Yakuza person's arms, a spear of earth impaled him. Izuku would die. Please, don't, I saw. Izuku turned away. What kind of hero would I be if I didn't? And before Murai could utter a word, Izuku flew off. Luckily he had heard Nana's voice in his head, telling him to connect with Float while shooting. He wasn't sure how she knew, but somehow it changed his bullets into homing bullets. Sure, they shot out slower and less in number, and if he wasn't mistaken they didn't do as much damage, but they caught Chronostasis off guard. And now that Izuku had to fly through groups of thugs, they were perfect for knocking them out without focusing on them too hard. He could see Mimic ahead of him, still half merged with the ground and holding a frightened and shivering Eri in his arms. He had taken some damage, as signified by the grayed out part of the halo around him, but only an insignificant amount. The alley around them kept morphing, at this point resembling a large street, except the ground was grey and cracked concrete, and the buildings surrounding it were close-knit and lacked doors. Well, except for the trap doors on the ground, Izuku could hear a news helicopter above him, and hoped that meant backup would come soon. As Mimic passed a particularly large trapdoor, two Yakuza emerged that looked to be different than the thugs around them. The moment Izuku realized that, red halos appeared above them as well. One of them was enormous and muscular, with giant steel gauntlets on his arms. The second was thin, and had a black cloak on, as well as a wide-rimmed bowler hat. They both had the black plague masks that most of the Yakuza here wore. The halos around them were different than usual. Instead of one at the two-thirds point, the thin one with a hat had three notches sectioning his halo into four equal parts, the muscular one had one notch at the halfway point, and a second notch just a fraction above the end point of the halo. What did you do to us? The thin one yelled while drawing a gun and shooting at him. Izuku evaded easily, and focused for a moment to switch back to his stronger but more linear pink bullets. Izuku was planning on ignoring the question, but he felt some tingling of danger. My quirk empowers both my enemies and me, I don't know exactly why or how. The moment he answered the prickling instinct faded, 
and Izuku saw that one of the four sections of the man's halo suddenly flared and became grey, all the while he was firing his bullets at the bigger guy, who seemed like a close-range fighter and could only pick up debris to throw at him. Why are you attacking us? What's your goal and who do you work for? Who are you? The man became panicked at the sight of his comrade being bombarded, as well as his halo suddenly empty. Izuku thought that even if he didn't know what exactly that meant, he saw his ally's halo empty as he was hit by bullets and could probably make some deductions. Unfortunately for him, Izuku quickly made some deductions of his own. A mental quirk, probably triggered by questions. His first question was panicked, but now it looks like he has them planned out. Plus, it's unknown how his quirk was empowered, but he took damage when his question was answered. After coming to those conclusions, and feeling another hint of danger, Izuku answered the first three questions rapidly. I'm attacking you because I saw you kidnap a little girl. My goal is to save Eri, and I'm not working for anyone. With each answer another portion of the villain's halo emptied. And when Izuku answered the third question, the masked Yakuza promptly fainted, allowing Izuku to maintain his anonymity. The muscular Yakuza saw his ally fall, shit, shin, what the hell did you do to us? What is this fucking light show? Izuku smirked and didn't answer. The villain had no real long range options, and out in the open Izuku had a big advantage. That changed when the villain's halo reached the half point notch. Suddenly, he was enveloped by an orange barrier that soaked up all the bullets Izuku was firing. With each bullet that hit it, the halo replenished itself. To his dismay, he saw that the notch also reappeared. They both stopped and stared at each other. It's over for the shy Hasekai, isn't it brat? Even if we beat you there are probably heroes on the way. Izuku nodded. Yeah, you should give up and turn yourself in. Ha, huh? fat chance. I know a lost cause when I see it, but I also know that if you'll waste time on me then the girl will get away so, here's to never meeting again. The villain turned and started to walk away. Izuku was torn inside. The way the villain wasn't even running was a taunt by itself. Then he remembered the little girl's trembling voice when she told him her name and asked him to help her. Izuku kept flying forward, and spoke to his calm, Nezu, this is Lotus, I have a few unconscious villains and plenty of thugs, one of the villains is getting away. Large, muscular, around 2 meters, male, wearing a plague mask but may have removed it. My die is out of commission but safe. I'm heading further inside. They're trying to make an escape with Uri, the girl they kidnapped. Roger that Lotus. We have eyes on Night Eye, not the villain. Backup is on the way, but the terrain is weird. Rukyu is attempting aerial infiltration. I'm connecting you to the HeroCom network. Nezu answered swiftly and efficiently. And then Izuku heard some static from the comm in his ear. Eldings are too tight together. We need to use the front entrance. A female voice Izuku didn't recognize. Stand down Nejire Chan. I have eyes from above. I see Lotus flying ahead. But I'm too big to land between the roofs. Nezu, is Lotus on the comm? Rukyu herself was asking for him. Right? Hyperventilate later, savory now. Rukyu. This is Lotus, I'm on the comms and moving to apprehend the villains. One of them has a quirk that allows him to merge with the ground and manipulate the terrain. It should allow him to merge with any sort of object, but it's limited in flexibility somehow. Can you fly over with a rope and let heroes slide down? I think the alley is still stretching, so every moment we wait I get further away from the entrance. A moment of silence followed his question. I didn't a hum, yes. Nejire Chan, Bubble Girl, Rock Lock, meet me in front of the bank, Rock Lock get a rope on the way. Three voices echoed their ascent. Izuku rushed onward, not wanting to lose track of Eri. He could make out the spiky hair of the villain called Mimic, and even though he was faster, every time he had to stop and fight the villain would regain his lead. You're telling me that that kid is in your class? Until he asked her fellow recommended student, the tall girl with the spiky ponytail Yeirazu. That was her name. They were looking at shaky footage from civilian cell phones before other heroes evacuated them. They could see an alley from various different angles, all taken from windows at different heights, that was expanding and shifting in inexplicable ways. Within that alley a green-haired blur was flying, wearing a school uniform and a face mask. The kid was swerving and dodging bullets like mad, while shooting weird energy projectiles. All sorts of lights and circles and lines were floating around him and a villain he and Sir Night Eye fought, some dude with arrow hair. The camera cut away to scenes of the police cordoning off the area with the help of heroes. Yeirazu looked a bit conflicted. Yeah, he's in our class, but he's also the top. He was supposed to be at your class heroics class today, but Nezu called him out for something urgent. That certainly seems urgent. And Telly thought as she stared at the screen projecting the news. All Might was supposed to be teaching them heroics, but he got some urgent notification, and next thing they knew the teachers all gathered them together, dismissed the non-heroics classes, and pulled up the news. Hey, that's Muriel. And Nejire. A third-year girl shouted. 
As the screen flashed to show a blonde hero with a smiley face like face redirecting civilians along with a hero with long periwinkle hair who was flying around and shooting energy spirals from her hands to propel herself. The reported on screen was blue-skinned and had long sleek lavender color hair. She spoke clearly into her microphone, even though she was on a noisy news helicopter. This is Chitos Kazuki from Shueisha News, live from the scene of an active hero operation. With me is pro hero and principal of UA. High school, Nezu. The older hero students were obviously shocked, if the mutters of holy crap, and no way, were any indicator. When one of them saw Intelli shooting a curious glance they explained, Nezu almost never takes an active part in a field mission. Even when he's on break from managing the school, he's more on the planning and analysis side of heroics. Good afternoon Nezu. What can you tell us about this operation, and the lone hero who is combating those villains alone? His face twitched, almost imperceptibly, but Intelli wasn't a regular girl. She had studied extensively on rodents, in an attempt to answer Nezu's famous question. She didn't know the answer, but she could definitely see his agitation at the leading question. Good afternoon Chido-san. I want to clarify something. This was not meant to be an operation on any scale. Rather, this was meant to be an internship learning event. However, the criminal group known as the Shai Heisekai decided to launch an all-out attack, catching our students and us unaware, and capturing a child as a hostage. I assure you that were this planned, civilian evacuation would have been organized prior to the engagement. The camera zoomed in on the class 1 a student, fighting a villain who grew and shot out crystals, and one who created energy barriers to limit the green-haired kid's maneuverability. Intelli heard several of his classmates yell out and worry every time he barely dodged a sharp shard of crystal or slammed into a barrier by mistake. The camera returned its focus to Chitos, with Midoriya's battle in the background. I see, I'm sure that will put us all at ease, thank you. Is there anything you can share with us about the heroic student down there? His showing is quite impressive. Are those energy arcs around the villains part of his quirk? Witnesses report that heroes in the comm are referring to him as Lotus. That was a previously unknown name. Is he a new transfer to UA? I hope you will forgive me for not disclosing information on a student. I assure you though, that Lotus has been authorized to use his quirk and act according to his judgment until a pro hero can make their way to him and take over. Nezu's speech became clipped, and now it was obvious to anyone that he was dissatisfied with the reporter's line of questioning. Shidos just smiled at him and nodded. Of course not Nezu. I only wanted to let the grateful civilians to know who they should thank. I hope we'll see more of Lotus in this year's third year sports festival. One final question and then I promise I'll change the topic Chitos gave an overacted pout. That somehow was self-aware enough to be endearing rather than off-putting. Why is his hero named Lotus? Nezu peered down from the helicopter and grinned. I think you should zoom in and see for yourself. The camera panned back to Midoriya. The translucent red bar under him started flashing red. And he flew a dozen meters away from the villains. Is he retreating? Chitos asked, for once seeming unsure, but still excited. Midoriya then turned back to them, and a giant lotus made of the black energy that his bullets were made of formed behind him. That's what Izuku used to destroy the Zero Pointer and save me. A class when a girl yelled. Some of her own classmates looked surprised, and as one they leaned forward to get a closer look. Intelli exchanged a look with Yeyurazu. Now they recognized the move, from the observation room of the practical exam. The lotus glowed pink and its petals detached and spun behind him, each the size of a fully grown human. The crystal shards that were flung toward him disintegrated before reaching him, and the barrier villain stacked multiple glowing energy barriers between them. The petals froze, and a giant beam of energy shot out from them to the two villains. The barrier shattered immediately, the beam moving so fast that it wasn't impeded in the slightest. When the beam ended, both villains were unconscious on the ground, the camera zooming in and catching their chests rising and falling. Until he heard Yeyarazu mutter next to her they would have loved to get a hero student killing villains on live video. The scandal would be immense. The focus returned to Chidos and Nezu. In the background Midoriya flew onward. Well I certainly see what you mean. That is one impressive quirk. Nezu chuckled. I assure you Chidos-san, his quirk is perhaps the least remarkable thing about Lotus, as any pro who has worked with him can attest to. Her interest caught. She probed further. Oh, has he worked with pros other than the staff at UA? Is that typical of many hero students? The principal's fur bristled. Are you asking about a heroic student's experience, habits, and training on live television? One that is in the midst of live combat. Right as Chidos was about to answer, she received some transmission to her earpiece. It looks like reinforcements are on the way. The camera rose and turned, and at the helicopter's height was the dragoon hero, Ryukyu, on a rope dangling from her claws. Three heroes were hanging, though Intelli couldn't recognize any of them. Third and second year students obviously could, since one of them gasped loudly, Nejire. What are they thinking? 
she should be taking care of civilians. Unsurprisingly, the hero on the screen didn't hear or respond. Instead, the three of them lowered themselves through the narrowing roofs to the alley. Using his lotus beam took less out of him than he expected, probably since he waited for a long while after his energy bar was full. That proved the hypothesis that the energy bar could overflow. He heard his from his earpiece that reinforcements were arriving, and turned to see three heroes descending from a rope. He recognized Rock Lock and Bubble Girl, but not the third woman. As they sprinted toward him, the alley's expansion sped up rapidly, and they couldn't get closer. Izuku was debating what to do, when a trapdoor near the three of them opened and a few villains climbed out to attack them. He came to a decision, this is Lotus. I'm going ahead by myself. I need to prioritize saving the hostage. Besides, if I go back to help, there's a chance that my quirk will enhance the villains. Without waiting for a response, Izuku dashed forward. He saw the spiky-haired villain mimic handing Yuri to a tall man in a black dress shirt and slacks, with a fur-collared bomber jacket, plague mask, and white surgical gloves. The man was standing alone at the end of the alley. Mimic escaped through some crack in the walls, but Izuku hardly noticed him. He couldn't tear his gaze away from how Ari was shaking like a leaf, looking in abject terror at the villain. So, you're the hero who's caused all this trouble. Try to take my daughter away, destroying my property and brutalizing my subordinates. I will give you one chance to leave. His voice was cold and measured, but Izuku could tell it was laced with fury. I'll never leave without Iri. You can give up and come with me. The courts will take that into account in your sentencing. I don't recognize you so you're not a wanted villain, right? Izuku was broadcasting everything from his calm, hoping that someone would be able to fill him in quickly. The man chuckled grimly, and the air around him became heavy with killing intent. Izuku's calm flared. That's Jisaki Kai, codenamed Overhaul, leader of the Yakuza group known as the Shai Hasekai. Regarded as highly dangerous, quirk unknown but has violent applications. Lotus be careful Sir Nidai, and me won't be able to forgive ourselves if one of our closest friends won't come back from this. Nezu's voice was laden with worry, and the fact that he said everything over the comms, for everyone to hear, was evidence enough that his emotions triumphed over his logic. The auburn-haired man slowly took off the glove on his right hand with his teeth, his left arm still holding Yuri. So be it he said, and placed his bare hand on the ground. Izuku dodged to the right. And as a spear of earth jutted out where he was standing, the familiar red halo appeared over Chisaki, with only the one standard notch two-thirds of the way down. Though Overhaul's mouth was covered, Izuku could tell he was frowning. Izuku dodged and swerved in the air, while crisscrossing gray spears emerged rapidly from the concrete and the walls enclosing them. Each spear lasts for nine seconds before it recedes into the ground. Each spear can only emerge within one meter of the previous spear. Each spear can point in an angle between 20 to 70 degrees, but must be within 15 degrees of the previous spear's angle. Unknown to Izuku, his mutters filled the comms, and since most of the other fighting dies down, the heroes all listened in. Back in Yue, the racer had made an executive decision, and broadcasted the comms to the heroic students. If there was ever a chance to show them why Midoriya was a Ta, it was now. Besides, it might make it easier to convince the upper years to let him analyze them, as well. He could see it working. The students all paled at the speed Midoriya was muttering, since those mutters had to be simultaneous with rapid evasion of extremely lethal spikes. Sure, he was using this as a moment to help Midoriya going forward, but there was no way in hell the kid wasn't about to serve detention for that stunt. The racer had felt a calming hand on his shoulder. It'll be okay show, the little listener is doing great, and I'm sure backup will arrive in no time. Contrary to what his husband said, there was no progress seen. Izuku was rapidly dodging, but the villain was also raising concrete barriers to block the bullets. Something needed to change and tip the scales, and the weird energy meter beneath Izuku still wasn't full. Right as Eraserhead thought that, the color around Izuku's energy bullets changed. Nine creations per second, but split between barriers and spikes. I need to find a way to bypass his barriers, but I'm barely keeping up the pace. This might become a battle of attrition, but I have more win conditions than him. I need to wait for backup, or charge my lotus beam again. And I also need not to slip up. Izuku let out a nerve-filled laugh, easy peasy lemon squeezy. Listen up Brad, I have a soft spot for kids like her, so I'm giving you more access to Fajin just this once. Focus on it like you did with Nana's float. Izuku heard the voice of the vestige, and listened by instinct. He focused on the feeling of letting energy charge and then release. He felt something click, and when he shot out bullets, this stood still, hovering in the air before him. Still, he kept releasing them and it looked like he was leaving a trail of floating black energy balls behind him. It felt like minutes, but in just a second after they were released, the black bullets started glowing in a dim red that grew in intensity. When the color reached the strength of the regular bullets' pink glow, and the float-style bullets' purple glow, they shot out toward overhaul lightning fast. 
Not only were these bullets faster, but they were also much stronger, and Izuku heard the barriers shattering. All right, energy bullets, Fajin style. Overhaul needs to remain in place and touch the ground to activate his quirk, so evasion is out of the question for him. This should be exactly what I need. Don't worry Iri, I swear I'll save you. Izuku kept talking, staying focused and hyping himself up. He started moving much more erratically, focusing more on dodging than attacking, since he released much less Fajin style bullets per second, and they would shoot out on their own after a delay. He saw the halo above overhaul empty in an increasing pace, and just hoped that when it would reach the notch that he would still have a handle on things. Just a few hits more before the notch, will it be an increase in speed, flexibility, or complexity? A combination. Think Izuku, you don't have enough samples of enhancing quirked individuals to make a guess. So plan for the worst, and increase in all. Shorten my dodging distance now so that my lotus beam will charge faster and be ready right after the notch. Izuku slowed down his firing and his dodges became hair thin. He did this gradually, so that the villain would think he was getting tired, but he grinned as his bar was almost full. Any second now yes, the bar glowed red and Izuku increased his rate of fire again, bringing over Hall's halo below the notch. As he did so, he realized he was wrong. The increase wasn't in any of those things, or even all of them. It was a form change. The ground rose up around Overhaul, and somehow melted into his body. His proportions grew and his shape changed, turning into a two-story tall monstrous humanoid. With six long arms and concrete bone plating merged into his flesh, he looked truly terrifying. Somehow though, Izuku didn't notice that at all. The only thing Izuku saw was Iri, falling from his arms to the ground. He heard yelling, and realized it was his own voice. A primal fear overtook him, and he shot at near teleportation speed to the falling child. He sighed in relief as she fell into his arms. It's okay Iri, I caught you, you're okay now. His green lightning jumped from him to the crying girl, releasing her from her paralysis. As his quirk enveloped her, he noticed a small horn on her forehead grow and curl in a spiral, like a drill. A white glow emanated from below him, around where his lotus beam meter was, but Izuku couldn't look at it right then. Iri's red eyes looked up at him with a mix of emotions from fear to relief to disbelief, but before he could say anything, she started shrieking. He wanted to calm her down, but when he opened his mouth, he could only let out a wet gargle as viscous red blood spilled out. Though, he thought, as he looked down, he saw a grey concrete spear impaling his chest. Sorry Nezu, Murai All Might, I let you down his voice grew weaker, Kiri Achako. Chidos was shocked. Her horror was mixed with elation, she got the best story imaginable. Live, she knew it was fucked up, but there was something inside her that cared more about exposing the darkest truths of the world than anything else. She calmed herself before she planned what to say, how distraught to look. She had a few seconds while the camera was focused on the former hero student. It would take the audience a bit to recover from that. New oo new o n o o o i z u k u n o o o. Midoriya and co felt her spirit leave her body. Her baby boy. Her Izuku. Her hero. The auditorium in UA. Was silent. They heard his final words, his plan. It would have succeeded if he hadn't sacrificed himself to save the girl. Hiroraka and Kirishima were weeping, but everyone looked deeply affected. They all jumped when someone roared behind them. All Might fell to his knees, crying loudly, stronger than the rest of the students together. They were shocked at seeing their hero like this. Izuku I'm sorry. I let you down. How could I ever not be proud of you? This you were a hero through and through. All Might grit his teeth as blood spilled out of his mouth. The torch I passed on to you, you told me to pass to everyone. I won't let you down again Izuku. The torch that you gave me. The future of heroics. I won't let you down. No one aside from the teachers knew exactly what he meant, but they realized there was probably a deeper relationship between Midoriya and All Might that they weren't aware of. Wait, look, Irashi yelled, below his feet. They all turned back to the screen. Below Izuku's still hovering form, three balls of white light were still glowing, and so was the red energy bar above those balls. Those aren't white balls, those are faces. A girl with goggles and pink dreadlocks from 1B pointed, they look like that girl he saved, right as they all realized that. One of the white balls shattered and Midoriya and Iri were enveloped by a multicolored prismatic light. Jeez Izuku, you wanna give a ghost a heart attack? Nana joked as she looked at Izuku. WH what? Am I dead? H how? He looked around, shocked. Bruce, the spiky-haired user of Fajin crouched next to him. I let you use Fajin and you didn't suck. Don't think you made a mistake. Every single one of us almost died protecting someone who needed protecting. Izuku perked up, looking around. He saw Nana and Bruce, as well as Yoichi and the bald fifth user who he didn't get introduced to yet. Another vestige was visible now though. A man with chin-length sharp white hair, and two scars running down the left side of his face. The new vestige patted his shoulder, don't worry kiddo, I think you'll be fine. Yoichi kept saying something about a one-up. 
Anyways, I'm Shinomori Hikage, my quirk is Danger Sense. You awakened it but haven't integrated it yet. But it lets us see a complete sphere around you, instead of through your eyes. Now look. Izuku tried, and found he could view his body in the third person. He saw that his quirk was still active, the energy bar full, the halo around overhaul still a little below the notch, and miniature caricatures of Eri's face below his feet. Before he could comprehend what he was looking at, one of the spheres broke and a white light flashed before his eyes. When the light receded, he was awake. In the real world scant seconds had passed. He idly noted that he could see in two perspectives now, through his own eyes and from a third-person view. Danger sense integrated he saw that Uri's horn shrunk. If before it twisted around itself three times, now there were only two twists. Three twists. Three little faces. All of that information rushed through his mind and he immediately acted. Don't worry Uri, I won't let something silly like that stop me from saving you. The crying girl looked up at him in shock, as he flew up and farther from overhaul, who noticed that Izuku somehow wasn't dead. Time to make Bruce proud. Lotus Beam, Fonjin style. The red energy bar emptied, and the giant black lotus spawned behind Izuku. This time though, instead of glowing pink, it glowed in Fonjin style red. Like the standard lotus beam, the nine petals split apart. Instead of spinning together though, each petal pulsed slowly and started growing into a new lotus. While this was happening Izuku put his all into dodging, staying ahead of Overhaul's attacks. When the nine petals finished blooming, each into its own lotus flower, the lotus beam shot out. Except, instead of one, it was nine beams, each almost as strong as the standard one. Overhaul was bombarded with beams, and the remainder of his halo flickered out in moments. When the beams ended and the dust cleared, Izuku stood panting and gasping, hugging the white-haired girl to close to him over the prone form of Chisaki Kai. Tamura, you have to calm down. In a dingy bar, a deep voice came from a screen with no video feed. The addressee of the voice, a young man with pale shaggy hair and cracked, dry, skin, has been throwing a tantrum for the hours since the news covered some hero attack on the Yakuza. The man, Shigaraki Tamura, turned to the screen with the best approximation of a pout his sallow face could make. But Sensei, can't you give me a quirk like his? Why does he get to give buffs and level ups to other people, and still shoot lasers? Well Tamura, if you bring him to me alive, I can certainly extract his quirk. Since he is a student at UA, you can attempt to glean information as you proceed with the plan. Just remember that you have a primary objective. Getting this boy will be a side quest of sorts. It won't have a time limit. In fact, it may be easier to complete after you finish your main objective, no. Tamura kept quiet as the voice crackled from the screen and smiled as it finished. Right before he answered, a man in a suit, made out of purple mist, entered the room with a shallow bow. I have received some news from Jurin. It seems that some of the villains in the altercation we've seen have escaped, including some that were powered up by the quirk used by Lotus. Don't say his name Kurajiri. Tamura interrupted the man in a fit of anger, resting his hand on a chair and letting his quirk disintegrate it. Before Tamura could continue the voice from the screen spoke again. Now now Tamura, don't you want to hear this out? Maybe you could recruit some higher level subordinates now. I recall you have been complaining about that for a while now. What do you mean let it lie? The blue-skinned reporter yelled into her phone. I mean what I said, curious. Her commander, Redistro, was on the other side of the phone. This hero has an immensely powerful meta ability that can augment other meta abilities. The last thing we would want to do is alienate him in any way, right? If you break this story, reveal his identity, or that of the child he liberated, do you think he would join us? Chitos bit her lips in frustration. She could smell an incredible story from miles away, but the commander was probably right she could always get the story after they recruited Lotus. Eventually, reluctantly, she answered, Yes sir, I'll try to find more details so we can locate him. She could hear her boss smile widely on the other side, perfect curious. You are, as always, amazing. I'll offer to send him free support gear from Detnarat, and for the girl as well. Try to find out if they had a prior relationship, will you? Izuku couldn't believe that it was only half an hour since Nejire, Ryukyu, and Bubble Girl caught up to him. He was lying on a hospital bed, with an IV, in his arm and recurled up on his chest. She hadn't spoken much, and was completely silent ever since the hospital staff came within needles. The moment she saw the doctor with the IV, she curled into him and refused to look up. Her shaking subsided when he wrapped an arm around her, and somehow he found that comforting the child came to him more naturally than he would have thought. He simply needed to hold her like he himself had wished to have been held. Murai and Nezu were sitting by them, talking about everything except what happened. They knew that there would be plenty of time for that. No, currently they were waiting for the storm to arrive. He already begged warned her to not raise her voice too much, not to scare her. But with what had happened, any yelling would probably be deserved. The door opened slowly. Murai tensed and the hackles on Nezu's neck raised. Iri shivered. All thoughts of levity shattered as Izuku saw his mother's reddened eyes. Not a red that came from anger, but from crying. 
She sat beside him and held the hand not wrapped around Iri. I was so scared Izuku. When you were hit I felt my world go dark her voice was wobbling. No matter how his heart ached, Izuku knew he had to choose his words very, very, carefully. He looked at Iri meaningfully, hoping his mother, hoping everyone would understand. I don't regret saving Iri, not one bit. If there was an easier way, I would have done it, as long as it meant that I would still save her today. There is nothing worth letting her go back with those horrible villains. Iri sniffled in his chest and cuddled in closer. Izuku, you her voice started rising a little, and Izuku immediately interjected. I won't apologize for doing every single thing I could. I'm still learning to be a hero, and I'll keep getting better. I'm sorry that I still wasn't wasn't good enough to do better, but I did my best, and I can't wait I won't wait for three years when someone needs my help. He squeezed Iri a little and heard her exhale a breath she was holding. What about other heroes? She asked, but her voice was less angry, weaker as if she was coming to terms with something. Mom, I was with a lot of pros, good ones, and they also didn't fail. They did a lot, and it wouldn't have ended as well as it did without them. Izuku was speaking faster now, starting to get a little angry himself. You call that ending well? Izuku yes. The spacious hospital room was shocked silent. The door, which was opened a crack by a doctor about to enter, was silently closed as that same doctor decided she was needed elsewhere. Yes, mom. It ended well. I saved Yuri and that was the number one goal. I'm training to be a hero. You knew that. I will never apologize for saving someone. And if I tried my very best, I also won't apologize for not being able to. I saved Yuri and most of the criminals were apprehended. There were no civilian casualties. I'm sorry. A muffled voice came from his chest. As soft and scared as when he first heard it in that alley only a couple of hours ago. She was sniffling, but Yuri still wouldn't raise her head. D don't fight with you mama please. I I she choked back a sob. I'll go away. So then, then you and your mama won't fight? Okay. Izuku held her closer, with both hands stroking her hair. He shot a glare at his mom, tears welling in his own eyes. He waited before saying anything. He didn't want to let her hear him cry. Before he marshaled his strength, his mom beat him to it. Oh baby no I didn't mean it like that. She reached out a hand to put on Uri's shoulder, but Uri flinched when she felt it. His mom winced, and Izuku could read the combination of hurt, guilt, and helplessness that made up her cocktail of tears. I know you didn't mom. Izuku sighed, then injected cheer into his voice. Don't worry Iri, me and my mom cry all the time. Nezu interjected, coming to help. He's right. You can ask Murai-sen here how he cried today when he gave Izuku a toy. Murai huffed as Nezu laughed. I'll have you know, Iri-chan, that it was not a toy. It was a limited edition redacted figurine with full joint articulation. There was silence in the room as the three adults chuckled. It's a very important distinction. Iri nodded rapidly, believing Murai if only because of his extremely serious intonation. His mom breathed out slowly all right. Then Izuku, I want to say thank you for coming back to me, and thank you for not doing anything that would make you live with regret. You're your own man already. But her voice broke and tears came out again but also you can always come eat dinner and come back to your room and ask me for help making dinner and I'll always be worried for you. She was laughing and crying at the same time. And Izuku joined her in both, of course mom. I love you and I'm still growing and you'll always be my mom. They both took a deep breath as if they were synchronized, and saw Iri peeking out between Izuku's arms. She looked at his mom, and before Iri could say anything she continued, And Iri thank you. The girl was so shocked she raised her head with her mouth gaping open. Thank you for helping Izuku. It was thanks to you and your quirk that my boy is okay now. If at first Iri was frozen in shock, Izuku felt how her muscles tense now in fear, instead. And no it's it's a curse my curse made my papa go away. She started squirming in his arms. And Izuku sat up so he could hold her firmly without hurting her. I don't want to make Izuku go away. I'm sorry I'm sorry. Izuku hugged her close, whispering to her that everything was okay and that it would be fine and not to worry. All the while the cogs in his mind were working overtime. What caused her to react like this? What exactly did her quirk do? And is the change he made permanent? He needed to help her calm down. And for now that just meant hugging her tight and assuring her that he wasn't going anywhere. It didn't take long for the already overwhelmed girl to tire herself out falling asleep and leaving the room in silence. Izuku knew that he may have rescued Iri from captivity, but there was still a lot to do before he could say that he truly saved her. And Ko was amazed at the change that came over her son. She knew he was training intensively. Ever since that day nearly a year ago, when she walked into Nezu's office and met All Might, their lives were turned upside down. She had learned exactly how incredible Izuku's online chats with his friends were, how much he understated and underestimated himself. She saw him forge genuine connections and friendships. Even if she saw Izuku less and less, she adored the radiant smile her son had plastered on his face, and his blazing eyes full of life, even more. Now, without noticing, when he talked about the girl he saved, when he held her, he had those same eyes, full of life and purpose. She just never connected that radiance to reality. He wanted to be a hero. 
And today she had a live demonstration of exactly how that would go. She expected to come in, yell, cry and hug him, ground him for a while and make him katsudan. She truly underestimated the changes in her son. And as much as Inko was loath to admit, those changes were mostly positive. She looked adoringly as her son absently stroked the child's hair and couldn't help a new sort of tears welling in her eyes. I'm so proud of you Izuku. So incredibly proud. The students of class 1A sat together silently. They had heard from Aizawa that Izuku was fine and would probably be back by tomorrow. Mina knew it was all up to her. She was the only one who could cheer everyone up. She would be the hero they needed, not the hero they deserved. Suo seems like some lucky girl was the last thing on Midori's mind she wiggled her eyebrows at Yuraka and heard Aiji groan from beside the now blushing girl. Ada stood and made a chopping motion with his hand. Ashido-san, that is highly inappropriate. Apologize to Yuraka-san and when he returns, to Midoriya-san as well. Nina pouted in an exaggerated manner, but she saw it was working. Kaminari was holding back a grin, Toru's shoulders were shaking in silent laughter, most of the other girls were blushing. Surprisingly, of all people Takoyami was the one who decided to join her side. I believe that I must humbly disagree with you, Ida-san. Although I dwell deep in the darkness, even I know that the strongest power of all is love, more than any quirk. Nina noticed Takoyami glance toward Yanagi who looked ponderous at what he said. HMMMM, something to keep track of. In the background Yuraka was sputtering ill love. No no, me and Izu Midoriya-san, no. Midoriya-sensei. We just friends. Right. Yes, poor girl, Mina thought, so out of touch with reality. She would definitely help Yuraka on her quest to bag Midori. But for now Mina found something much more interesting. Indeed, the completely black shadow jumper, Kirwaro, added, As one who dwells eternally in shadow, I know that the light of true and pure love shines brighter than even a thousand suns. Yuraka was steaming at that point, insisting that Izuku's pure love was only for heroics and katsudan. Alas, Takoyami immediately responded, Locking eyes with Kirwaro, it is a shame that such a powerful and exalted light would burn away even the vestige of a ghost of a memory of a shadow's ghost's vestige. As one who knows the purity of the darkest of nights, I also know that only in those pristine depths do light and dark become indistinguishable, and just as in the light, true and profound love between those ordained by fate can blossom. Nina felt a nudge, and saw Toru offer her a snack. She knew they were kindred souls. Kirwaro glared at their bird-headed classmate. Indeed those would be the foolish, tragically mistaken, wrong and foolish beliefs of one who only dwells in darkness. Such a hypothetical man, who must hardly be a man, perhaps no more than a boy, would be to blind to see that shadows are everywhere, an immutable facet of the very fabric of our darkly tragic and tragically dark reality. As one who resides in the liminal realms of shade, I know how light and dark coexist, just as two lovers must coexist to bring forth the inevitable. Ahem, the inevitable is children. Toru snorted out some of her chocolate and whispered to Mina I think if you look hard enough you can see him blush. And look at your Araka. she floated herself by accident and I think she fainted. Mina responded in kind. Yeah but look how they sneak glances at Yanagi, it's so precious. Suo, wanna bet on the outcome? A thousand yen on Takoyami. Iran, Kirwaro is ready for kids. No way he can beat that. Both girls jumped at they felt a tap on their shoulders. They looked back and saw Gyro's ear extensions, one tapping them and the other holding a note. Mina looked and saw Gyro sitting next to a slightly red-faced Yoya Yizo Momo. Ugh, Mina would have to talk to her about a nickname and fast. She didn't have enough brain to remember that. Toru meanwhile took the note and opened it. Put us down for a thruple, Gyro and Yeyurazu. She turned back to the girls and nodded emphatically. Did you hear his analysis? He was calculating the math and the degrees and everything in real time during the fight. And did you see how hot he was? Itsuka Kendo sighed at her classmate's antics. He was wearing a mask the whole time, Takage Sen. A green-haired girl gave Itsuka a mock glare. Yeah well, heroics makes people 58% hotter. Being super smart makes up the other 52%. Intelli was about to intervene but Itsuka stopped her with a raised hand. Don't bother, she's making those mistakes to rile you up. Hey, you can't know that. Maybe I'm as dumb as I am beautiful. Itsuka deadpan that would have been more believable if you hadn't passed the written recommended exam, which both Honnuki-san and Intelli-san mentioned was quite difficult. Takage detached her head and let it float around. PSHHH I don't understand the big deal. It was like playing a choose-your-own-adventure game from when we were kids. I literally seduced the villain and then went to sign autographs for the children. She brought a detached hand to sweep her hair back in an exaggerated gesture of arrogance. Why? I was even commended for great interpersonal skills and empathy for civilians. It only said that I lack information gathering skill and situational awareness. Intelli's eye twitched. Pray tell, Takage san, what happened that made you get such an evaluation? The detachable girl looked a little embarrassed. But Itsuka reckoned she was too deep into the bit to retreat. The villain got up and also had allies. 
and then killed me by surprise when I gave my number to a handsome reporter. Right as Itsuka was going to put a stop to that, another classmate interrupted. Well, I'll bet he's very ugly under that mask. Did you see those class 1 boys? Each is less attractive than the next. Us and 1B have suave individual charm. Besides, I'm sure that if I even manage to touch him, I'll be able to use his quirk much more efficiently, as would any of you. My dearest classmates, were you burdened with a quirk such as mine? The various conversations happening around the classroom died out, and everyone stared at Monomanito. Itsuka sighed once again. Katsuki felt empty. He saw Izuku do things he couldn't even imagine, heard his analyses, and as much as it shamed him, he admitted that with a good martial arts background, only his ability to analyze opponents in real time would probably get him into the hero course. And he had so much more than just analyze opponents in real time for a quirk. It was also insulting they knew each other way longer than that stupid nerd new round face and that ridiculously chiseled guy with spiky hair. Katsuki definitely didn't want to be one of that loser's final thoughts, but he damn well knew that he should be. What? Round face gives him a hug and suddenly he's all goo goo eyes for her. Fucking ridiculous. Maybe Katsuki should have let some girl date him in middle school. Not one of the hot ones, of course. That could have probably prevented him from losing his marbles over little miss floats over there. He finally couldn't take any more of their babbling and let out a couple of loud explosions enough. I know that stupid nerd better than any of you. No way he's interested in anyone. He hasn't spoken to a girl that wasn't his mom since kindergarten. Everyone stopped to look at him. For some reason Hot Ab's spiky hair was glaring at him, but he still had stuff to say. Well, where's round face? I'll let her down easy and let her know that Deku wouldn't know what to do with a girl. He looked around, but couldn't see her anywhere. He could swear he saw her floating by the door. Suddenly he heard the grumble of an upset stomach and a groan of discomfort above him. He looked up to see the floating girl, green-faced and with a hand over her mouth. That was the last thing he remembered before erasing the rest of the day from his memory. And while she was reciting the 100th story, she felt a soft kiss on her lips. She opened her eyes and saw that it was the princess who had woken up. Izuku lowered his voice as he saw her yawn. And then they talked all about their favorite books and lived happily ever after. Oh, and when they had kids, the princess made sure to tell them everything she knew about love. Hiri smiled at him before nodding off to sleep on his lap. The door slid open and Nezu entered with Mirai, as well as All Might in his skinny form. The three of them were smiling, but Izuku still felt a pang of guilt when he looked at their haggard faces. The moment everything goes back to normal, I will temporarily hand over the Night Eye Agency to Centipter. I know I couldn't have known earlier, but what happened today was proof that my quirk is probability manipulation, and if I had trained it beforehand Mirai looked down in shame. Izuku straightened up carefully and answered in a low voice, What are you talking about Mirai? We both know you couldn't have known, and next time will be better. Even I know that heroes can't always win. His eyes shifted over All Might for a brief second. Izuku is right, Murai. And since he has confirmation, I'm sure that there is already a quite detailed training plan to TSD and expand the limits of your quirk. Nezu gave Izuku a knowing glance, and when he saw the boy looking away sheepishly, he added, a plan that doesn't involve skirting the law on financially volatile quirks by visiting Las Vegas. Izuku faked a grumble, but really he was happy that they were all together. They came to sit near him silently as to not wake Iri up. Nezu looked at her with a sad gaze. Did you learn anything? He felt a distinct discomfort at the way Izuku's face darkened. Yeah they were using her for her quirk. And her blood. All might paled and Nezu felt anger welling within him. Her quirk can rewind matter. I'm not sure if it's organic only or not. And it used to be a stockpiling quirk, but it changed when it interacted with mine. It probably changed permanently, since her horn still looks different, but there's so much left to understand. Izuku noticed he was rambling about her quirk and refocused. Overhaul's quirk lets him rearrange matter he used it to extract biological materials. I don't know exactly what for, but I have a feeling it wasn't only for trigger production. They sat in silence, digesting everything the young girl went through. Well, that certainly complicates things as well as makes them simpler. Izuku looked askance at Nezu who quickly added we'll move you two to the school tonight. You may not know this, but you were on national TV. In your UA. Uniform. He felt bile rising in his throat. Nezu caught on to his discomfort. Yes, there are problems. Although they don't know your identity, surely the press won't give up so easily. Besides that, Iri was also caught on camera and is quite distinct in her appearance. However, there are possible solutions as well. Firstly, we will house you two in the school indefinitely. Second, we will make all heroic students sign NDAS. Third, we will release partial information to the press, edited snippets of the comm data. Whether you want to come forward and identify yourself or not is your choice, and we will support you in it. Hiri shifted in her sleep and clung onto his shirt. Izuku looked at her and grew more resolute. All right, we can handle it. I can handle it. I already have ideas for Hiri's quirk tests. We'll try them tomorrow morning. 
and I'm starting to get a hunch as to what kind of changes my quirk can make in others. They got up slowly, and as they left the hospital All Might suddenly jolted as if he remembered something. Oh right while you were fighting, Aizawa decided to let the hero students hear the comms. They learned a lot about mid-combat analysis, but also young Yuraka is a lucky girl. Izuku froze in place, trying to remember everything he said and was said to him. He snapped out of it when he felt Uri shifting in his arms. He didn't know who would take custody of her, but he found that he didn't really mind if she just stayed in his arms. Every time he looked at her, he remembered exactly why being a hero was so important, that saving people didn't end with numbers on a chart. He rescued her, but there was still so much she needed, and if he was to be her hero, he would make sure she got everything and more. Nezu was right. He usually was, but the margin of error this time was slim. Only a couple of hours after they returned to UA, the first press vans already started camping out, as if they were waiting for a midnight release. He wondered whether it would be worthwhile to dissuade them, or just give them something so they would leave. He would have to consult with Izuku, and probably Aizawa and Yagi. For now he would let the boy sleep with his new ward. He didn't tell that to Izuku of course, since he figured it would be funnier to wait and see when he would remember to ask. Early in the morning Nezu went to check up on Izuku and Iri and peek at the press outside. From the field behind the small safe house they stayed and he heard Izuku cheer and clap, and Iri crying. See Iri-chan, I told you it's not a curse. Your quirk is super cool and can save so many people. Nezu saw the girl trembling from an overwhelming mix of emoticons, holding onto Izuku's leg and looking at a potted plant. He felt the irresistible need to tease them, already helping her with her quirk Izuku. You could have at least fed her breakfast. Before Izuku could sputter out an explanation, Iri looked at Nezu angrily, and then fearfully, but still she managed to talk. No no umum Izu helped me umum fix it. Nezu quirked an eyebrow. Fix what? My curse. He made it into a super cool umum Izuku bent over to pick her up, and complete her sentence. As he made eye contact with Nezu, he mouthed silently nightmares. Nezu asked no more. Quirk. And it was already super cool Iri. I just changed how it worked a little. Wanna show Uncle Nezu? It took an inordinate amount of willpower not to purr when he heard Izuku call him Uncle Nezu, but he restrained himself. Purring is for lowly beasts like Aizawa and Yamada's cats, not a majestic gerbil such as himself. Dori hesitated, looked at him, at Izuku, then at him again, and nodded. Okay remember first we try the regular plant, right? She nodded, pointed her head at the potted plant, and a white energy beam shot out from her horn. The light subsided and nothing had changed. While Nezu was examining the plant he heard Izuku give Iri a high five with an exaggerated smile. Now what? Izuku prompted, and suddenly she looked much less sure of herself. And now we we break a branch. Izuku nodded and gestured toward Nezu. The gerbil proceeded to break a branch of the plant and back away. When Iri tilted her head and another white beam shot out. This time the change was clear. The potted plant had been restored. Nezu looked toward Iri and the clapping Izuku and noticed that one of the spirals of her horn had receded. Izuku saw him looking and explained she grew another spiral overnight, so she was back to three of them. Looks like the change is permanent, and also a really powerful healing quirk. Iri looked up at Izuku, not exactly smiling, but trying to. Very good. Nezu joined Izuku in the overenthusiastic clapping. Would you like to see if you can still help Izuku when he activates his power? Iri nodded, and so did Izuku. The green-haired hero let her down and activated his quirk. Green lightning surrounded him as he floated up, and from Iri's horn the same lightning emerged to surround her. Her horn grew back to the full three notches, while under Izuku's feet the red energy bar and three miniature Iri faces blinked into existence. Izuku swooped down to pick up Iri and fly with her for a little bit, before coming down to do some more tests. Entering the school was excruciatingly difficult, both because of the press and because of Ijiro's worry for his best friend. He was thankful that Aizawa-sensei had the good sense to make them allow the students through, but while they really wanted to get the scoop on Lotus, seems like all of their ideas for hero names wouldn't be needed, which was just as well since Lotus was way better than Pink Bullet, All Mightier, Mr. Pattern, and other ideas that Ijiro cringed even by thinking about. His grumbles were shared by students from all courses, but the heroics teachers made sure to emphasize that letting anything slip on the identity of Lotus was a one-way ticket to expulsion, even to other UA. Students. He stopped at the door to his classroom, where several of his classmates were also standing. Inside, Midoriya was holding the girl he saved, but more importantly, he was floating with the energy bar and little faces under him. He looked extremely embarrassed as everyone slowly entered while staring at him. I, I don't know how to turn it off. Izuku kept trying to talk to her, but there never seemed to be an opportune moment for the two of them to talk without some of their classmates around them. Being floaty and glowy surely didn't help. Everyone swarmed Izuku asking how he was feeling. 
what exactly the operation was. Can they hold Uri Chan? Does his quirk have a smarts part and can they learn it? Are you aware that you have two years of detention to serve? That last one had everyone scramble to their seats. Midoriya, why is your quirk active? Izuku stifled an exasperated sigh. I don't know how to turn it off sensei. He could hear the giggles from the students around him. Uri patted his shoulder comfortingly, despite not exactly knowing what the problem was. It was only months of honing his reflexes every day that allowed him to land on his feet, as he suddenly tumbled to the ground. Aizawa's hair was floating, so it was obvious what had helped him out this time. But he would definitely need to figure that out. As if mirroring his thoughts, Aizawa spoke you'll need to figure that out, pronto, especially if you don't want the press on your backs. He turned to the rest of the class, all right. We didn't get to it yesterday, but it's time to go over the avals for your first heroics class, then. The class shuddered at Aizawa's menacing tone. It'll be time to choose a class representative. As if the class were pre-programmed machines, all heads turned in Izuku's direction. Not Midoriya. He has ta duties and his own training to do. Speaking of training, you should all have your evaluations under your desks. Shota put up a very weak argument against Nezu, but succumbed to his pressure. Nimuri and Hizashi were on the rat side from the get-go, so it was a foregone conclusion. After going over the heroics class, he sent Izuku to Nezu's office with the girl and let the students argue amongst themselves. He looked at the clock. It was time. All right, lunch is coming up, so I'm cutting this discussion off here. We'll proceed during homeroom tomorrow, and if by then a decision isn't made I'll draw lots for the representative and vice representative. Todoroki, Kirishima, Yuraka, and Asui, come with me please. The kids looked confused and nervous. Well, Kirishima and Yuraka did. Asui was deadpan as usual, and Todoroki was well, that's one of the reasons he took him out. They followed him silently, toward the more administrative area of the school. His first stop was outside of Hound Dog's office. Todoroki, this is your stop. You will be going here twice a week, after homeroom. You won't be participating in heroics class until you get an okay from Hound Dog, and you will keep coming here until you are told otherwise. Todoroki for his part nodded his head and silently entered the counselor's office, but Aizawa still sensed a glare under there. All right, Kirishima, Yuraka, wait here please. Asui, come with me. He entered an empty classroom opposite of Hound Dog's room. After they entered the room, he could detect a hint of nerves emanating from the frog girl. Kiro, is something wrong sensei? She swallowed loudly. Aizawa sighed. You did nothing wrong, but what happened in heroics class was very wrong. That should never have happened to you, and I wanted to ask if you were okay. We were meant to have this conversation yesterday, but, Kiro, I understand sensei. Yesterday was difficult for everyone, and you and Midoriya appear quite close. He was taken aback by her frankness, but collected himself and continued. Yes, and if you feel the need to talk about that as well, then the school has resources to help you. The topic now, however, is the heroics class. Is there anything you feel the need to discuss, share, or request? Including if you feel uncomfortable sharing a class with Todoroki. He really hated talks like these, but Izuku had convinced him that Todoroki needed help, not discipline. He hoped Asui would be fine with not mixing up the classes, despite having every reason for wanting that. The girl looked pensive, and brought a finger to her chin in a gesture of thought. Hiro, I have to think about it, and I need more time. Does Todoroki feel bad about what happened? Crap, Aizawa thought. He hoped she wouldn't ask something like that. I cannot share anything I talked about with Todoroki in confidence, just like I won't share this conversation with anyone, relevant faculty, and staff excluded. If you want I can set up a supervised conversation for the two of you. Thank you sensei, Kiro, I'll give it all some more time and thought. He dismissed his student and rejoined Yuraka and Kirishima. Now for the hard part. Kirishima, you were here for obfuscation. You are dismissed. If anyone asks you, we went over some bureaucratic issues with your enrollment and there was a typo in your personal information. Uraraka come with me. He couldn't believe he was going along with this harebrained scheme. Achako was panicking. Was something wrong? Would they start taking tuition for the hero course and they were kicking her out since she wouldn't be able to afford it? Aizawa sensei looked at her and grimaced. That couldn't be a good sign. They reached Nezu's office, and a noise from the ceiling distracted her. Was that something glinting in the vents? All right, Yuraka. If anyone asks, we went over some bureaucratic issues with your enrollment, and there was a typo in your personal information. Anything else never happened. Am I clear? Yuraka paled and nodded without saying anything. Good, now enter. Izuku and Uri entered his office right as he was finalizing a press package to release. There were a few concrete details he had to go over with Izuku, then the plan could commence. Hello Izuku, Iri Kan, how are you? Iri still looked a little unsure of herself. H. Hi Uncle Nezu. Nezu beamed with his least threatening smile, which was much easier these days than it was ten months ago. There are a few things we need to go over today. First, a press release for you, Izuku. Second, a costume. 
or at least temporary costume, to obfuscate your identity. Third, I would like to give Uri a tour of the school, just the two of us. He winced as Uri started shaking at the idea. Don't worry Uri-chan, I'll take you through my super duper secret vents where nobody can see you and you can see everybody. I want to get to know you better as your uncle, okay? Izuku looked worriedly at his ward. He was really laying it on thick with the uncle thing. But Izuku still wasn't picking up on the hints. That was fine with Nezu though, as he intended to really go in on his role as an uncle. Nezu was surprised when Izuku took out a small remote with a red button and handed it to Uri. Uri, this is your own personal Izuku button. When you need me, press it and I'll come to you no matter what. You are the only person in the Wool world that has a button like this, and I want you to use it whenever you want to, okay? The girl looked at the button with wide eyes and held it close to her like a treasure. So, now that you have the button, do you want to go on an adventure with Uncle Nezu later? Nezu sighed in relief as the girl nodded. All right then, the press release. I was thinking of releasing a statement that you were a student under a special new experimental program. Which is true, we've never had a student talk. And also fake a leak. The students wouldn't leak information, but you were also at the hospital. And it's only a matter of time before some of the less savory reporters figure that out. Izuku caught on quickly, like always, so the best way to work around that is to let them believe that they already got the information available from there. But what information will we release? Nezu smiled and pushed forward a folder detailing what would be said from which source. A mix of falsehood and truths from them, the hospital, and an edited and redacted version of the comm data. Izuku scanned through it and nodded, determined. I have preliminary costume ideas that could allow me to cover my face, and I'll be willing to give a release myself. His friend took out a notebook with sketches of his costume headgear. A meat eight with a nine-petal lotus crown. There can be retractable protective headgear in the band itself. And until I'm ready to reveal my face then I can hang an afuda on it to cover my face if I'm leaning on the lotus aesthetic anyhow. Then the purification and ritualistic shrine theme isn't that far away. Nezu nodded at the design. I'll send it to Power Loader for fabrication. Uri, do you want to come with me to get a present for Izuku? The girl hesitated, but clenched the remote Izuku got for her and nodded. He climbed up a bookcase to reach the entrance to his vent system, and Izuku flew up with Uri to hand her over. Now for the final part of the plan. Everything was in place. Good luck Izuku. That was weird. Why did Nezu wish him luck? Izuku waved bye-bye to Uri and Nezu as the vent shut behind them, and simultaneously he heard a knock at the door. He opened the door hurriedly to let whoever it was know that Nezu was out, but when he opened the door he found himself face to face with Achako. She looked just as surprised to see him as he was to see her, but he wouldn't let this chance slip. He's been looking to speak to her alone all day. Achako I. Izuku. Of course they both started talking at the same time. Izuku couldn't help but giggle, and Achako joined him. It took them a few dozens of seconds to recollect themselves, and Izuku closed the door after Achako entered. When I was fighting over Hull he started, and he could feel her tensing without even looking at her. Izuku you don't need to talk about it. Take your time she reassured him with a smile. Just the fact that she made sure he was fine reinforced his decision. It may not be now or never, but he still wanted it to be now. Achako let out a slight eep when he suddenly took her hands and looked up into her eyes. Achako, you were one of the last people on my mind. And heroics is dangerous he chuckled nervously. I mean, of course it's dangerous, we knew that. But still there was so much I thought I would still be able to do. Stop rambling Izuku, just say it. And now that I still can, I want to tell you. Whatever Izuku wanted to say died in his throat, as Achako kissed him without warning. Pure energy spread throughout his body, almost stronger than the lightning of his quirk. He felt like he was floating. When their heads bumped against the ceiling Izuku realized that they were floating. He wasn't sure if it was his quirk, or hers, or both. They looked into each other's eyes and couldn't stop themselves from laughing as they floated and bumped against the top of the room, until an unexpected interruption brought them out of their reverie. Uncle Nezu, is she going to be my mama? Elation and embarrassment warred within her, as Achako came to terms that she and Izuku had kissed, and that both Principal Nezu as well as Iri, Izuku's responsibility. Child, something, saw them. The three of them were sitting in Nezu's office, while Nezu himself went to power loader to fabricate a costume part for Izuku. Iri was sitting on Izuku's lap and as Achako thought that the pair of them looked absolutely adorable together, Iri's question resurfaced in her mind and she couldn't help but blush. By Izuku's reddened face, she suspected that his train of thought ran on a parallel track to hers. Iri looked at Achako nervously, which caused the aspiring heroine to explain her answer she leaned toward the girl, Iri-chan, I don't know about being a mom, but for now I'll be Aunt Achako and her eyes flickered up nervously to Izuku's. Then back to Iri, maybe in the future we'll see about being your mama instead of aunt. Iri tilted her head in thought, and looked up to Izuku to try and figure out what he thought about the whole situation. Achako desperately hoped that she hadn't misread anything or said anything wrong. 
You know, and Achako is really smart. Some things take very little time, and some things take a Luwoon time. Like how the princess was asleep for a Luwoon time in the story. She inquired, imitating how he stretched out the sound and lol. Izuku smiled and nodded. Exactly. Very good the girl preened at the praise while Izuku continued. Achako will be an amazing aunt. And you'll see her a lot. Now it was Izuku's eyes that flickered anxiously to meet hers, and she nodded at him. The two teens shared a shy smile, when suddenly an alarm blared throughout the building. And what do you see in this image? Todoroki-kun. Hound Dog held another abstract ink blot in front of the dual-colored tea. Todoroki looked ponderously at the image, as if trying to decipher a deeper meaning, a fire, sensei. Hound Dog sighed. That was the fifth fire the kid saw out of five ink blots. He was tempted to show Todoroki a picture of a lake to check what the boy would see in it. Todoroki wasn't being forthcoming when Hound Dog broached the issue with tact, and using external stimuli wasn't helping either. Perhaps for a child as shut off from the outside world as Shoto Todoroki the direct approach would be best. The therapist straightened himself in his seat. Todoroki-kun, you refuse to use your fire, even at the risk of other people's well-beings. Though Hound Dog inserted no judgment into his words, his patient flinched, which was probably a good sign. All in all, however, all you are able to see is fire, and whether you use it or not, it seems that your fire is controlling your life. Seeing as your father is Endeavor, a notorious fire-using hero, I feel the need to ask has your father ever acted violently towards you? Todoroki squirmed a little in his seat. Hound Dog pressed his advantage. No matter what, that is wrong Todoroki-kun. Seeing you sit here makes me grateful to Ezeku. The teen looked up in confusion, which is exactly what Hound Dog wanted. He was really worried about you. He insisted that you shouldn't get punished at all, and that you needed help. He told me that he couldn't imagine the pain you're in, having to deny a part of yourself every day. His fire is not a part of me, Todoroki answered, anger overtaking his confusion and awe at Izuku's actions. Can he make your fire ignite or shut off? Neither Hound Dog nor Todoroki clarified who he was. Some things were obvious even if unspoken. Todoroki shook his head slowly. If you were to shoot out a ball of fire, could he direct it or control its trajectory? Another negative shake, but this time accompanied by words. My ice is from my mother, while the fire part of my quirk comes from him. I won't use it. If a villain donates to charity, in order to launder money or throw heroes off their trail, should the charity not use the money to help people? But that's not the same the fire and surety was starting to leave his voice. Todoroki-kun, if your father abused you, no matter the reasons, he is a villain. There is no justification for that reprehensible behavior. Ask yourself why you want to be a hero, Todoroki-kun. Maybe you'll find that you don't really want to be. But if you do, if you find a reason to do good, then ask yourself if that reason is him. A loud siren interrupted Hound Dog, and both of them winced. He only hoped this wouldn't undo any progress that was made. As they got up, he placed a gentle hand on Todoroki's shoulder. I'm not expecting you to wake up tomorrow and start slinging fireballs. I only hope that you think about what we talked about. Not using your fire because of your father is still allowing your father to control you, and you deserve better. I'll escort you to the evacuation zone and go investigate. Toru was nursing a sprained ankle on a cot in the nurse's office. She was super extra thankful to Yurashi and Ida for taking charge in the cafeteria. A panicking gen ed student knocked her over, and beneath the din of the alarm her shout couldn't be heard. Someone stepped on her foot, hard, and she whimpered, covering her head with her arms to brace for the worst. Suddenly the din subsided, and she heard Ida yelling from above her. We are students of the most prestigious school in Japan. That is staffed by pro heroes. In your panic you failed to notice that you are causing bodily harm to your fellow students. Toru stood and looked up. Ida was held aloft by a whirl of wind created by Yurashi. And the loud boy was helping amplify Ida's message by spreading it through the air. Ida continued. There are clear evacuation guidelines. Class representatives, please help organize the students and make sure everyone proceeds to the nearest evacuation point. Classroom 2H on this floor, in an orderly manner. We must trust in the staff to keep us safe. The students looked around, many looking embarrassed or ashamed. As Urashi lowered his classmate, the alarm ended and the PAW system turned on. Aizawa's voice emerged, remain calm. The alarm was triggered by members of the press trespassing on school property. Toru could hear his scowl through the speakers. Proceed with the rest of your day as normal. Yes, she would be getting them both some chocolate. And also she would help one of them campaign for class president. She would make banners. Victory was theirs. The evening of that day, a pale man with dry and cracked skin stood before a throng of two-bit villains, crooks, and goons. He made sure to look suitably intimidating, hands covering his face but leaving cracks for his red eyes to peek through. You lot, every single one of you, has proven that you have the drive, the ability, and the viciousness to undertake this mission with the League of Villains. They proved no such thing, Tamura thought to himself, but he couldn't just tell the fodder that they were fodder, right? 
In a few days, we will infiltrate an isolated area of UA. When the first year classes are most vulnerable, and strike where it hurts before retreating, he raised his arms victoriously, and the fodder cheered. We will strike fear into the heart of Japan, and shake the foundations of this stupid hero-based society. More cheers followed, growing in volume. The League of Villains will become a bogeyman to haunt every youth who dreams of being a hero. Whistles and hoots. It was kind of nice, this validation. It made Tamura feel warm. Maybe he would keep the fodder around. In one fell swoop, we will grew the entire world. A lone cheer and clap, accompanied by confused mutters. One of the villains asked if you're Gru. Does that make us your minions? Tamura scratched his neck in irritation. No, and not Gru. We, together, will perform an act of villainy so heinous that it will grew the world. But I'm allergic to bananas. Is that a problem? A different villain interjected. Tamura was flabbergasted that she seemed genuinely worried about that. No, no, not Gru. No minions. We will grew them their confused silence met his angry frustration. He would have to explain it to the simpletons. If you're awesome, you are people. We, on the other hand, will be gruesome. We will grew people. He looked at them hopefully. They had to understand it now. Do we have to bring our own overalls and goggles? Forget it. Tamura thought he wouldn't be keeping the fodder. By afternoon classes resumed, and Izuku was supposed to be helping Midnight for art history. In actuality, he was helping Yuri do a coloring book and thinking about how they should approach her schooling. His mother would be moving into the on-campus safe house. Maybe when Yuri got used to her it would become clearer. His thoughts were definitely more muddled than usual, since he kept sneaking glances at Achako. He knew that she was probably doing the same, since about 63% of the times he glanced at her they had made eye contact. They also both blushed profusely after that and averted their gazes. Midoriya kun could you please come to the board and sketch two variations on a single costume that would be reflective of different styles or eras of heroics, and explain why the same costume would look different according to those lines? Midnight's voice jolted him into awareness, and as he went to the whiteboard, Midnight took his place next to her. Izuku was drawing the knee and thigh areas, explaining how buff padding and sharper yet thin lines were more in line with a modernist view of heroics, to reflect that heroes were efficient and utilitarian, rather than flashy. Of course this wasn't the entire case, but the best example of that trend was capes, which had all but vanished. Suddenly Midnight exclaimed aloud, drawing attention to her and Eerie. He caught her eye and knew he had been played. It would never have happened to him were he not so distracted. Wow Eerie, those are really pretty drawings. What did you draw? At least she was doing this in a way that was positive for Iri. For that Izuku would make his revenge fairly painless. Iri clutched her drawings with a red face. And when she looked at Izuku he smiled at her and nodded reassuringly. Even though it would work against him, he would take the hit for Iri's sake. He knew Achako would too. The shy girl lowered her face a little, but her body language was pleased. Iri lifted her drawing and said this is me and Izuku and Aunt Achako all holding hands. A noise not unlike a boiling kettle escaped Ashido's lips. Midnight of course decided that wasn't enough and prodded for more details that's so nice of you to draw, Iri. Why did you decide to draw all of you together? Iri squirmed shyly in her seat, looking to Izuku for affirmation. He sent Achako an apologetic look, and she nodded to him. His heart fluttered. He was so glad that he found her. She knew immediately what he meant and was willing to bear the embarrassment with him. Izuku smiled at Uri and nodded, signaling to the child to continue. Because Izuku and Aunt Achako kissed with their lips so maybe she will be my mama one day. That was more blunt than Izuku thought it would be. He noticed that from the way Midnight was holding her breath and puffing her cheeks, she also expected something less in your face. A thud broke the silence in the classroom. Achako dropped her head onto her desk. Apparently that was the signal Ashido was waiting for, since she began squealing loudly and talking with Hagakure next to her. Izuku went back to sit next to Iri. He knelt down by her side that's very pretty, and I'm really happy you drew us all together. When we get home, I'll hang it on the fridge, okay? Iri nodded rapidly, happy that she made Izuku happy. He turned to Midnight who was on her way back to the front of the class, and when they made eye contact he mouthed to her I will get you back for this. When he refocused on the child, he saw her look between him and the drawing with a content expression. Izuku decided to concede the match, turning to Midnight once again and mouthing thank you for that. Inko was holding Yuri in her lap while they watched Izuku, in partial hero costume, on a stage with Aizawa and Nezu, surrounded by members of the press. Thankfully they were behind a partition. They waited for the crowd to settle down, and her son stood to go to the front of the stage, Nezu behind him. He and Nezu had talked about how best to do the whole press thing, but she still saw her poor boy's hands shaking in nerves. Luckily his face was covered, so no one else should notice. Right? Um um, hi everyone. Thank you fo his voice cracked. For a moment Inko panicked since she hadn't brought a camera to record, but then she saw the flashes of multiple professional photographers and thanked her lucky star that no one noticed her fumble. He cleared his throat, sorry. Right? Thank you for coming. 
I am Lotus, a student here at UA Academy, and I was involved in an impromptu clash with the Shai Hasekai. First I we would like to explain the event. I'm on the double heroic support track, and I was going with Principal Nezu and Sir Nidai to test new support gear. Um um, before anyone asks, some of what you saw me do is my quirk, and some of it was the gear. I, I won't be answering any questions about which is which, since it's still under development. Disappointed mutters ran through the crowd. We encountered a high-profile villain, and due to unforeseen circumstances I had to engage with them before backup arrived. Um um, everything else was on camera any questions? A flurry of hands and shouts. Izuku pointed seemingly at random and a reporter stood up you eyed hero from Teen Hero Monthly. Lotus San, have you been approached regarding merchandise? What? Why would I Nezu tapped his shoulder gently? Ahem, um um, no, there are currently no plans along those lines. Before he could ask another question, the rest of the reporters started waving their hands again. Hatchet and Nanako, from Heroes Digest. Lotus San, are you immortal? Before Izuku could answer, Nezu leaned into the microphone, I apologize Lotus, while we agreed that managing the press conference would be a good learning exercise, I must intervene. Miss Hachida, what kind of answer could that question possibly have that would be reasonable to give publicly? The reporter blushed and sat down. Inko knew Nezu well enough by that point to notice that he wanted her to put up more of a fight. Izuku took back the reins and pointed at another reporter. Inko recognized her as the one that interviewed Nezu on the helicopter above the location of the battle. Shidos Kazuki, Shueisha. Lotus, what do you have to say about rumors of a close relationship between you, Sir Nidai, and Principal Nezu that predates the start of your schooling? Hushed murmurs erupted, and Inko couldn't help but scowl at the blue-skinned vulture's self-satisfied grin. Oh, yeah. Um, um I didn't have a lot of friends growing up, so I was pretty active online. Apparently we were all active in the same forums, and we didn't even realize until after we met in person in UA. And by coincidence Nezu had something related to that on his desk. That response definitely wasn't what the press expected or hoped to hear. It was basically the opposite of a scandal. Aizawa sighed and lowered his head into his palm, while Izuku fidgeted in the silence. Eventually he couldn't take the suspense so he added that's actually where my hero name came from. My handle on those was Green Lotus. Inko almost missed the victorious grin on Nezu's face. Someone in the crowd gasped. But before she could speak another reporter stood my question is for Nezu. Are you not worried about accusations of favoritism? The mouse-like principal again strode forward. If you want to prepare an anonymous questionnaire for our heroic students, you may. But since you didn't state what paper you work with, the results will be sent to every publication with a representative here. The reporter flushed, but sat down. Excuse me. A woman shot up. She looked too excited for Inko's taste. Here am I, editor of the Journal of Quirk Sciences. Oh my god I love the JQS. Izuku realized he interrupted and looked down sorry, please continue. She smiled widely, it's quite alright. If I'm interpreting what you said correctly, are you Green Lotus associated with the unsolved analysis message boards? Izuku nodded, yeah that's where I post most of my thoughts, I guess. Some of the bulkier things I send when someone asks, since I don't want to overload the server or DB. Small arcs of electricity tingled through the reporter's hair, her quirk making itself notices in her excitement. Then all at once it died down and she scrunched her face, wait, but Green Lotus has been active almost a decade and you're in high school. Inko realized most of the reporters had no idea what was going on, but still realized they were on the cusp of something interesting. Yeah, a short and to the point answer when a longer one was needed. Nezu nunched his shoulder and Izuku realized that as well. Um um, yeah I don't really know what to say about that. I like quirks and analyzing quirks, and I've been doing it online for nearly a decade. Hirao fell back on the ground, looking shocked. She brushed herself off and stammered a little, there's so much to ask. Do you realize how often we get mailed asking about you? Even though you only publish online every graduate student thinks we can put them in touch with you. Do you have plans to publish the full manuscript of the AQIP? Most other reporters were on their phones, searching up whatever it was Izuku and the nice reporter were talking about. Oh, sure, I can send it to you if you want. Yes, ahem, I mean, yes. It would be great for everyone if you would send your writings to a journal rather than post them online, don't you think? The happier she and Izuku became, the more agitated the rest of the press were. This was obviously not what they had in mind as the topic of the interview. One of the other reporters, the one that asked Nezu about favoritism, interrupted, Excuse me Lotus-san, I believe there are other reporters with questions. Izuku shook himself out of his reverie. He complained in a soft voice that made Inko giggle but the JQS is my favorite um, um right. Any other questions? Oh, Hirao-san can you leave me your email address and we can get in touch. He pointed to a different reporter, Yes, you ain't san. Thank you Lotus. The reporter preened, happy that Izuku remembered him, it seems that even without such a public act of incredible heroism, just your work on Quirks marks you as a rising star. 
I'm sure that the readers of Teen Hero Monthly are dying to know. What are you looking for in a romantic partner? And Ko's face was stuck between a giggle and a grimace. The exact kind of question that was built to trip her poor, shy, innocent, baby boy up. She looked up knowingly. There he was, blushing. Any moment now Nezu would swoop in and save him. W. Well I think that it's not proper to ask or talk about a hero's personal relationships. Wait. I don't feel comfortable talking about the person I'm dating. What? And I hope that you can respect that. And Ko was confused. But also excited. But mostly confused. What was Izuku talking about? Of course, I apologize for my lapse of judgment. Ah, of course. Now Inko understood. It was a diversion tactic thought up by Nezu. Inko was shaken out of her self-satisfied epiphany by a light tug on her sleeve. Iri was handing her a piece of paper. What's this Iri-chan? The girl looked to the floor. Izuku said he liked it. But sometimes people say things only to be nice. Do you think Izuku likes it really really? Inko looked at the picture. Iri, Izuku, and a figure with brown circular hair were holding hands. And Ko had a nagging suspicion she knew what she was looking at. Again excitement and confusion warred within her. Wowery chan that's beautiful. It's you and Izuku. And why did you draw another person? Iri answered, still looking at the floor. That's Aunt Achako, because she told me that in the future she might be my mama. And Ko wasn't cognizant of her surroundings. If she were she would have noticed that it was her high-pitched shout that brought an end to the press conference. Itsuka had to admit she was curious about the ta from their sister class. Today they would finally have a heroics lesson with him present, which was definitely something to look forward to if the students of 1A were to be believed. They reached the mock city to find the green-haired boy talking to Sekijiro sensei A small girl was hanging over his back, with her arms around his neck. She looked at Satsuna with worry, but was surprised to see her friend look over only with curiosity, and none of the mischief she expected. Inching her way closer, she asked her is something wrong? I expected you to be all over him by now. The green-haired heroic student let out a disappointed raspberry apparently he and one of the girls from his class got together already. Should have known he wouldn't stay single for long. Shizaki passed them and huffed I for one and disappointed that an aspiring hero, especially one already in the limelight, would allow himself to fall to the temptations of the flesh and enter a premarital relationship. Takage got a glint in her eye and hastened after the religious girl before Itsuka could stop her. Both girls had green hair. Takage was darker and straight, while Shizaki had literal thorny vines for hair. Still, as Takage placed her arm over Shizaki's shoulder, Itsuka felt that the head covered in silky straight hair was much more menacing than the one wreathed in thorns. You know, I never said they did anything more than hold hands. I have to wonder where your mind jumps to Ibarra-chan. Takage skipped ahead again, leaving Shizaki red-faced in a mix of anger and embarrassment. Ignore her, that's the only way she won't do it. And remember she means well please Shizaki-san, she wants to make everyone laugh. The thorny girl nodded briskly, and Itsuka knew that was the best she would be getting. Their conversation, along with any other conversations their classmates were having, ceased when Vlad King clapped his hands loudly. All right class, welcome to Practical Heroics. With me is Midoriya Izuku of Class 1A. He's serving as a teaching assistant for them, as well as the teaching assistant for Heroics school-wide. Itsuka could have sworn that Midoriya's eyes widened slightly in shock, but he composed himself too quickly for her to be sure. Monoma's hand shot up, and Vlad King sighed yes Monoma. Excuse me sensei are you sure that it is appropriate to allow an enemy spy to infiltrate our ranks? It's been a week of intense contact between all the classmates and Itsuka was doubting whether she would ever understand if Monoma was doing an elaborate bit, or was genuinely just like that. Vlad King deadpanned, and after a moment of silence continued, Midoriya will introduce himself and the exercise, after which you will be split into teams. Midoriya, the stage is yours. The young Ta turned to them and the girl on his back hid her head shyly when she felt eyes on her. Hi everyone, I'm Midoriya Izuku. Um, um I do quirk analysis in Nezu and I thought it would be productive for me to work with more than just my class so that we could all improve and go plus ultra. He raised his hand in an imitation of present Mike, only to be met with silent stares. A few seconds of awkward silence passed, and Midoriya cleared his throat to continue right, so you will be split into teams randomly, and each team will be either villains or heroes. You'll be assigned random scenarios with different win and lose conditions for villains and heroes. Any questions? Intelli's hand shot up, and so did Monoma's and Utsushimi's. When Midoriya glanced at Vlad King and saw that the pro hero wouldn't take charge, he nodded. Right so I'd appreciate if you would introduce yourselves when I call on you. Yes, you were first. He pointed to Intelli. Thank you Midoriya-san. I am Intelli Seiko, Class 2B. Will the scenarios be static, or will they change in real time? Added how much information are we given about the scenarios in advance? 
And what further information can we request? Will there be stand-ins for civilians? Intelli sped up, and Itsuka could recognize the agitation in her voice. Is that why you brought a kid? Is her quirk going to activate at some inopportune moment and is her quirk laser eyes? Itsuka expected all sorts of reactions from the new Ta, but sudden realization was not one of them. Oh, you're the hijack crew's recommended student. Intelli had told her about her written exam, multiple times. It was a sore spot for the woman, who prided herself on unparalleled intellect. That Midoriya immediately knew what she was talking about definitely couldn't mean anything good. The white-haired student bristled. How do you know that? Midoriya scratched the back of his neck awkwardly, and Vlad King intervened Midoriya was in charge of the written examinations. His examination was to run in parallel multiple scenarios for the test takers, as well as provide feedback. So when the staff is putting our faith in him to assist us, it is not misplaced. As he answered, he sent a pointed look at Monoma and Intelli. Yet Itsuka had a feeling that her homeroom teacher was missing the point completely. Intelli immediately stood and pointed accusingly. Before she finished rising, Midoriya already spun the kid around his torso so she would be looking over his shoulder and not at the angry student. Itsuka was impressed, but she could have gone without Takage whispering in her ear you know what they say about men with huge paternal instincts, right? She was spared from answering since her angered classmate stole the focus back. How are we supposed to handle those curveballs? A villain hidden in the crowds, children activating their quirks. The boy in front of them looked genuinely confused. What do you mean? You all did great. In 62% of the hostage situations that involve more than two children aged between four and six there is a quirk mishap involving both those children. Of those, 10% lead to severe damage such as hospitalization or loss of life. He hugged the white-haired girl closer to him and Takage moaned that's why we need to help those children even more than adult hostages, since they are completely innocent and such occurrences can lead to lingering trauma. As he answered Itsuka saw Intelli pale and lose momentum. But he was legitimately oblivious to that, and when villains have unknown accomplices in the scene, of the times those accomplices act after the villain was subdued, 58% of those cases they are hiding among the crowds and wait for the press to swoop in. Until he nodded and sat down in silence. He looked around and asked right, anything else before we continue? Monomer raised his hand again, and received a nod of acknowledgement. A pit grew in Itsuka's stomach as her blonde classmate stood and marched toward the top. Monoma Nito, I look forward to working with you. He reached out for a handshake, and before anyone could warn Midoriya, he shook Monoma's hand in return. By that point everyone in 1B knew what Monoma's quirk did, and Itsuka herself would admit that she wanted to know exactly what Midoriya's was. After the show he put on nobody could really tell. They were looking at Monoma, waiting for something, some reaction, gloat, curse. Instead, the blonde looked around with dilated pupils, his breathing hastening. After barely a second he knelt on the floor and closed his eyes. Midoriya what the hell is your quirk? What am I seeing? No, I can also hear and feel it. Why does it matter what sections of the concrete are elevated by a millimeter? How does that help you become a hero? How do I turn it off? Flad King dragged Monoma by his armpits. Since Midoriya was trying to work out what was going on. Oh, I guess you guys want to know about my quirk. Nineteen heads nodded in unison. Right, so basically I recognize patterns. But I still need to learn to analyze them. For example Monoma-san probably noticed that there are three distinct levels of elevation and coarseness on the concrete. Itsuka looked to the ground beneath them. There was no such distinction as far as she could tell. Okay, so, I noticed that immediately. But without knowing the properties of concrete, and the traffic and use this place gets, I wouldn't be able to say much. As it is, I can tell that there were two occasions in which the concrete here was repaired without the room itself being overhauled completely. The quality of cementos cement changes with his diet. Honuki cursed. Unexpected coming from him, shit. How did I not see that? Does my quirk also do stuff like that? Midoriya grinned. Well, let's start the exercises and find out. Sasaki Murai was ready. The first real test. Izuku was spot on, of course. After doing the basic battery of stress tests his young friend had designed, he had managed to manipulate probability with pretty good results. Of course only in matters of chance such as dice and cards. Now it was time to exercise the long-term abilities of his quirk. He would activate his quirk before leaving home, and enter one of the strictest quirk-suppressing establishments in the world. He took a long few weeks off, and flew all the way to the USA for it. He definitely wasn't worried about being caught or chastised for breaking any rules. Places like this one only catered to the elite in the first place, and they would be extremely confident in their made by island quirk suppression field. Mirai touched himself while looking into his own reflection's eyes, and strained his quirk. Time for the moment of truth he thought as he put on his tailored tuxedo. Besides, even if things did go south he wasn't worried about any long-term consequences. After all, he smirked and put on gold-rimmed sunglasses. 
What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Tatsuki Bakugo just wasn't getting it. There was obviously something really wrong about that spiky-haired hunk loser. Every lunch when he passed Katsuki by in the cafeteria, Katsuki would subtly move an inch inward. Yet the annoying extra hadn't asked to sit with him yet. How much more explicit could a guy be? If Red Hair thought that playing hard to get was the way to go, he was in for a rude awakening. Katsuki looked at the loud table full of losers. Pink was grilling Round Face about Deku's dick or something. And Round Face ate her rice with a red face, obviously embarrassed that her loser nerd boyfriend was endowed with a tool the size of a grain of rice. Super Cut Ab's shitty hair was sitting next to her and laughing at Deku as well. Suddenly some explosive pops escaped his hands without his noticing what the fuck was hot stuff rock quirk playing, making him jealous. Fat chance Katsuki could see through those childish manipulations from miles away. Come on Mina, don't tease her. His pink friend Guffai. Oh come on IG, we're all super stoked for them, it's out of love. Love I tell you. Ijiro looked at his red-faced friend, who was blushing enough to compete with his hair. It was like she was making sure to have a mouthful of rice in her mouth whenever there was a lull in the conversation, just to avoid having to participate. I for one, am not super stoked. I mean, Midoriya is off the market now, that's a heartbreak and a half. Kaminari Denki sat next to Ijiro and shouldered his way onto the already crowded lunch bench. He was obviously saying it all in good nature, but it still hit Ijiro a little too close to home. Suddenly he did a double take, and so did Mina, while squealing. Wait wait wait, Kaminari are you coming out? Is that what's happening? Kaminari grinned at them slyly, and Ijiro felt suddenly a little warm around the collar. You know, Kaminari said, hot is hot, no matter what bits you got. Hot and smart is even better, whether you're the type that gets harder or wetter. Hot, smart, and kind, a one in a million find. Everyone except Yuraka nodded along. She was too busy trying to get the blood to leave her face and return to the rest of her body. Of course, Kaminari continued, hot, smart, kind and paternal. Now that's just he snapped his fingers and a small bolt of electricity jumped through his hand, electrifying. Boo, boo. Hagakure threw crumpled pieces of paper at the electric teen, and he put on an offended face. Oof tough crowd, he said. And then out of nowhere he sent his arm over Ijiro's shoulder and leaned into him, alas. Not everyone can appreciate the art of pun and subverting expectations. Many small explosions erupted from where Bakugu was sitting, and for once Ijiro was thankful to the jerk, his explosions made everyone look away, and miss how his face reddened at the proximity to his classmate. At least, that's what he initially thought. The red in his face drained into chalk white, as he raised his head and saw self-proclaimed queen of romance, Ashido Mina, look straight at him with a devilish grin. His foe's eyes sharpened, obviously intimidated by his maneuver. Coming out of nowhere like that would knock anyone off their feet, but that was the essence of shadows. I wouldn't do that if I were you the bird-headed fool bluffed. Takoyami really thought sending his quirk out to speak for him would work. He even pretended to panic and shush it with his third-rate stiff acting. No way any woman would be attracted to such atrocious acting skills. Not that there was a specific woman who may or may not be attracted to such skills, but if there were, then surely she wouldn't be. Shihai smirked, I just did. Takoyami sighed and feigned relief from the seat in front of him. Very well. In response to your indirect strike card, I activate my contingency legacy spell. I have to discard half of my hand. And I skip every third card I would draw, but in return I can perform an immediate enhance reflect epic counter magic on any strike card except those from the series. No way. It wasn't a bluff. Shihai trembled in shock. Surely he wouldn't follow up with the combo no one would be that cruel. I apologize Kirwaro san you are truly a worthy opponent, but I will engulf your hopes in a mad banquet of darkness. He prepared a card from his hand and then froze. Of course there is no specific hope that I'm referring to. I am talking about the general conception of your hopes, whether they concern a girl or not or a boy, or a place. Shihai nodded. When his faded foe talked sense, there was no use in disagreeing on principle. Of course, but it isn't over. He shook his head at Shihai. I'm sorry, but it is. My enhance turns your strike into, which I ritual energy feed to summon. Because of the summon method. Oh are you guys partaking in a faded match to the end of epoch dual battles? A soft voice asked with unconcealed excitement. They both turned simultaneously to see their classmate. And definitely surely nothing more. Yanagi Riaiko, standing with stars in her eyes looking at them. Unfortunately for Shihai, it was Takoyami that collected himself first. Of course Yanagi Dono. This game, nay, competitive art, is a perfect blend of the unending thirst for triumph. The acknowledgement of the arcane and hidden, as well as the utter dominance, that embody the ideas of darkness. The girl nodded enthusiastically. I must agree with you Takoyami-san. I have constructed my deck to be very spooky indeed. Mayhaps I shall challenge the winner. The shadowed teenager felt his heart stop. But she see him lose. He truly had no counter to. He was only using his hobby deck. 
Ah, but I would gladly sink into the shadows and give up my spot for you. For Epoch dual battles will always remain, however it is only now in which you find yourself without a seat. He stood up and motioned for her to sit. Their graceful, ghostly, classmate grinned like a haunting woman from a horror movie, and from her bag cards floated out to circle around her, her quirk perfectly suited to the dramatic beginnings of the game. Thankfully, Takoyami was too excited to play to notice Shihai's deception. I must warn you Inagi Dono, I play a third-tier deck, and I won't be going easy on you. Almost instantly the girl deflated, the rings of cards around her coalescing into a deck. She removed a black metal tube from a compartment in her bag, and her face turned from dejected to determined. She snapped the rod forward and it extended to the length of a staff. That is indeed a formidable deck, devour Lord Takoyami, however I play. Shihai and Takoyami gasped at the same time. The staff was uniquely distinct. Is that no Takoyami stuttered? It seems so. The staff must be one of the legendary seven. Shihai continued as the head of the staff opened, revealing the mythical 77-pointed star that were given to the seven finalists of the 77th Ultimate Tournament. They finished together. Indeed my blackened foes. I play a unique deck. I hope you can challenge me together. Perhaps that way I will once again feel the thrill of a true battle. Shihai didn't know how a woman could be at once so attractive and so terrifying. He only knew that something at that moment was unlocked within him. And as he felt Takoyami's hand clench his, he also knew he wasn't alone. What a mad banquet of darkness. Are they flirting? Momo asked her, flabbergasted. Gyro had her ear jacks connected to a listening device and a transponder connected to their earpieces. All fabricated by Momo, but thought of by Midori. I think so. Man, I can't imagine what it's like to flirt over a game of Epoch Dual Battles. Before Gyro could continue her sentence, she felt Momo stiffen next to her. Yes indeed my friend Gyro. Truly a hobby that is not suited for couples, I agree. Damn, Gyro thought. Good thing she said that before I could open my mouth and say how nice that must be. Yeah haha she discreetly pushed her bag away with her foot. The last thing she needed was for Momo to see her exclusive crossover deck. Haha I agree Gyro was too flustered to notice that Momo also pushed away her bag and wouldn't find out for some time that it contained the Eris own deck, made only of promotional cards signed by the artists. David Shield was looking at the television and trembling. Melissa hadn't left her room since the morning, and now that he saw the I Island News recap he understood why. Green Lotus was one of the most spoken about quirkologists in I Island, whose theories and observations had led to many breakthroughs. That he remained anonymous and refused royalties was seen as an act of pure altruism, as Melissa was talented. No doubt, and she was often called a young Green Lotus. Now it turned out that Green Lotus is younger than her. Not only that, but he's a heroic student in high school rather than a STEM prodigy at some university at age 15. The recap didn't forget to show clips from the event that brought him into the spotlight in the first place. It was some monstrous quirk that he had. Though perhaps only such a monstrous and unique quirk was suited to such a unique and monstrous person. Melissa, honey, please, can you come out of your room and we can talk? David expected little from that feeble attempt at reaching out to his daughter, so he nearly fell over in shock when the door was flung open. Melissa exited with a fire in her eyes. Father, let's go. She had two full suitcases trail behind her. You can call Uncle Might on the way. The baffled father collected himself. Mel, aren't you frustrated? Did he misread her? Where are we supposed to be going? For a moment he worried that his brilliant daughter would give up her studies and ambitions in the field of quirk tech. Thankfully his anxieties didn't have time to blossom. As Melissa hastened to elaborate, we're going to Japan? Duh. Lotus is a hero student. He wasn't really making any connections and... Dad. That means he needs a support tech. I'll be his you to all might. She pouted as if that would seal the deal. You'll be his me to all might. Can you help me parse that? He had some idea where she was going with this, but needed to make sure. His daughter rolled her eyes in a way that only teenagers can, some biological muscle that matures around the age of 11 and stops working around the age of 20. If someone is an extremely talented support tech that is indispensable to a very powerful and influential hero, it's like they're David Shield and All Might. There, I fed your ego. Are you satisfied? Can you call Uncle Might now? He smiled. Yeah, that was enough for today, honey. He ruffled her hair as she shifted out of the way with an exaggerated scowl. It'll take a few days though to organize everything and make sure my work is set up to do remotely. You can call Toshi meanwhile, okay. Don't worry I already did. As class representative of 1B, Itsuka took her duties very seriously, and one of those duties was caring for the mental well-being of her classmate. That was what led her to sit by the despondent Utsushimi Kami, placing a gentle hand on the girl's shoulder. Hey Utsushimi-san, do you do you want to talk about it? The girl brushed a strand of fawn-colored hair out of her face and responded while gazing straight ahead. You know, I totes thought I had my quirk all figured out. Itsuka nodded. Many of her classmates showed similar symptoms as Kami. 
I knew what I needed to work on, but then he asked me, like, two or three really basic questions, and, like, it all came apart. Did you know that my quirk isn't held by not breathing? I totes thought that was it, you know. But, like, it's something about the diaphragm and exhalation and the oral and nasal cavities and all sorts of stuff that I, I don't. Before Kami started weeping, Itsuka already took her classmate's head onto her shoulder. Luckily she had a few spare shirts, since this was far from the first shoulder sob she dealt with. I know, I know. But think of it like this, Utsushimi-san, now we can be even better. Imagine it would have been a teacher helping you out. Like, I lived with my quirk for 15 years, and he saw it for a couple of minutes like, he suggested this thing that musicians do, where they inhale through the nose and exhale through the mouth at the same time so like, they never run out of oxygen, but the state of all of their umum tubes is always the same. Kami scratched her head awkwardly, and Itsuka had to ask, did Midoriya say tubes, or some other word? The girl blew a raspberry but seemed to cheer up a little he totes said tubes, like, super not profesh. They shared a laugh. She took out a piece of graphing paper and unfolded it. Itsuka looked over and saw some respirator-like device. He called this a rough draft of support gear in case the breathing thing won't work. It should breathe for me without me doing anything. So no matter what the exact trigger is for my quirk, I have options. He told me that my stamina is important and to keep training holding my breath. But that focus and creativity with illusions is a good direction to think about focusing. He was too polite to tell me I trained the wrong thing my entire life. Itsuka wrapped an arm around Kami and sighed. She saw Kamori Kinoko etch circles into the grass with her fingers, and almost physical black clouds hanging over her head. Shizaki hadn't stopped praying since the middle of the class. Satsuna was drawing plans to assassinate Midoriya's girlfriend. It was going to be a long day. Really Izuku, this is fine. I'm having a great time. You know I don't have a good poker face she smiled at her boyfriend and reassured him. The truth was, she was totally fine. He and Iri had to stay on school grounds for a while. His mom had Uri for the next few hours, Izuku made sure, but even so his hair was a little recognizable and people would be on the hunt for anyone that resembles Lotus. That was how they found themselves having a picnic on Yue, grounds as their first official date. She sat down on the blanket Izuku had spread out for them, and opened the basket to see what he prepared. She could swear her heart physically fluttered when she took out a dish with twelve different machai varieties, each clearly labeled with an explanation. He yelped in surprise as she wrapped him in a hug it's perfect when did he order it all. Achako loosened her arms when she heard him sputter instead of answer. I was learning to make them already, since I thought, you know, that you like machai, so she shut him up with a kiss on the lips. You learned to make machai, for me. Izuku, there are so many flavors here how did you do it? Oh my god I don't know how I can match this. It was his turn to shut her up with a kiss. Achako, I don't want our relationship to be like a scale where we each add stuff separately. I want it to be a plate that we both add to and both eat from. And um when something is on the plate then you don't know who put it there. The more he spoke the more he lost steam, and Achako couldn't help but giggle. Nuo don't laugh. The metaphor sounded so much better in my head. His head drooped in mock frustration. She stifled her giggles no no, it's a great metaphor. We can she snorted, set the table together. He groaned, Izuri the silverware. Achako was so absorbed in her laughter that she didn't notice him sneaking up behind her. And what are we going to drink? Are there other thin EEP? Izuku flung her over his shoulder and flew up, twirling her around as she laughed and shrieked. What she told him earlier was definitely true. Even just having a picnic on school grounds was more than enough to have a great time with him. And Ko kept a poker face as her son went over various sketches and notes, two hopeful students in front of him. Here he was, of course, in his lap. She was fine being apart from him, which was amazing progress. But the moment he came back she hung off him like a koala. He had more meetings lined up. But they decided on two a day and the business course drew lots between anyone who was interested. These two were the lucky first. What are you basing these projections off of? And are you versed in the legalese? Here he is definitely not my psychic. And using real-world mascots may not be covered if they're people. Izuku asked as he slid the folder toward the left student, a girl with shining red hair and six extra articulated fingers. She looked a little flustered, but cleared her throat all stayed up front that I'm not sure about that last bit. But as her guardian can't you give special dispensation? I mean did you see the designs? Izuku looked conflicted, and Inko understood why. The sketches for the eerie figurines were incredible. There was one which could latch onto an articulated figure of him, and a chibai plush with a large head. It was more adorable than Inko could bear, and she would buy three the moment they came out. The first offer definitely focused more on displayable merchandise. Even the wearable lotus crowns were designed to be premium products. Izuku looked at Iri and took back one of the folders to show her, Iri, what do you think? There's no wrong answer. And no matter what you think we might decide something else, but your opinion is important. Do you like these dolls of you? They're highly articulated and collectible. 
The business course student closed her mouth quickly at the glare Izuku shot her, at least until it retook the wind out of his sails. Is it like the she concentrated a bit? Cutely scrunching her eyes the super duper rare redacted gal might figurine that you showed me. He sputtered a little, clearly not expecting his kid to remember something that he probably mentioned offhand. Maybe he didn't realize how contagious his passion would be to a girl who basically idolized him and saw him as a father. Well, it won't be as rare, but it depends on what we can decide. We can make only 100, so only 100 people all over the world can have one. Or we can make as many as people want, so that everyone can have one. The gal might figure is rare because there are only a handful that still exist. Yuri looked pensive, as if she was contemplating something really really important. She looked up at him with a furrowed brow I want everyone to have a statue of you because you're the greatest hero ever. But I also want everyone who has a statue of you to think it's super important like you think that your statue is. Her son was tearing up with emotion, the petals in his lotus like sclear bouncing in his eyes. Inko felt moisture in her eyes as well. How could Ari say something so endearing so innocently? Izuku hugged her close and pushed the folder back to the business student, before realizing he lost the thread. And no Ari, the question was about statues of you would you feel comfortable with people having dolls that are based off of you? The child decided to give his heart a one-two punch, apparently, because her last response wasn't enough. Only if my doll comes with your doll, so it stays safe in its new house. At this point the business students were crying as well. The one who made the current proposals took back her folder and collected herself. Well Midoriya, there's one other thing I wanted to talk to you about. She hesitated as Izuku looked at her. That redacted gal might it wouldn't happen to be up for trade. Her answer was a glare as Izuku quickly took the folder from the next student opened it, and slammed it shut so fast and Ko thought she saw some lightning from his quirk. He slid it back with a glare stronger than he sent to the first girl. No, loot, 